Hi everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Mike Fisher and if you're new to cloud computing and AWS or you're looking to get your AWS certified cloud practitioner certification, you're in the right spot. Uh, a while back I offered all these lessons as part of a paid course and since its launch I've had uh, hundreds of students uh, enrolled and uh, go on to achieve their AWS CCP certification. Uh, but at this time I'm looking at uh, you know new course hosting options and really looking to see if I can offer this uh, training material for free. Um, so I figured I'd use this AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner course as a bit of an experiment here to see how well it does directly on YouTube and uh, reach a broader audience for more feedback on the course so I can make uh, future courses even better. Uh, now, before you begin, I just wanted to set expectations and give some more background on this course here. So this is my very first course creation attempt. I'm not a professional trainer and I was very new to video content creation and still am. Uh, so there's a lot of experimenting going on with the audio and video aspects throughout the lessons. Uh, the production quality varies a bit through the lessons, but uh, the lessons here are all very video focused with extensive visuals and animations and diagrams. Um, other than a lesson or two, there's no boring slides uh, going on in any of the, uh, the lessons. Now I created this course and the lessons very tightly coupled with uh, the course hosting platform I was using. That platform enabled interactive video where I could uh, have graphics and links pop up in the video that uh, the students could just click on and it would bring them to different supporting course material and various AWS documentation to review further. Uh, that platform also enabled a variety of student activities like role playing scenarios, um, a variety of quizzes, and a number of space repetition based review incorporated throughout the lessons. Now, unfortunately, on YouTube, all these interactive videos and other activities can't be included. Uh, so I'd say this leaves some small holes in the overall completeness of the original lesson coverage I intended. Um, but even with just the videos here, I feel it help a lot of people starting their journey into learning cloud and AWS and uh, certainly going on to pass the AWS certified cloud practitioner exam. So with all that said, uh, there may be a number of lesson segments where, you know, I'm pointing up in the air to reference different uh, link pop ups that won't show up in these YouTube videos and other reference material that just isn't included here. Uh, so just ignore those uh, as you're going through the lessons and just try to search for the mentioned AWS documentation or other resources on your own um, just to use this for the reference material. Now I'd also recommend looking into other free AWS training resources out there. Uh, I'll include some links below uh, that you can also use to help uh, round out your understanding of all these AWS uh, CCP exam areas. Um, now it's also best to have you know more than one source of training material so you can get different points of view for all this uh, content and helpful in any missing areas. Now there's a lot of work that goes into making these courses. Uh, I've got a lot of my free time wrapped up in uh, creating these lessons. So I'd really appreciate your support by subscribing to the channel and uh, just sharing this video with others to help them get started learning about cloud and AWS as well. All right, so with this intro out of the way, let your cloud learning voyage begin, enjoy. Hello, and welcome to Cloud Vikings. Specifically, welcome to the training course tailor-made for the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Exam. This course was developed from the ground up and maps directly to the AWS Exam Blueprint, so you can easily understand how the content you're learning relates to the exam domain sections you'll be tested on. This course has an obvious certification exam focus. However, at Cloud Vikings, we believe certification should just be a side effect of your training and your newly acquired skills. Our courses focus on ensuring you really understand the topics being discussed and how to actually apply them in the real world. Now, while this course is specifically designed to help you pass the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, it'll prepare you to apply the new skills you learn along the way in your current role or help you address questions you may come across in interview scenarios. Giving you that in-depth understanding of the topics uh, will really set you apart from other candidates in the field. The AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam is a foundational level exam. The course is again mapped directly to that scope, so all the topics and context around them assume no prior knowledge of cloud computing or AWS. Now, while I'm a heavy believer in hands-on learning and building cool things as a project-based learning approach, for the foundational level uh, topics of this course here, we won't be diving into any hands-on exercises. Uh, so there's no need to be intimidated if you're just starting out in AWS or looking at a new career in cloud technology uh, and you have no prior experience. Now, while the lessons in the course here are largely theory-based, they are focused on understanding these important cloud and AWS concepts that'll serve as the foundation for your future learning voyage. 
The topics are discussed with very real-world context and practice scenarios to help you understand the why, what, how, and when questions around all the information presented. And while we're speaking of practice scenarios, this course is designed to get you involved and actively learn. There are many areas in the course where the information just isn't spoon-fed to you, so you can memorize uh, a fact or two with no real understanding of the context of that information. You're presented the core information on the topic and the important reference material you can use to help you dive deeper and find the answers for yourself. You then build up your foundational understanding of all these concepts and discover new relationships and real-world uses for this information. I've also included some lesson areas that do mock role-play practice scenarios to attempt you to take the new theory-based information and concepts you learned and apply them in mock business scenarios. Really the goal here, especially at this foundational level of the cloud practitioner exam scope, is to understand the core cloud and AWS concepts. You'll finish the course confident that you can find information and answer cloud and AWS questions yourself when you're on the job. This course isn't based on a bunch of boring PowerPoint slides. Uh, the lessons are all very video centric with a variety of graphics and animations throughout to help you understand the topics and really grasp the relationships between what you're learning to the uh, real world context and how different AWS concepts are related and how you can glue them together to form overall solutions to common business challenges. Now to help you with learning all this new content, uh, along with the highly engaging video content itself, many videos are interactive. So as you're watching the lesson and I'm referring to different AWS web pages or concepts, there's actually interactive pop-up links directly in the video so you can very quickly follow along with what we're talking about. Also, modern techniques of active learning and spaced repetition are incorporated throughout the course to help you retain the information. The active learning areas force you to take an active approach to your self-study. Uh, you'll be learning about a number of uh, AWS information resources that are available to you and how to use them to help dive into some of these topics further uh, to learn on your own. The course also incorporates a variety of quizzes to test your understanding along the way. Uh, this serves both as a active recall and spaced repetition exercise to help you retain the information long term. The course then goes a step further beyond those small quiz sections and gives you a full practice exam simulator to test your knowledge in a format that'll be very similar to what you can expect uh, when you take the AWS exam. So with this course, you can shake off any of those exam jitters you may have, knowing you've prepared with course material that directly maps to the exam blueprint topics, and you've gone through practice exam simulators with questions that'd be very similar to what you can expect on the exam. So at this point, you may think, this sounds great, but who am I? Well, my name is Mike Fisher, and I'm a self-taught technology professional with over 20 years of experience. I've worked in a variety of roles over that time from uh, infrastructure engineering, uh, cloud engineering, SRE, DevSecOps roles, uh, cloud architect roles. Uh, I've also worked as a senior technical account manager for AWS, uh, helping some of the largest companies leverage AWS to help meet their business goals. I've been self-taught through my whole career, uh, learning through on-the-job experience and spending countless hours uh, taking online courses just like this one to keep learning new skills and advancing my career. I've been actively working in AWS for over seven years and have been AWS certified since early 2016 and uh, quickly achieved all the AWS associate professional level certifications. Uh, and throughout the years, I've achieved a variety of other cloud and DevOps based certifications. Through all these countless hours of uh, study time and exam experience, I've learned how to effectively study for the certification exams and make efficient use of my time and ultimately learn in a way that I can learn new skills and uh, apply them in the real world. I hope I'm a living example or maybe even an inspiration for some others out there if you're interested in pursuing a career in cloud and DevOps technologies. Uh, today, there's tons of free and low-cost content available online to learn new skills and expand your career opportunities. You don't necessarily need the expensive formal college degrees to excel in many roles in cloud technology domains. Now, this is my very first attempt at putting together a training course. I'm not a professional trainer by any stretch of the imagination, but from all my experiences with uh, some of the other courses I've taken over the years, I figured I'd try to do something different from the boring slideshow-based courses I've uh, experienced in the past. This course is born from a desire to share my cloud and certification experience gained over the years and attempt to create a course that I would have liked to take uh, for how I personally learn uh, a course that would keep me motivated and engaged while learning the content, 
and truly understand the material to help me prepare for interviews or uh, take on more responsibilities with my current role. Anyways, I hope that gives you an overview of what's in store uh, for this course. Now, if you're just starting your voyage into cloud technologies and want to learn about AWS in a fun and engaging way, this course is for you. If your current company uses cloud or AWS today, and you're in a management or finance or sales role, and you just want to get a better handle on what cloud and AWS is all about to help you understand those conversations going on better and add more value to the team, uh, this course is for you. If you're already an experienced cloud practitioner, uh, but new to AWS, and you're just looking for an overview of how it may compare to other cloud providers out there, this course is for you. If you're looking to pass the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam uh, and take your career to the next level, this course is for you. High quality, engaging video packed with quizzes, practice exams, all in one package at a incredible value, all with a no risk 30 day money back guarantee. Enroll now to start your cloud learning and certification voyage and take your career to the next level. See you in the lessons. All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a look at all the AWS certifications. Uh, you're going to get a high level understanding of all the AWS certifications that exist today and the different categories they fall into and how those map together. Let's dive in. All right, so to help us figure out the AWS certifications, let's go straight to the source. So here we are at the AWS training and certification landing page. And there's a ton of great information. So what I wanted to start off with is uh, scrolling down on the page here a bit. So AWS breaks down their certifications into four categories, foundational, associate, professional, and specialty. Now, what I want to point out is what AWS recommends for the prerequisite experience before attempting these exams. For example, for the foundational, they list six months of fundamental AWS cloud and industry knowledge. For the associate level exams, one year of experience. For professional, two years of experience. And for the specialty exams, AWS recommends five years of experience in that domain. So note in the foundational category, we have the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam. And then moving into the associate exams, we have three different tracks, the architect, operations, and developer. And while I'd recommend setting a goal to achieve all three AWS associate certifications, depending on your current role or career goals, you may choose to focus on perhaps the developer certification first, or perhaps the AWS Solutions Architect Associate. And then next we have the professional certifications. These test on significantly more depth and breadth compared to the associate exams. Now the associate level exam scope is prerequisite knowledge to the professional level exams. While it's certainly a great idea to have your associate level certifications before attempting the professional ones, it's no longer a prerequisite. If you feel you have the two years experience or more and want to dive right into taking the professional exam, you certainly can do so. Uh, but again, it's very highly recommended to have the associate level certifications first. So we can see here the architect track, the solutions architect associate directly maps to the professional exam here. And then both the operations and developer tracks funnel into the DevOps engineer professional. And then taking a look at the specialty exams, these are very domain specific and get into quite a bit of depth and this is why AWS recommends two to five years of domain experience before attempting these exams. So I hope that helps understand the AWS certifications available today. And next we'll jump into the exam blueprint details.
All right, welcome back. Uh, now we're going to answer the question, how do you get certified? At this point, you should have a good idea of where the Cloud Certified Practitioner exam fits into the overall AWS certification program. The Cloud Certified Practitioner exam is great for beginners or even seasoned pros. Uh, it's a great exam to refresh your foundational knowledge and uh, make sure you have a great understanding of the uh, big picture of cloud technologies. The blueprint mentions having six months experience before attempting this exam, uh, but don't worry if you don't have that work experience, this course will catch you up in a matter of hours. We'll be covering all the exam topics in depth throughout the course in a easy to digest way, so you can very quickly catch up on the six month of work experience throughout the course. So with that, let's take a look at the exam blueprint. All right, so if we take a look at the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam information, uh, this is the main site where you can schedule the exam, which we'll talk about later. Um, and it gets into the, the details, again, the six months exposure to AWS Cloud for the prerequisites. Again, we'll be covering all this in the course. And then over here, we can take a look at the exam overview. Again, this is a foundational level certification. You have 90 minutes to complete the exam. It's 100 US dollars and uh, consists of 65 questions, uh, either being multiple choice or multiple response. AWS offers their exams through Pearson View and PSI testing centers, and they can be taken now in person or online. So next we wanna look at the exam guide. So click the download the exam guide link, and this will open up the exam blueprint. I recommend reading through this thoroughly as it'll be the best source of information of what's on the exam and also give you a good overview of the new skills and knowledge you'll learn throughout this course. So I won't bore you by reading through this whole thing, uh, but I do want to jump down into the exam content here and take a look at the exam results. It's a pass or fail tip of an exam and the results are scored on a scale of 100 to 1000 with 700 being the passing score. Now the exam is broken down into domains and uh, each of those domains and questions have different weighting to them. So some domains uh, that the exam tests for might have more questions based on how it's weighted. And that's something to keep in mind when you're studying for the exam to focus on those areas that have the highest weights. So next we'll jump into the exam blueprint. Here we see the four domains the exam is broken down into. Cloud concepts, security and compliance, technology, billing, and pricing. To the right, we see the weighting breakdown of each of these domains. Here we can clearly see the technology domain has a lot higher weighting percentage versus the billing and pricing. So this should be a good indicator to you that you should expect to see a lot more questions on the technology domain compared to billing and pricing. So next up in this exam guide are the domain breakdowns. I suggest reading through these very carefully and refer to them often. This course was built from the ground up directly to these domain breakdowns. So you'll have a very clear and easy way to map the course content to the exam blueprint. So for a quick overview, we'll just take a look at these subdomains. In 1.1, we'll define the AWS cloud and its value proposition. In 1.2, identify aspects of AWS cloud economics. In 1.3, explain the different cloud architecture design principles. Then moving on to domain two, in 2.1, we have defined the AWS shared responsibility model. In 2.2, we have defined AWS cloud security and compliance concepts. In 2.3, we have identified AWS access management capabilities. In 2.4, we have identified resources for security support. And that brings us to domain three, technology. If you remember from the domain weightings, the technology domain had the highest weighting. So this is where a lot of the course is focused and where your study time should be focused as well. In 3.1, we have defined methods of deploying and operating in the AWS cloud. In 3.2, we have defined the AWS global infrastructure. In 3.3, identify the core AWS services. In 3.4, we have identify resources for technology support, bringing us to domain four, billing and pricing. Here in 4.1, we'll compare and contrast the various pricing models for AWS. In 4.2, we'll recognize the various account structures in relation to AWS billing and pricing. 
And last but not least, in 4.3, we'll learn to identify resources available for billing support. Now, the last couple pages of the exam guide are the appendix, giving you an overview of all the different technologies and concepts that'll be covered on the exam. So again, this exam guide is the best source of information for what you can expect on this exam. I highly recommend downloading this exam guide or printing it out and making sure you refer to it often throughout the course as it might help identify some areas you're weak in and where you need to spend some more time reviewing. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Cloud Foundations part of this course. Over the next few lessons, we're gonna quickly get you up to speed with all the prerequisite knowledge you need for this course. So with that, your foundational voyage into cloud computing begins, so I'll see you in the next lessons. Hello everyone, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to answer the question, what is cloud computing? So I think the best way is to start with a definition and we'll break that down. In my experience, the answers you get varies quite a bit uh, from person to person or resource to resource, but I made an attempt to summarize all the definitions I've come across in a way that made sense to me and it went something like this. Cloud computing enables convenient, remote, on-demand access to a shared pool of computing resources and services. For me, this is a nice short definition that's not too cloud service provider specific, but let's dive into a few more official definitions and uh, see how those compare. Now, some AWS resources define cloud computing as the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with pay-as-go pricing. My problem with the definition is first, uh, not all clouds provide resources through the internet. Uh, there's private cloud types and community clouds that may exist on fully private networks and don't necessarily connect to the public internet at all. And then there's this pay-as-you-go pricing. Now, while that's generally true, cloud service providers offer a lot of products that are more long-term purchases rather than this pay-as-you-go on-demand pricing model. Now through the rest of the lesson, we'll be taking a look at a few more cloud computing definitions. And I'd recommend at the end of the lesson to take some time, do your own searches and come up with a definition that makes sense to you. Now, since this is a AWS exam course, let's dive into the definitions that AWS provides us. All right, so now we'll jump over to the AWS website. And this page is the AWS attempt to answer all the foundational questions around cloud computing. Now, what I'd like you to do at this point is pause this video, jump over to this AWS page, spend some time reading through it, and uh, also check out this video that they provide over here as well. Welcome back. So at this point, you should have a good understanding of how to define cloud computing uh, from the perspective of AWS. And uh, I've provided you with my definition as well. Uh, but let's deepen our understanding even further by looking at something called the NIST definition of cloud computing. So NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they created one of the most referenced definitions of cloud computing in the industry over 10 years ago, uh, but it's still very relevant today. And because this NIST definition is so widely used, I wanted to review it as a part of this course. Now, it's unlikely this will show up directly on your AWS exam, but I feel it's important we know about this NIST definition and understand it as we continue to build your foundational knowledge in this section of the course. So here's how NIST defines cloud computing. Cloud computing is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. This cloud model is comprised of five essential characteristics, three service models, and four deployment models. 
I feel my definition summarizes the same key points here, but makes the definition a lot smaller and easier to remember. Regardless, we're looking at the NIST definition, so I'll show you where you can find the official publication and read through it yourself. So this is the NIST page I'd like you to go to. And uh, we can also see in this abstract section, uh, basically the definition uh, given to us here. But uh, what I'd like to do is actually have you grab the download by clicking here to get the PDF. And then we can go a few pages in. and take a moment or two to read through uh, section two of this document. If a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense at this point, don't worry. We'll be covering a lot of these terms and especially the service models and deployment models in future lessons. But please take some time to read through this a few times so you have a good understanding of the NIST definition of cloud computing. Thanks for joining me in this lesson defining cloud computing. You should have a good understanding of what cloud computing is at this point, and we'll solidify that over the next couple lessons. Next up, we'll dive into the five essential characteristics of cloud uh, as defined by NIST. I'd like to thank you for being here. I hope you're enjoying the journey so far, and uh, I'll see you in the next lessons. Welcome back. In this quick video, we're going to be going over the five essential characteristics of cloud as defined by NIST. We'll be learning some new terminology to help with our foundational understanding of cloud computing and breaking down the definitions of each characteristic in a easier to understand way. From the previous lesson, you should have the link or the download to the NIST definition. And I'd recommend you cross-reference that to compare how I'm breaking these down and at the end of the lesson, take a moment to break down these characteristics into your own words. All right, let's get started. The first characteristic we're going to look at is on-demand self-service. So what does that actually mean? I'm going to say this is allowing you to create things like uh, compute resources, storage services, uh, databases, all on your own without having to interact with other humans in order to provision them. So for example, you can typically click a few things in a console or enter some commands on a command line interface to create all the resources you need many times within seconds. And also under this on-demand self-service characteristic, we no longer have that direct need for capacity planning, you know, uh, ordering hardware, creating change tickets to rack and stack equipment and so on. Next, we move on to the characteristic of broad network access. Now for this one, it just means that the cloud resources are available to us over some type of network uh, and typically accessed through standard protocols like HTTP, HTTPS, uh, from a variety of client platforms like workstations, laptops, tablets, and phones. Next up, let's break down resource pooling. Basically, the idea here is the cloud service providers' computing resources are all pooled together, and they can provide these resources to serve multiple customers and clients all at the same time. So for resource pooling, I find the compute resources an easy example. Well, there could be thousands of servers that are all pooled together and made available for customers to use. And then even each one of those physical servers, the memory and CPU may be further divided up to run a pool of instances or virtual machines on top of it. The idea of resource pooling and virtualization is a key topic for cloud computing, and we'll go over these areas quite a bit in future lessons. Next on our list is rapid elasticity. This cloud characteristic speaks to the ability to provision new resources on demand based on your needs or requirements. So just like an elastic stretching in and out, your business needs may change over the course of a day or have some sort of sales cycle where you have a lot of variance in your infrastructure requirements. So now in the cloud, your infrastructure costs can very closely map to 
your actual business needs at a given point in time. So you can reduce waste by scaling in your IT infrastructure so you don't have costly IT equipment just sitting around idle. Again, we'll touch on this important elasticity and cost optimization topic quite a bit throughout the course. That brings us to our last cloud characteristic, measured service. Here, I summarize this down as uh, simply the cloud provider has some form of automated systems to provide transparent billing details to you and the cloud resources you're consuming. And this last characteristic could also touch on the capabilities many cloud service providers have around providing monitoring metrics to report and alert on. You know, your uh, network bandwidth, uh, CPU utilization, how much storage you're using, transactions per second, that type of thing. So I hope my additional breakdown of these five characteristics of cloud have been helpful. Again, cross-reference my definitions to the original NIST definitions and take some time to define each of these in your own words. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. Let's jump right into the next segment of the NIST definition of cloud computing deployment models. So what are these cloud deployment models? Uh, these describe the general ways infrastructure is deployed based on uh, the type of use case and target customer of the cloud resources being provided. Now, at the end of the lesson, you should have a good idea of where you're consuming your cloud resources from, or perhaps what type of cloud deployment makes the most sense for your needs or the business. Now, according to NIST, there are four main categories of cloud deployments. We have private cloud, community cloud, public cloud, and last but not least, hybrid cloud. So this private cloud thing, I like the NIST uh, definition as is here. Um, it goes on to say the cloud infrastructure is provisioned for exclusive use by a single organization comprising multiple consumers, for example, business units. It may be owned, managed, and operated by the organization, a third party, or some combination of them. And this may exist on or off premises. The important part here is the exclusive use piece. This type of cloud would be strictly for the company owning this cloud environment. You know, this scenario has become less prevalent uh, the past few years. Organizations are realizing that by leveraging a uh, public cloud provider, they're often saving a lot more money when looking at the overall total cost of ownership and have a lot more flexibility and improve their security posture by a large margin. And next up is community cloud. And uh, I guess while we're on the topic of community, uh, don't forget to check out our Slack channel and different social media channels. Um, you know, be able to get involved with fellow students and keep up to date on courses. You'll get access to a variety of cloud and DevOps news, uh, tips, uh, additional tutorials, and a whole bunch more. So back to the community cloud, let's read through this one. The cloud infrastructure is provisioned for exclusive use by a specific community of consumers from organizations that have shared concerns, for example, an overall mission or shared security requirement. It might be owned, managed, and operated by one or more of the organizations in the community, a third party, or some combination of both. You might exist on or off premises. Now, this type of cloud deployment is one that uh, I haven't really run across very much in my career so far. If I had to think of an example, it would be the idea of a bunch of you know, companies or universities collaborating on some type of common project. You know, so like each entity involved would contribute some compute or storage resources. Then they pool each other's resources together using a management layer of some type. Something like this uh, folding at home project might be a good example for you to understand this model. Um, this folding at home project is working on solving complex protein folding simulations to help research potential uh, cures for diseases and different medicines. And then due to the complexity of these protein folding simulations they're working on, uh, your computer may take tens to hundreds of years to finish the calculation on its own. Uh, so in this example, you're supporting a type of community cloud, uh, pooling together your compute resources, um, you know, located across a vast global area connected over the internet. 
and you're using these pooled resources for a common community project or goal. So I hope that helps get a picture of what Community Cloud looks like, and uh, we'll jump right into Public Cloud next. So in a public cloud, the cloud infrastructure is provisioned for open use by the general public. Uh, it might be owned, managed, and operated by a business, uh, some sort of academic institution or government organization, or some combination of those three. Uh, it exists on premises of the cloud provider. Now, one subcategory of public cloud to consider may be the cloud infrastructure that fits that definition, except for the open use by the general public part. So uh, a cloud environment that is somewhat restricted to the general public or may have increased regulatory control for accessing the cloud. An example of this would be the AWS GovCloud regions where they're for hosting highly regulated workloads and comply with strict US government security and compliance rules. So if you're working for a company that partners with the US government and needs to comply with uh, FedRAMP or ITAR, uh, the DOD, SRG, and so forth, you would most likely be using something like these AWS GovCloud regions to host your cloud infrastructure. Now, while AWS is certainly an example of public cloud, there are these unique subcategories within some cloud service providers where they offer specialized deployment environments to meet specific customer use cases and access is typically not open to the general public. Okay, so we're getting a good idea so far of the different types of clouds that exist. We have community clouds, private clouds, and public clouds. Okay, but hold up for a second. Perhaps your organization already has some form of private cloud infrastructure that you need to continue using for whatever reason, but you also wanna leverage some public cloud services rather than invest further in uh, you know, your traditional IT footprint. Do we have a name for this type of cloud deployment scenario? Oh, well, thanks for asking. Yeah, it's called hybrid cloud. The NIST definition is great for this one, so let's read through it again together. The cloud infrastructure is a composition of two or more distinct cloud infrastructures, private, community, or public, that remain unique entities, but are bound together by standardized or proprietary technology that enables data and application portability. Now, this is a very common deployment model today. A lot of times, many companies will start their cloud journey by adopting this hybrid cloud approach, you know, uh, completing a complete cloud migration from traditional on-premises infrastructure all at once is nearly impossible undertaking, especially for large enterprises where there are endless complexities to consider, or perhaps there's been a recent shift in the IT direction of an organization where the new direction is that all new compute capacity is mandated to be operated in the cloud. Well, okay, great, but there's still a few years left on our hardware leases for thousands of servers and you know a whole bunch of other IT equipment. It may not make sense to decommission all that IT equipment right away as it may be a waste. I'll add that it may also not be a waste to do something like this either. Uh, it really depends on the total cost of ownership analysis of continuing to run this equipment and the cloud value proposition for your workloads and organizational needs. But let's say it makes sense to keep this hardware until the leases are expired. That on-premises hardware could be slowly phased out over the course of a few years uh, and migrated to the cloud slowly and therefore operate in this hybrid deployment model until all the workloads are migrated to the cloud. Now, while the NIST definition sort of implies your cloud infrastructure could be comprised of a mix of any number of these deployment models, one I wanted to call out specifically as a common subcategory of hybrid cloud is multi-cloud. You know, here companies may be all in on the cloud for their infrastructure. However, they have taken the approach of using multiple public cloud providers for their cloud infrastructure. The topic of a multi-cloud approach is very complicated and has lots of pros and cons that need to be carefully considered before embarking down this path. However, for some companies, this multi-cloud approach may be the way to go. Now, while this could be a whole course on its own, uh, just to give you some perspective on the why of multi-cloud, these are a few things that a company may consider. Um, so you have concern over a single cloud provider for you know, outages or being locked into a specific cloud service provider. Basically, the idea that if you're so tightly tied to one cloud provider, it may be very complicated to move your applications to another vendor in the future. Perhaps your applications are very tightly designed around a specific uh, cloud service provider's technologies and services. And there may be uh, business considerations at play. 
um, concerns over a cloud provider stability. You know, what happens if that company gets acquired by another company? Uh, there may be some competition considerations, like does the cloud service provider offer services that compete with your business or your partner's businesses? And then there's the cost factor. Uh, certain cloud services may differ in price between different cloud providers. So going multi-cloud may open up more choice to pick and choose the you know, best tool for the job or finding the most cost-effective solution. And then you may want to consider the cloud service provider's global footprint. Uh, different cloud providers may have regions available that are geographically closer to your customer base. By using those, you may offer them a lower latency solution to access your application, uh, therefore improving the customer experience. Now, there's a lot more we could get into here. Again, this could be a few courses worth of material alone. But since I touched on a few of the possible benefits of multi-cloud, I do want to quickly balance things out and mention a few of the cons to consider. First, a multi-cloud deployment can be extremely complex. There can be very unique and complex networking considerations to think about. You may need to hire additional staff with uh, expertise in different cloud service provider platforms. It can be a challenge to do one cloud very well. And if you need your workloads to run seamlessly across different cloud providers, there may be very complex uh, application redesign to accommodate the variations in the cloud provider services and operational functionality. And if you think about cost, your cloud infrastructure spend is now divided across different companies. There may be some complexity with cost allocation now and additional accounting overhead. Uh, there may be situations where you're eligible for volume discounts with a cloud provider. Now, if you split up that spend across different cloud providers, uh, perhaps you may not be eligible for quite a deep of a discount compared to having all that spend with one provider. Now, I'll stop myself here on this multi-cloud topic before I turn this into a 10-hour video. But if you are interested in learning more about multi-cloud strategy, design, implementation, uh, or just want to share your experience, if you've embarked on a multi-cloud journey uh, yourself, please reach out to me through a Slack or any of our social media channels. I do really enjoy this topic and it'd be great to hear about uh, your experiences. So with that, we've covered the four different cloud deployment models and touched on a few subcategories that I feel are good for you to be aware of as well. And now that we have an understanding of how different clouds are deployed, next we'll take a look at how these services or resources are consumed from the cloud by taking a look at the cloud service models. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks for joining me in this next lesson where we'll take a look at the different ways cloud services or various resources can be created and consumed from the cloud. We'll be breaking down infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. We'll also begin to understand the different responsibilities you as a customer have with these different service models and the varying responsibilities of the cloud provider itself. First on our list is infrastructure as a service or IaaS. Based on the NIST definition, infrastructure as a service is the service model that is designed to provide the consumer the capability to provision compute, storage, networks, and other fundamental computing resources, where you're able to deploy and run arbitrary software, which can include operating systems and applications. The consumer does not manage or control the underlying cloud infrastructure, but has control over operating systems, storage, and deployed applications, and possibly limited control of select networking components, for example, host firewalls. Okay, with that in mind, let's take a look at the AWS definition as well. For me, it helps to provide a greater understanding of the service models, and I'll go over these as well, just so we have another perspective. AWS tells us that infrastructure as a service contains the basic building blocks for cloud IT. It typically provides access to networking features, computers, virtual or on dedicated hardware, and data storage space. Infrastructure as a Service gives you the highest level of flexibility and management control over your IT resources. It is most similar to the existing IT resources that many IT departments and developers are familiar with. So with Infrastructure as a Service, you're given control to build your infrastructure according to requirements. 
you were responsible for the design and setup of networking, compute, storage, and databases with this model. Now, this is the most similar service model to traditional on-premises hosting. However, with this cloud service model, you don't need to manage the physical infrastructure uh, of services like your switches, uh, routers, firewalls, load balancers, cabling, power, data centers, uh, cooling, uh, security, and so forth. You typically would get a form of virtual machine, then you set up the operating system on it and do all the application installation and configuration on top of that, along with all the other supporting infrastructure needs to host that application. Next up, we have platform as a service. Now, starting with the NIST definition, we have platform as a service being the capability provided to the consumer to deploy onto the cloud infrastructure, consumer created or acquired applications created using programming languages, libraries, services, and tools supported by the provider. The consumer does not manage or control the underlying cloud infrastructure, including network, servers, operating systems, or storage, but has control over the deployed applications and possibly configuration settings for the application hosting environment. Okay, to help us understand that a bit better, let's jump straight into here what AWS has to say. So AWS is telling us that platform as a service removes the need for you to manage underlying infrastructure, usually hardware and operating systems, and allows you to focus on the deployment and management of your applications. This helps you to be more efficient as you don't need to worry about resource procurement, capacity planning, software maintenance, patching, or any of the other undifferentiated heavy lifting involved in running your application. So comparing to infrastructure as a service, platform as a service kind of takes away some of your control here. You typically have the capability to manage and configure the application and environment, but this platform as a service model abstracts away the actual cloud infrastructure layers uh, from the consumer. So things like the networking setup, compute resources, operating system setup, uh, application installation, uh, these are typically all done for you as part of the platform service offered. Now, examples here would be uh, Heroku, OpenShift, and the AWS Elastic Beanstalk service. Okay, our last service model is software as a service. Now, following the same theme here, we'll jump right into the NIST definition first, where it goes on to say that software as a service is the capability provided to the consumer to use the provider's applications running on a cloud infrastructure. The applications are accessible from various client devices through either a thin client interface, such as a web browser, or a program interface. The consumer does not manage or control the underlying cloud infrastructure, including network, servers, operating system, storage, or even individual application capabilities, with the possible exception of limited user-specific application configuration settings. Again, switching gears to the AWS definition, software as a service provides you with a complete product that is run and managed by the service provider. In most cases, people referring to software as a service are referring to the end user applications, such as web-based email. With a SaaS offering, you don't have to think about how the service is maintained or how the underlying infrastructure is managed. You only need to think about how you will use that particular software. Now, breaking this down a bit more, uh, a SaaS product provides easy access to some type of distributed application through remote access. Examples you may be familiar with, like uh, Gmail, Slack, uh, Salesforce, Shopify, uh, Dropbox, and you can probably think of a whole bunch of others. Now, these NIST definitions have the core as a service models, but there are a lot of other products that blur the lines between you know, two or even all three of these core models. If you hear some type of uh, as a service product, it likely fits predominantly in one of the three categories here. Next, I wanted to cover what these different core service models mean to you as the consumer or customer of them in terms of what you're responsible for managing compared to the cloud provider. I find this is easier to understand visually, so let's build out what these responsibilities look like for each of the models. All right, uh, I wanted to show you how I sometimes use Lego uh, as a way to you know, build out different stacks. And I find this kind of additional kinesthetic way of learning uh, helpful for me. So uh, 
let's see if we can build this out. Um, so first we'll start with like our physical layer here. So uh, we'll represent uh, you know, your servers by looking at uh, you know, CPU uh, memory. And then um, you know, we'll also have a bit of kind of the, the connectivity. So like the networking components. And then also the uh, storage piece as well. So we'll have things like your uh, disks and uh, you know all the other additional physical hardware. So layered on top of that, uh, we'll have a virtualization layer. So this is typically like your, you know, uh, you think of this as like your hypervisors. So something like uh, KVM or VMware layered on top of the physical uh, infrastructure. Throw that on top. And then uh, on top of this layer, layer we generally have the uh, guest operating system. So this is like on top of your virtual machine, you install like Linux or Windows. Can't really. It's hard to write on the slippery Lego. That's going to bug me. There we go. And then on top of the uh, guest OS, you typically have your uh, runtime system. Go. In this next layer, we're going to uh, represent the uh, data. And then last but not least, we'll uh, use this last block for the uh, application layer. Uh, that won't quite fit, so there we go. Perfect. So we're going to use this stack to represent some of the as a service models. All right, so we'll look at this from a different angle here. Um, let's build out that stack again. So first up, the physical layer comprising of your CPU, memory, disk, all the physical components. Uh, virtualization layer, uh, again, this could be you know a hypervisor layer, KVM, VMware, that type of thing. Uh, guest operating system. So if you're installing, you know, again, Linux or Windows on top of a virtual machine your uh, runtime system, data layer, and finally the application layer. So if we were to look at this stack here and if I were to add on-premises uh, on top of this here, who would be responsible for managing all these layers? So again, if you think of maybe um, you know a private cloud environment where you have a physical data center with all the servers, networking equipment, storage, uh, you're managing the virtualization layers, basically this entire stack. Who's responsible for all of it? Exactly. It's all your responsibility. You have full control, but all these layers are your responsibility. Now, if we take a look at the service models we just learned about and uh, dive into infrastructure as a service, let's see how this looks. And you'll notice the physical and virtualization layers are a different color here. That's because in the infrastructure as a service model, these are now the provider's responsibility. That physical layer, the data centers and virtualization, it's all managed for you. 
and you're typically given uh, you know some form of a virtual machine where you can now install your operating system and all the way up to the application layer on top of it, but you no longer have that control to manage that physical infrastructure. Then moving on to platform as a service, the stack it looks like this. So now the runtime and guest OS layers are now the provider's responsibility. So you just have your application and data to worry about. Um, you know, get an example of this might be the AWS Elastic Beanstalk service, where you can just essentially deploy your code and manage the uh, the data uh, for the application. But the runtime down is all kind of managed by that service and by AWS. And last but not least, we have software as a service. So here, the entire stack is managed by the service provider. Again, you don't have much control in the SaaS service model, but it's also the easiest to use. So the main takeaway I want you to have from this image is just the amount of control and responsibility you have from the full on-premises model to the right-hand side where uh, in a SaaS service model, you essentially have no control over the stack. There's a ton of pros and cons to uh, each of these service models. Uh, it really just depends on what your needs are as a customer and for the business. We'll be diving into some more of these pros and cons throughout the course, but I hope this gives you a better comparison of the different service models and understanding your responsibility levels for each one. So with that, we finish our breakdown of defining what cloud computing is by looking at the NIST definition of cloud computing, as well as looking at some other references like AWS to help define these areas for us. Now, please ensure you have a good grasp of these concepts before moving on and do the next exercise to help deepen your understanding of these cloud deployment and service models in action. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next videos. Welcome back everyone. Shortly we'll be going over a video just describing all the benefits cloud provides. Uh, but first to put that in context, I wanted to go on a bit of a journey uh, back, way back when uh, major cloud providers weren't around and you're kind of stuck with the uh, on-premises traditional IT infrastructure. Uh, so we'll go on a bit of a uh, fun journey and uh, hope you enjoy the exercise. Okay, first I want you to think of an online store. Uh, get creative, make it funny, whatever you want. Come up with a store name, uh, a few products, you know, try to think about who your uh, target market is, who your customers are, and maybe even uh, you know, sketch out a bit of a website design. Okay, awesome. You just came up with the next billion dollar business idea. Uh, but let's take that from concept to reality now by launching this imaginary online store onto the internet and make it public and start getting some sales. But there's a catch. You can't use any cloud services to launch. You're limited to traditional IT infrastructure. So I want you to write down all the IT considerations that you'll need to launch this online store. Because you know your online store is going to be the next billion dollar business and it's a sure thing, and you'll have tons of customers, uh, you're planning to go pretty big very early. Within the first six months, you're expecting over 100,000 visitors to your site every day and making, say, 10,000 sales every day. Okay, so where do you even begin? Uh, some of you may not have that traditional IT background, so I'll just go over a few things to uh, maybe get the wheels turning to start thinking about. So you want to start off thinking about the initial building blocks. Uh, you'll have a bunch of servers to handle the web traffic, uh, a lot of storage to handle like the images for your products, uh, customer information, uh, likely a couple databases, and all the networking equipment to connect all these components. And then next, where are you going to put all this stuff? You'll likely need to consider a data center. So now, are you going to buy uh, land to create your own data center? Are you going to purchase a big uh, you know, warehouse type of thing and convert it into a data center? Or are you going to use a co-location facility and essentially lease space from it? If you're going the route of building out your own data center, what are some of the things you want to consider there? 
Um, you obviously need the building, uh, perhaps you're leasing a couple of acres of land, and then the server rooms, you'll need uh, perhaps raised flooring, uh, tons of electrical, huge HVAC cooling systems, server racks or cages to mount all this equipment to, and a few network routers, uh, top of rack switches, firewalls, load balancers, all the network cabling to connect all these components. And then you'll likely need to consider some type of storage array, uh, buying a bunch of hard drives for that. Okay, so what are some other things you wanna think about here? So uh, you have your data center now, lots of high value equipment inside, and it's storing a lot of your customer information as well. So it's a lot of stuff we wanna protect. So let's think of some of the basic security things we might need. Uh, we probably need some kind of surveillance system, a bunch of cameras all around the building, uh, inside the server rooms, a bunch of like entry controls, uh, you know, perhaps metal detectors, uh, gates around the facility, security guards 24-7. Uh, so now with all this IT equipment, uh, potentially hundreds or thousands of servers, networking gear, storage equipment, so forth, all powered up, generating lots of heat, uh, perhaps we need a fire suppression system. And then quickly think of all the operational considerations. Uh, you're going to need data center technicians to uh, install and maintain all this equipment. And then you'll have some of your utility costs, especially the electricity bill. And then just the general upkeep of the building, uh, you know, uh, janitorial services, uh, perhaps landscaping services for the outside. Uh, depending where you're putting the data center, you might need uh, snow removal services. Now, this certainly isn't a exhaustive list of all the uh, considerations for a data center, but uh, hopefully it gets the wheels turning a little bit and uh, get some ideas to build out a bit of a cost estimate for running something like that. So pause here, maybe take you know 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, make a list of all your costs you think you'd have for your data center. Um, again, if you're not super familiar with uh, what some of these costs would be or data center considerations like this, uh, spend some time, search around on the internet, you can get some good estimates for uh, you know, what a server would cost and that type of thing. Welcome back. I hope you found that exercise fun and perhaps eye-opening a bit, uh, just to some of the costs involved with running your own data center. Now, I want you to keep in mind all the guesswork involved here. Uh, of course, some of us are probably new to uh, building out data centers, but uh, you know, just in general, if you think about your business, there's a lot of unknowns, right? We don't exactly know how much IT equipment we'll need to support the business and the online store. All this IT equipment is very, very expensive. You buy too much, you're wasting all your startup capital. Uh, you buy too little and you're not servicing your customers well. The website will go down or crash and you're losing lots of business. So let's think about that scenario for a minute. Your business uh, is more successful than you thought and now you need more capacity to handle all the additional traffic coming to your store. Now you need to buy a whole bunch more of IT equipment, but how much? You'll likely do some sort of baseline on the current load and what your projected customers and traffic are in the next couple months. And as you can imagine, it takes a quite a while to you know, uh, order this IT equipment. Uh, perhaps your business has this procurement process that you know, takes weeks to months to kind of go jump through all the hoops to order the equipment, have it shipped, arrived into the data centers, uh, unpacked, racked, cabled, configured, and ready to actually serve traffic. So now your website is suffering, uh, customers are complaining, because it's taking months and months to actually get the IT equipment in place to support this new load. You obviously don't want to be in this situation again. So when you're doing your forecast, you plan for this, you know, say three months, four months of additional time it takes to get this equipment operational. So your capacity planning is now, you know, looking a couple months out, plus the additional time it takes to actually get this IT gear. And uh, in most cases, you're adding a bit of buffer on top of that as well. So let's say now your business has been super successful. Uh, it's making the millions of dollars uh, so far in its first year. You've made it through all the scaling and capacity issues. And now you're trying to reach a larger audience. So now you have a global customer base, but in order to service these customers in different areas, it's hard to do it in one uh, geographic location in your current data center. So now you need to expand to a global footprint. Okay, great. You're probably thinking, I have a data center ready. 
I learned a lot through the process. I'll use that same model and I'll create, say, you know, two new data centers in different areas in the world. As you know, these data centers are very expensive. And this new kind of global market is a big unknown to you. You don't know if these new global territories will be successful. So you're a little worried about spending you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars opening up these new data centers. Anyways, I didn't want to get too in depth with this exercise, but just start you to think about the you know, large capital expenses with uh, IT equipment and data centers just to start a you know, potentially small to medium uh, online business. And then keep in mind too that a lot of other businesses need a lot more IT equipment than this. There might be physical offices uh, so you have, uh, you know, servers, workstations, all the networking equipment for that, per perhaps uh, different global branch offices around the world. So you have phones or maybe even contact centers to consider. Now, many times these IT complications and high capital expenses cause a lot of businesses to fail or perhaps not even get uh, ideas off the ground. A lot of companies may not have the capital to expand the business quick enough or they've overestimated the success of the business too much and bought too much IT equipment and they have all their capital tied up into this uh, IT gear that's essentially sitting idle and don't have that capital available to invest in other areas of the business. I wanted to use this lesson to just get us thinking about all the you know challenges and costs with traditional IT uh, just before heading into talking about the benefits of cloud and how it solves a lot of these problems. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lessons. Hello everyone, welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be talking briefly about the benefits of cloud, basically answering the question, why should I even bother with the cloud? Well, this is an AWS certification exam course with the nature of uh, the certified cloud practitioner being focused more on the core concepts of cloud computing. I wanted to take a more generic approach to discuss the benefits of cloud computing first. We'll be taking a look at these concepts quite high level and therefore they would be largely applied to all types of cloud providers. Later in the course, we'll be taking a look at the benefits of the cloud through the lens of AWS exploring in detail how AWS describes the benefits and value proposition of their cloud platform as part of the exam blueprint structure. All right, so let's dive in. And now that since we have a grasp on the cloud deployment models from the earlier lessons, let's use those as a guide to dive into the benefits of cloud and how some of the deployment models differ from each other uh, based on their specific benefits. So we'll start with the benefits of private cloud. Well, what are they? The main benefit of private cloud when compared against public cloud is control. With private cloud, the company operating the cloud owns and runs the entire infrastructure. So the company would own or at least control all the physical IT equipment, uh, cloud management software, networks, storage, everything. Now, depending on the type of business and the customers and partners the company deals with, there are typically a wide array of compliance and regulatory requirements at play. Due to some of these business requirements, companies may have an outright need for private cloud. Now, while the situation is rare, especially as moving to a major public cloud provider often provides significant benefits in those compliance areas, just know that this scenario does exist and is often a large driver for private cloud use. Okay, so beyond this private cloud control, what are some additional benefits? Well, uh, cost could actually be a benefit here. Now, while this is very rare in my experience, there may be specialized use cases or workloads that could potentially operate in a on-premises private cloud environment with less cost than running the same workload in a public cloud environment. My experience for even large enterprises with a pre-existing global footprint and data centers and global IT infrastructure in place, if you really start factoring in the total cost of ownership, it's hard to compete with public cloud providers on the cost benefits. Okay, so beyond this rare but potential cost savings of private cloud, are there any other benefits? Well, another benefit may be the control you have around the specific hardware specifications and software within a private cloud environment. 
you know, perhaps you have some sort of software that's only certified to run on specific hardware, or you have special software licensing considerations that are tightly tied to physical hardware components. Now, this next benefit I struggle to call out here, but I will mention security as a possible benefit with private clouds. But there's no denying that with public cloud, you're sharing those pooled resources with potentially thousands of other customers. For example, if you look at compute and take our general understanding of hypervisors and virtualization into account, we can assume that when we use some type of virtual machine instance on a public cloud platform, the underlying server is likely running many other virtual machine instances. So at the end of the day, your virtual machine is sharing the same physical hardware as other customers. The scope of how virtual machines are securely isolated from each other is way beyond the scope of this course. But if you or your organization has any concerns over the shared resource aspects of public cloud, a private cloud could guarantee that no other external company is using your cloud infrastructure. With that approach though, just remember you're taking on all the ownership of the infrastructure security layers yourself. Unless we're talking about very large organizations with the teams of in-house security experts, uh, well-staffed operations center, uh, modern data centers with millions of dollars of physical security controls and processes in place, it's extremely unlikely you would have a security posture that could come anywhere close to what leading public cloud service providers offer. Okay, so let's hop to the other side of the fence and talk about the benefits of public cloud. Again, we'll be covering public cloud benefits more in upcoming lessons where we focus specifically on the AWS cloud benefits. But for now, if we you know, just look at the general benefits of public cloud as a whole, we can say public clouds benefit us by offering some of the following. First, there's seemingly infinite scalability in the public cloud. You can scale out your IT infrastructure, uh, scale it back in again with complete freedom. In most cases, this provides your business all the flexibility it needs for meeting you know, changing demands. And here, all the hardware components are abstracted away from you as the customer. There are no upfront capital expenses for IT equipment and operational expenses to maintain you know, data centers and the hardware. And then of course, speed. Um, there's no more waiting for hardware to be ordered and installed to add capacity to your IT infrastructure. You now have essentially on-demand capabilities to create new resources on a public cloud uh, with no wait times. And then there's the global data centers. Uh, with public clouds, you can very quickly deploy your services all around the world. With traditional IT, you're typically looking at millions of dollars to get a single data center operational. Now with public clouds, you now have access to reach your global customers without all the high capital expenses. All right, so, so far we've mapped some of the cloud benefits to the private cloud and public cloud deployment models, but there was one more. Uh, do you remember what it was? You got it, hybrid cloud. So for hybrid cloud, it goes without saying that the benefits are a mix of private and public clouds. But let's call out some of the specific use cases where companies may benefit from the hybrid approach. You know, for certain workloads or use cases, it may be an advantage to do some type of large data processing jobs before sending them into the cloud for uh, backups or archiving, therefore allowing you to save on the compute costs and you know, network transfer costs using your on-premises infrastructure but then taking advantage of the low cost storage and archive services in the cloud for storing the output of these batch jobs. Also with the hybrid approach, you could keep highly secure and regulated workloads on your private cloud where you have full control, but then utilize specific cloud resources for workloads that don't have such restrictions, therefore giving you the advantages of both. So now that we have linked the new cloud benefits information here to our existing deployment model understanding, Let's look at the few other advantages of cloud computing at a high level through the lens of more a public cloud model. First, we have to mention capital expenses here. With the pay-as-you-go model of cloud resources, where you only pay for what you use when you need it, the large capital expenses involved for traditional data center infrastructure is replaced with operating expenses. Shifting business expenses away from large capital expenses, or CapEx, to more the operational expenses or OPEX generally is preferable for most businesses. Freeing up your capital to invest in areas that'll help your business thrive rather than tying up millions of dollars in IT equipment. 
This OPEX shift is very beneficial for smaller companies, allowing them to create world-class IT infrastructure with the global reach and also letting them quickly adapt to business growth and changing business objectives. So there's very little wasted costs, simply getting a monthly invoice for exactly what was used. Now think back to the exercise we did where it takes potentially millions of dollars of CapEx investment that would be needed for the traditional IT deployments just to get a business idea simply off the ground. Now, agility is another key benefit of the cloud. Internal teams no longer have to wait weeks or months for new compute hardware orders. All the order procurement processes of the business and you know, the product delivery, racking, power, networking connections, configuration, uh, equipment testing, each of these steps is often layered with delays due to the internal processes and ticket creation and various approval steps along the way. Cloud resources are typically on demand. Uh, you provision what you need, when you need it, shut it down when you don't. You can scale your IT infrastructure to your business needs in real time. If you're in retail, uh, you can quickly scale your resources for seasonal load changes due to the holidays or sale events like Black Friday. Um, perhaps you're in the education vertical and you have low demand in the summer and large peaks in the fall. Whatever your industry, the agility provided by the cloud is key. Now this next area ties into the agility topic. Experimentation is another key benefit of the cloud. Because teams have the agility to quickly access the necessary resources in the cloud, new product ideas can be quickly explored and experimented with. There's also very little financial risk for experimentation in the cloud. Dev teams can quickly try out new services, experiment with new architectures, uh, create new test environments, and ultimately focus on the product development rather than wasting time on uh, IT service requests for new equipment and potentially being blocked for weeks or more waiting for all this stuff to arrive and become operational. We're getting close to the end here, but we can't end this lesson without mentioning security as a benefit of public cloud. The cloud providers cover all the security considerations of the physical infrastructure, leaving your organization to focus on securing your data and application workloads. You know, there's no more worry about physical security of your data center building, uh, access controls, monitoring to go with it, security guards, uh, all the compliance and process around uh, how to dispose of things like hard drives and other storage media. All these physical security areas are managed for you by the public cloud service provider. So with that, we've explored some of the benefits of cloud at a high level and mapped some of those to the cloud deployment models we learned about. Uh, so I'd like to thank you for viewing and I'll see you in the next lessons. Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, so at this point, we should have a good understanding of what cloud computing is, uh, some of the benefits of cloud, and also some of the problems it tries to solve compared to traditional IT methods. Now to wrap up this foundational section, I wanted to do a quick intro on AWS. Basically answer the question, what is AWS? Now, I thought we would review the AWS resources directly. Uh, this will expose you more to the AWS website, uh, get you used to navigating around, exploring the documentation, and also get the exact wording from AWS directly for answering these questions about what AWS is. So let's dive in. All right, so to answer the question, what is AWS? AWS itself actually has a page called, what is AWS? So uh, I think this is a great place for us to uh, start. I'd like you to open this page and spend a good five minutes or so just skimming through all these sections. Uh, there is a intro video I'd recommend watching here as well. And uh, just get an idea of how AWS markets itself to potential new customers and start to get an idea of the scale of AWS. Now, one section I'd like to bring your attention to is down at the bottom here, uh, the Gartner Magic Quadrant. And you can see from the 2021 report where AWS lands compared to other cloud providers in this space. And once you've spent a few minutes here on this page, 
jump on over to the white paper on the overview of AWS services. Now again, spend a few minutes here going through this introduction section, as well as on the left here, going through some of these links. I'd recommend as a bit of a review, just going through this what is cloud computing section here. And then navigate through to the next topic about the advantages of cloud computing. We'll be covering this area in a lot more depth in future lessons, but spend a minute to just skim through this for now. And then for a bit more review, you can go to the types of cloud computing and take a moment to review the cloud service models and the cloud deployment models as defined by AWS. All right, so that concludes our very quick intro to AWS. We'll obviously be diving into AWS in a lot more detail in the upcoming lessons, but for now, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lessons. Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, you made it through the foundational section of the course, and now we're about to dive into the exam domains. Now, first up in domain one, we're going to cover some additional cloud concepts, and this is going to build on the foundational knowledge you learned in the earlier sections. So take a moment to review the topics for this domain, just so you have a high level overview of what's in store, and then uh, let's dive in. Welcome back. This is going to be a quick video on the six benefits of AWS. Uh, I find this is more the AWS sales pitch of the benefits of AWS compared to other cloud service providers. So looking at the six benefits of AWS, first up we have security. Here AWS is making the point that security starts with their core infrastructure. And that core infrastructure is built to meet the most stringent security requirements in the world. So as a customer of AWS, you can now build your applications and workloads on top of this global secure infrastructure. Next up, we have availability. AWS goes on to say here that they deliver the highest network availability of any cloud provider. AWS offers you multiple regions across the globe, and each one of those regions is made up of multiple availability zones. And each of these availability zones is an isolated partition of the overall AWS infrastructure. And this gives you the ability to build very resilient applications on top of AWS that can withstand a variety of failure scenarios. And then we move on to performance. Here, AWS offers a ton of options, everything from incredible global network capabilities to hundreds of options for their EC2 instance types. We'll be looking at a lot of these areas in the upcoming lessons as well. And next, let's take a look at scalability. This is where AWS gives you the benefit of the theoretical infinite scalability. You have that incredible flexibility to scale in and scale out your workloads, basically giving you the capability to scale out to thousands of servers in a matter of minutes. Next is the AWS Global Footprint. With AWS having the largest global footprint of any other cloud service provider, you have a tremendous amount of options around the globe to meet the needs of your business and customers. And last but not least is flexibility. Here, AWS is giving you a tremendous amount of choice with how you want to run your workloads and applications. You can leverage their incredible global network and regions and availability zones to create architectures that meet the needs of your business and customers.
So commit these six benefits of AWS to memory and take a moment to read through all the benefits of AWS from their page as well. Welcome back everyone. This will be a quick lesson on the six advantages of cloud as defined by AWS. So let's jump in. Okay, so we have the six advantages of cloud computing. So up first, we have the trade capital expenses for variable expenses. Now this advantage here, just describing that you no longer have to spend millions of dollars in capital expenses to build out data centers and buy physical IT resources. So in the cloud, you no longer have these large capital expenses. You're essentially making that shift from CapEx to OpEx. Now this can be a huge advantage for a lot of companies, especially small startups that don't have millions of dollars of capital to invest in their IT infrastructure. Up next is benefit from the massive economies of scale. Now, like most products, there's usually some form of economy of scale at play. If you think of your local big box store, if you typically buy large quantities or a large volume of some sort of product, you usually get it at a reduced cost compared to a smaller quantity or size. Now, if you think about the scale of Amazon as a company and AWS, think of all the IT hardware and infrastructure resources. AWS would have huge purchasing power from their suppliers and achieve a significant savings with all the IT equipment they need for their data centers. Now what AWS is saying here is that you can benefit from their purchasing power and discounts as that savings is passed on to you as a customer. And AWS actually goes a step further and builds their own custom hardware like CPUs. Now you as an AWS customer can take advantage of this custom hardware and take advantage of the significant savings with your compute workloads. And then up next is stop guessing capacity. Here with the AWS cloud, you don't need to have that crystal ball to help predict the future capacity needs for your business. You can launch resources like new EC2 instances or database or you know, storage capacity when you need it and only pay for those resources that are actually running. You don't have to make these wild guesses about your future business needs and build in costly buffers when you're doing capacity planning. You also don't have that risk of overbuying IT equipment or potentially have thousands to even millions of dollars of wasted IT equipment just sitting idle. With the AWS cloud, you can quickly scale out and equally important, scale back in exactly in tune to the demands of your business at that point in time. And up next is increased speed and agility. In the AWS cloud, you have the flexibility to quickly experiment, uh, develop, innovate, and develop your applications a lot faster than you can in traditional IT environments. Your IT resources can be created in you know, a matter of seconds rather than waiting weeks or months for traditional IT hardware to be purchased, installed, set up, and made available to you as a developer. You can also very quickly stop and delete your cloud resources. So if you have you know, failed experiments or proof of concept environments, once the experiment or tasks are complete, you can shut all that down and no longer have to pay for it. And next up is stop spending money running data centers. This one touches on the operational cost of data centers. Thinking of all the utility costs like electricity to power your data centers, uh, the cooling, HVAC systems, leasing land or buildings, uh, property maintenance, security guards, uh, data center technicians. This is a lot of expense for a business where that money could be reinvested back into the business to perhaps develop new products or something that'll help differentiate your business from competitors. And last up, we have Go Global in Minutes. This one ties into the AWS Global Network and the ability to run your workloads close to your customers or wherever your business requires. So just a quick lesson here, please take a few minutes to review the AWS page as well, just as another form of review. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lessons. Hello, it's great to see you here in another lesson. 
We're going to continue our voyage learning about some of the benefits of AWS. Now we're going to focus on where the exam blueprint's calling out uh, being able to describe the key security benefits of AWS. Now I want to take the approach again here of just calling out some of the key benefits and then referring you to the official AWS documentation. Learning how to navigate around the AWS documentation is an important skill for the real world, and it's always going to be the most up-to-date information for you. So I'll be going over the key benefits of AWS security just at a high level and expect you to refer to the documentation to go through it in more depth and layering on more understanding of these topics. So with that, let's go through them. The first on our list is keep your data safe. Now this seems like a pretty basic thing to call out here as a benefit, but if you think about a data center and everything that's involved with securing it and the storage in it, there's a ton of stuff to consider. With AWS, all that data is stored in their highly secure data centers. Now another great benefit here is being able to meet compliance requirements. We'll be taking a look at this later on in the course, but for now understand that AWS has a ton of certifications and different compliance programs in place and you as a customer can you know, build on top of those. So a lot of the underlying uh, requirements for these certifications are already done for you, potentially reducing a lot of effort to achieve something like you know, your SOC 2 compliance. Now this next key benefit of security in AWS seems a bit out of place, save money. Now this saving money angle is in the context of thinking about you know, how much it would cost you to run your own data centers with state-of-the-art security compared to running your workloads on AWS. On AWS, you can maintain that high-level security without having to own and operate your own data centers. The last key benefit of AWS security is scale quickly. Here, security scales with your workload on AWS. If you're working for a massive enterprise or a small startup, the AWS infrastructure can scale according to your needs and keep your data safe. And that's it for understanding the AWS security benefits. Uh, now I'll refer you back to the white paper to do some additional reading and deepen your understanding of these topics. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you're enjoying the course so far and I'll see you in the next lessons. Hey everyone, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to look at the AWS reliability benefits. Now to help guide our learning here, we're going to look at the AWS well-architected framework. We're going to learn about this framework thing a lot more in future lessons, so we won't dive into that uh, too much right now. But I wanted to kind of introduce it and specifically look at the reliability pillar of this framework. Now, rather than bore you with a couple bullet points on these reliability benefits, I want to point you to two sections of the reliability pillar for now. Uh, first, the uh, design principles, and there's also another section on understanding availability needs. Now, this here is going to be the direct link to the design principles. So click on this and open it up in a new window. Awesome. And then also open up this one which links directly to the Understanding Availability Needs subsection. So take a moment to read through those and test your knowledge in the next quiz section. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hey everyone, welcome back. In this lesson, we're just going to continue on with the exam blueprint and help you describe the benefits of high availability in AWS. And we'll be taking a look at the AWS global infrastructure resources again to help us understand this topic. We dive into this AWS global infrastructure in a lot more depth than a upcoming domain of this course. So there's no need to spend too much time here, but I just wanted to highlight this high availability section for you. So I'd like you to click on the link here to jump to this section of the page and spend a moment to read through the high availability section. The takeaway you're after here is just 
very high level understanding at this point of AWS regions containing multiple availability zones or AZs. And as a customer, this lets you build your applications on top of this highly available infrastructure to create fault tolerant and highly available applications. So a nice short lesson for you, and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. We're going to move right along by looking at the elasticity benefits of AWS. But before we move on, I just want to make sure that you're also taking breaks. Trust me, you're not doing yourself any favors by spending an hour or two or more straight uh, watching these videos. You know, go through these lessons in 25 or 30 minute chunks of time and then take a five minute break and then repeat this cycle, you know, three or four times and then make sure you take a longer break after that. So we'll jump over to the elasticity benefits now, but I did want to call that out in case any students are trying to fly through this course. Trust me, you're not doing yourself any benefits in terms of your long-term retention, especially if you're planning on taking the exam. So break up your study time and take breaks. Make sure you're doing the follow-up activities, and I'm sure you'll find you'll actually save time in the long run taking this approach. Now we're going to look at the reliability pillar again of the well-architected framework uh, specifically looking at a section on how to adapt your workloads to changing demands. The elasticity piece meaning being able to scale in and out your workloads according to that demand. So I'm going to give you a link to that page here, no here, and uh, let's dive in. <laughs> oh. Sorry about that folks. All right, where were we here? Um, oh yeah, we'll quickly look at this section in the reliability pillar here. Design your workloads to adapt to changes in demand. Now this first sentence just at the top here basically sums this up. The elasticity benefit that AWS provides you gives you the ability to add and remove resources so that they match your business needs at a specific point in time. We'll be diving into a lot of these concepts described here such as auto scaling a lot later in the course, but this is where you can really take advantage of the elasticity benefit of AWS. Now take a moment to skim through the rest of this section here. Um, we'll be covering a lot of these in a lot more detail later on in the course. But again, the takeaway here is from elasticity benefit, just being able to add and remove resources quickly to meet your business requirements at that specific point in time. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lessons. Welcome back everyone. In this lesson, we're going to explore the agility benefits of AWS. Now, this will just be a quick lesson because we already explored agility as part of the overall benefits of cloud, but it's certainly worth reviewing here again and just further strengthen our ability to describe the agility benefits of AWS. Now, agility in AWS, again, just referring to the broad array of products and services that you have access to. I actually like using the AWS documentation homepage as a way to quickly view all the different product categories and individual services within those. Now I'll slowly scroll through these just to give you a very high level idea of how many products and services exist in AWS. Now, as you can see, there's an amazing variety of products and services available for you, and you can utilize these to essentially build anything you can imagine. Also keep in mind, nearly all these services are available to you within minutes. You can quickly experiment with new things, try new services out, and see what's the best fit for your workload or your business. So that's all I wanted to touch on with the agility benefits here. Uh, so thank you for viewing, and I'll see you in the next video.
Hey everyone, welcome back. In this lesson, we're just going to talk quickly about the scalability benefits on AWS. Now, we've already touched on some of the scaling and elasticity benefits of cloud in general, but if we look at this through the AWS lens specifically, we can refer to the AWS global infrastructure and all the capabilities that provides you as a customer to build you know, highly scalable global architectures for your applications and workloads. Now, AWS has close to 300 different services to choose from on their cloud platform, many of which with uh, the theoretical infinite scaling capabilities. Now, when I think of scalability on AWS, the first service that comes to mind is their uh, compute product, EC2. Here, AWS gives you over 400 different instance type options to pick the right CPU, memory, and networking capabilities for your workload. Then within each of these instance type variations, you have theoretically infinite scaling capabilities for your compute workload. Now as an AWS customer, this is amazing. You can scale out your compute infrastructure to you know, potentially thousands of servers within minutes. Now we'll be diving into this EC2 service and the AWS global infrastructure again in future lessons. But the quick takeaway here is just being able to understand the AWS global infrastructure, the flexibility it provides you to build scalable architectures in the cloud, and the tremendous choice and flexibility of the AWS services to scale your workloads and scale them back in as needed for your business. In the follow-up material of this lesson, I'll include a few links I'd like you to spend a few minutes to review just to strengthen your understanding of this topic. Uh, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi everyone, welcome back. In this lesson, we're gonna go over the pay-as-you-go pricing of AWS. Now, AWS offers this pay-as-you-go pricing model on close to 200 different services. So as a consumer, you're able to pick and choose the right services you need for your business, as well as only use them for when you actually need them. There's no confusing licensing or long-term contracts with these services. You simply use them when you need them and stop using them when you don't. Now, AWS pricing is very similar to how you pay for utilities at home, for example. Uh, you know, your electricity or water bill. Um, you know, you go into a dark room and you need a light. So you flip the light switch on and you start paying your electricity bill for the consumption of electricity that that bulb is using. Um, you know, you don't need it anymore. You turn the switch off and you stop paying for that utility. So many of AWS services follow that same model where, uh, for example, if you needed to spin up a virtual machine instance for a couple hours, you're only billed for that period of time that it's running. So this pay-as-you-go pricing model uh, goes hand in hand with the elasticity and uh, scalability benefits of AWS by allowing your business to adapt to changing needs and only pay for what you use. You no longer have that complex guesswork of capacity planning and you know, the risk of over-provisioning or under-provisioning your IT infrastructure. Now to help understand this concept of pay-as-you-go pricing and the challenges with capacity planning, uh, I just wanted to draw out a few uh, charts here to better illustrate this for you. So I just wanted to quickly illustrate a bit of a capacity planning exercise here. So, you know, say we have, uh, you know, some sort of demand over a period of time for, you know, our example workload in a production environment, um, you know, and perhaps uh, pick a different color here. You know, perhaps this is our historical kind of workload trend the last few months. And this is basically where we're at today. So here the amount of servers in our data center have been handling this you know, workload nicely, but now we're starting to get to that, uh, let's say 90% utilization rate, and we're starting to get worried we won't be able to handle the current workload trend. So we start the capacity planning exercise. So we'll start that capacity planning uh, exercise here, which is essentially a lot of guesswork in terms of the workload trends. And uh, you know we might factor in all kinds of things about the business to make some best guesses as to what the workload expectations are in the future. 
So perhaps in this example, we're looking about uh, you know six months out. So we're kind of maybe around this time frame, and you know based on our guesswork of the expected workloads, we now need to order um, you know IT equipment at sort of this capacity level here. You know, so in this example, we've you know made that large uh, you know capex investment to order you know hundreds to thousands of new servers to handle this you know expected workload. But in this example, and a lot of times in the real world, our capacity planning guesses weren't accurate. So our actual workload trend, you know, might go something like this. So in this example, we, you know, obviously have a lot of waste because we ordered, you know, potentially, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars of, you know, new servers to handle this kind of expected workload here. But our actual demands are, uh, you know, significantly different. So all this area is a lot of, you know, wasted capex, and we also over and above that have the opex costs of keeping that hardware, you know, maintained, powered, cooled, and so forth. Now, perhaps in a little less extreme example here, back this out a bit. We have a in this next example, say a, you know, pretty consistent workload demand and growth. So even in this example with a consistent sort of workload trend, we often have these, you know, steps uh, for our, you know, capacity increases over a period of time. We go through this cycle of ordering more hardware to meet kind of the expected future demands. And then that workload grows to catch up. Uh, we order more hardware you know, and those steps kind of increase. Now, what can also happen if perhaps you can't do your uh, hardware ordering frequently enough, you know, perhaps you're on some sort of yearly cycle or, you know, every six months. So the longer the time frame, the, the greater the risk of not getting the accurate forecast for your workloads. For example, uh, you might have kind of this, you know, step here and you kind of expected that you could kind of take this sort of, you know, uh, stepping approach here to your business, but again, the actual workload demands, you know, might have, you know, increased faster than, uh, than expected. So in this example here with the, you know, common steps of over-provisioning, all this area is sort of the, the wasted resources where your new equipment is essentially sitting idle because your workload demands haven't caught up with the additional capacity you've added to your data center. Perhaps our workload increased faster than expected. So now our IT infrastructure can't meet the workload demands. Now in this scenario here, there might be a variety of risks to the business, uh, perhaps lost customers, a variety of stability issues with the platform, you know, any number of problems. Now in my experience, when companies sort of face this under-provisioned uh, scenario here in the next round of capacity planning, there's a big additional buffer that gets added to the you know workload estimates and as you can imagine that additional buffer just you know continues to add more you know wasted resources so these quick drawings uh, got a little messy here but i hope they illustrate uh, some of the concepts behind the you know challenges with capacity planning and some of the waste and risk scenarios involved now to quickly tie this back into the paysio pricing and you know, the elasticity and scalability benefits of AWS, you're now able to just pay and utilize what you need for your workload at any kind of point in time. So you no longer have to worry about these capacity planning exercises, the large CapEx cost to expand out data centers, and the risk of being under-provisioned because you can't scale out your data centers fast enough. And that wraps up the lesson on pay go pricing on AWS. Well, I'll see you in the next lessons. Hi everyone, welcome back once again. In this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion about the benefits of AWS and specifically how they enable you to focus on your business. So if we think about all the benefits of cloud computing and AWS that we've learned about so far, all these come together to essentially let you or your business uh, do what you do best. For example, your company may offer some type of SaaS service. Now we know from the traditional IT approach it you know potentially costs millions of dollars to build up the 
you know, data centers and IT infrastructure to support that type of product. There'd be the millions of dollars in CapEx and a tremendous amount of OpEx to keep those data centers running and all the staff to support it. And of course, all the risks with the capacity planning angles with buying too much equipment or not enough to support the business. Now, what AWS essentially offers you as a business is to be able to focus on your company's product. So in this example, again, our SaaS solution on developing that SaaS product. The development team isn't tied up waiting for new uh, equipment to arrive to uh, test out new architectures or new services. Their time isn't being wasted going through internal procurement processes to order new servers. Your development team can be focused on uh, improving your product or coming in with new product ideas rather than being bogged down with all the traditional IT overhead. Now, since we're on this thread about focusing on your business and you know, building products that differentiate your business from other competitors. I want to introduce one of my favorite uh, blog articles from back in 2006. This came from, uh, I think, a Jeff Bezos MIT presentation, where I believe this is the first uh, mention of this undifferentiated heavy lifting topic. Now, this idea of undifferentiated heavy lifting is essentially all the stuff that, you know, doesn't matter to your business from the perspective of making it more competitive in the marketplace. You know, in our example, we're talking about here with a, you know, SaaS product, you have some sort of, uh, you know, SaaS service, what servers and, you know, data centers and storage arrays and all that stuff behind the scenes, basically all the IT infrastructure to support the SaaS service doesn't really matter to my customers. Again, with that SaaS service, all that IT infrastructure is abstracted away from them. Your customers just care that they have the best SaaS product in the market for them to use. So as a business, if my product's that SaaS service, why do I want to be investing millions of dollars in the IT infrastructure when I can be using that investment to actually improve the SaaS product for my customers? But I'll bring up that blog post quickly here and uh, provide you a link. I'd recommend giving it a quick read as I find it helps uh, solidify this idea of how AWS allows you to focus on your business. So that's about it for this lesson here. Again, just the key takeaways, how AWS lets you focus on your business by removing all that undifferentiated heavy lifting so you can focus on what matters to your customers. And also by using AWS, you're essentially offloading that uh, muck or heavy lifting to AWS itself, allowing your business to focus on what matters. And also it removes a lot of the barriers for small business as well. Again, quickly going back to our SaaS idea here, you know, if I'm a you know, small startup with 20 employees, we may have a unique product offering that's different in the marketplace. So with AWS, we can actually leverage their cloud platform to bring our product to market. And we're essentially able to compete with perhaps, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations because we don't have to worry about the millions of dollars of IT infrastructure investment to get our idea off the ground. So with that, I'll wrap up this lesson on how AWS lets you focus on your business and let you get back to focusing on your learning. See you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we are continuing on with understanding some of the items involved in building out a TCO proposal. We've looked at CapEx in the previous lesson, but now we'll see what items may be involved for the OpEx side of costs that we need to consider for our TCO analysis. Again, just so we're on the same page, I'll be referring to operational expenses as OpEx. Now, OpEx expenses are a bit simpler to understand. Uh, these are your ongoing, fairly predictable costs for your day-to-day -day operations. Compared to CapEx, these are often uh, you know, much smaller expenses. Some examples of OPEX would be, you know, your utility charges like uh, monthly electricity bill, uh, things like employee salaries, and usually any, you know, rental or lease expenses. Now, when building out that TCO story for a traditional data center, uh, think of all the utility costs to run all that IT equipment and keep it cool. Perhaps you have, uh, you know, monthly inspection services for your cooling systems uh, and maintenance services for your generators. If you own the data center facility, you'll likely also have things like maintenance contracts to keep the property clean uh, inside and out, uh, the lawn mode for the property uh, and roads and parking lots cleared in the winter. 
Perhaps you're paying a monthly charge for some fiber internet connections with various internet service providers. Uh, there may be you know, your rent or lease charges for the data center building or the land itself. Then consider all the salaries for folks involved with operating the data center. We'd likely be looking at a few full-time data center technicians to receive the hardware orders, unbox them, uh, asset tag them, mount them in rack hardware, cable them, test them, and so on. And we have security guards 24-7 uh, as well, then uh, facility maintenance staff to ensure the building is clean and well-maintained. And we may want to even think outside the data center box here a bit. Uh, you know, how much time may be involved from the numerous folks involved with your IT or engineering organizations at the company uh, that we may need to consider salary costs for to include in our OPEX calculations. There are typically hundreds of hours of time spent uh, dedicated to traditional IT data center operations. Uh, and this work is really tracked uh, from a time perspective, so it's often hard to get specific numbers here. But consider all the folks involved from, you know, perhaps the uh, project management, you know, accounting teams, procurement teams, all the engineering teams involved that may test and approve data center equipment from vendors. And then all the various meetings to organize all the operations of the data center, the time and people involved uh, in the change management processes, creating and prioritizing change management tickets. Uh, perhaps there are also compliance and governance teams involved. And of course, we need to call out the dedicated network and data center specialists involved in maintaining all these systems and network configurations day to day. You know, perhaps there's a capacity planning team uh, that spends a lot of time monitoring workloads and doing the forecast estimates to ensure there are you know, enough IT resources available for the business. And then you'll also likely have a full you know, 24 by seven operations center to monitor all the systems. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg you'll need to consider to build out a full TCO analysis. But for the scope of the exam, uh, this will get you familiar with you know, some of the OPEX items that need to be considered for inclusion in the TCO proposal. So with that, I'd like to conclude this lesson. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey there, welcome back. In this lesson, we'll explore the impacts of software licensing in the cloud. Okay, so if we continue with this idea of building a TCO proposal for comparing our traditional IT environments to running those workloads in the cloud, one other area we need to look at is software licensing. We've gone through the you know, CapEx and OpEx areas already, and you're likely seeing the tremendous cost advantages that public cloud can offer. But before we start, looking at moving workloads into the cloud uh, or just running software in the cloud in general, it, it's important to understand the software license details. This software licensing stuff is also part of the story for putting together a TCO proposal. There may be the cost advantages or disadvantages when moving to the cloud depending on the terms of the license. Now, software license terms are often complex and it may require help from the vendor and even your organization's legal team to understand some of the legal and cost implications of using the software in the cloud. You'll want to be certain how software licenses work in the cloud. Uh, you know, just some questions you'll want to consider are, does the software license allow it to run in the public cloud? Or is it a limitation that it you know, needs to run on dedicated on-premises equipment? Is the license based on the number of CPU sockets or processor cores of the host uh, the software is installed on? Does the license allow the software to run on virtualized hardware? Uh, how does that impact the license pricing? Do I need a dedicated host in the cloud to install the software on? We'll be talking about what a dedicated host is a bit later in the course, but for some context, we know in the cloud resources are pooled together and provided to customers. For a compute, potentially thousands of servers are offered in a shared pool of compute capacity for all the cloud providers' customers to use. Now, when you start a virtual machine instance, it may run on any one of those potentially thousands of servers in that compute pool. Now, some software licenses are crafted in a way where the use of the software is based on how many CPU cores are available to your server or virtual machine instance in our case. 
Therefore, to comply with the licensing terms, you need to be able to consistently run the software on a specific hardware configuration and keep track of the CPU core count being used. Dedicated hosts on AWS provide you with this capability to basically ensure your virtual machine instance always runs on the same physical server where possible, uh, as well as provide you with all the visibility and compliance tracking around you know, the CPU cores being used. Now, I bring this up because there are typically a higher cost of using dedicated hosts in the cloud. So if your software licensing requires this, make sure you factor that into the TCO. Okay, so moving on. Uh, can you bring your own license, uh, often abbreviated to BYOL? So if you have a license for the software already for your on-prem use, is this transferable into the cloud? Or do you need to get a special license specific to operating that software on the cloud platforms? For the purpose of the exam, uh, AWS has a great deal of information on this software licensing topic. They even have a license manager service to help keep track of this stuff. They also make things easy through the AWS Marketplace, where you can often find specific Amazon machine images or AMIs that have the software pre-installed and the license is included in the pay go charges while you use that instance. So for example, instead of paying hundreds or thousands of dollars up front for a license, you can use one of these AWS Marketplace images, then pay a little extra per hour charge for the use of that software. Now you may have the pleasure of looking at Microsoft software licenses at some point, uh, this can be quite a daunting experience, but I wanted to mention that there are a lot of options available to you on AWS and share this page with you that goes over some of the Microsoft licensing details. No need to spend a lot of time on that page. Skim through it quick and just know it exists. And there are some resources like this to help navigate this area of software licensing in the cloud. Now, AWS also helps customers with all this software licensing pain through a no-cost service called License Manager. Now, this is beyond the scope of the course, but skim through this page and get a high-level understanding of what problems the service may solve for you in the future uh, if you need to manage software licensing on AWS. Okay, that covers what I wanted to go over in this lesson. Now, just a reminder to ensure you're taking regular breaks as you go through these lessons. You know, take that five minute break, uh, go for a short walk, or even go just into another room, uh, do some stretches, whatever. Uh, give your brain a break for a bit. You know, when you're back, review some notes or you know, create some new flashcards of the content you just learned in the last few lessons. The break along with the active recall exercise will do wonders for you know, your long-term retention of the content here. Okay, so enjoy that break and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we are gonna keep going on the journey, learning about some of the cloud economic stuff. But before we dive into the exam blueprint items, I want you to get into the mindset now that we're an AWS customer that is already running a variety of workloads on their cloud platform. You know, our business is booming. Uh, there's a lot of growth in the company. And well, let's just say you notice that your AWS bill has also been booming. In the next few lessons, we'll explore at a high level uh, some of the operational areas you'll want to look at to help reduce your cloud expenses. These next lessons are a, you know important topic, but again, a tip of the iceberg look at a much bigger topic that's outside the scope of this course, uh, this area of cloud management and cloud financial operations or cloud FinOps. Uh, is an entire world of topics on its own, uh, one of which I'm very interested in. Uh, now, first, I've worked with many companies over the years, and there's always a focus uh, at some point on reducing the cloud bill for the organization. Most companies see the growing costs of their cloud infrastructure spend, and the first thing the executive teams ask for is to reduce the cloud expenses. Okay, well, that makes sense, but I would like companies to change the question from how can we cut our cloud infrastructure costs to how can we reduce the wasted cloud infrastructure costs? Well, what's the difference here? Uh, Mike, you just added the word wasted to that, big deal. Well, we should have an idea from our previous lesson so far about the massive cost savings of the cloud. 
I want to get the point across that having a big cloud bill every month shouldn't necessarily be seen as a bad thing. If your organization is using the cloud based on you know, best practices and leveraging the endless options around elasticity and scaling, and using the right type of compute, uh, storage, and database types for your needs, and also building the applications to take advantage of the uh, cloud native features. Having a high cloud bill every month can be a very good thing. It's typically an indication that your business is innovating and growing. The issues with high cloud infrastructure costs come down to waste. And as we've learned with cloud, we pay for what we provision or create in the cloud. The problem is a lot of inefficiencies can be created by running cloud resources that are not being utilized efficiently by the company. For example, if you think of a cloud provider as a restaurant, uh, you know, we go in the door, uh, you know, sit down, uh, we're given this huge menu that's 300 pages front and back, there's hundreds of mouth-watering options to choose from. Now, perhaps a bunch of them look good and I want to try them all, so I order them, uh, I give each a taste, or perhaps we're just hungry and need to fulfill the basic need quickly uh, and need something fast. So we order the first thing that seems like it'll be tasty and do the job without really thinking about the other options or what the price of that meal was. Now, there's a ton of ways I can use this restaurant analogy to the cloud, uh, but even with these examples I mentioned, we get an idea how it's quite easy to order things, to try them out, and we could never eat all that you know stuff that we ordered. Uh, the food that we paid for sits on the plate and it's you know thrown out. Uh, you know, or in the other example, we have some basic need like hunger, or say we're hungry for some compute capacity uh, fast to meet you know a deadline or a sudden demand in workload capacity, and we you know quickly pick some cloud resources to fill that hunger need of the business. You know, it did the trick. We're not hungry anymore, uh, but we didn't even look at the prices on the menu of what we ordered. We ended up buying a huge party platter off the menu and there's a ton of food left over that we won't use. You know, anyways, I think you get the idea. Uh, there's a ton of menu choices available to us in the cloud. As customers, it is our responsibility to make the best choices off that menu according to our requirements and then operate the resources as efficiently as possible. All right, let's wrap up this intro on reducing costs here. Thanks for watching and uh, also a quick reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel for a variety of other cloud focused content and also to get involved in our Slack community with fellow students that are part of the cloud Viking tribe of learners like yourself. You know, ask questions, uh, answer questions. Uh, I find helping others out a great way to reinforce what you've learned and you know challenge what you thought you knew uh, and give you you know other perspectives on topics you may not have thought of. Anyways, thanks again, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we continue looking at ways we can reduce costs in the cloud. Uh, so we're going to touch on the idea of right sizing first. Basically, the concept here is to match our cloud resources we use as closely to the requirements of that workload as possible. Now, when thinking about this in the context of migrating workloads to the cloud, we have the benefits here again around the elasticity, uh, scalability, and the tremendous amount of choice. We're no longer tied to server configuration constraints where we may have to overbuy what the workload requires to run. And if our workload demands change, we're fairly stuck with what's running in the data center. You know, we have the wasted, you know, idle infrastructure if workload demands go down, and workload performance or stability risk if demand increases beyond what our server resources and data center capacity allows for. In the cloud, you can be very granular about picking the right combination of CPU, memory, and storage for your workload requirements. On the compute side, we have that EC2 service, which, you know, again, we'll later in the course, but within EC2, you have hundreds of variations of processors, uh, memory, uh, networking, and storage options. Now, as a customer, this lets you choose the best fit for your workload. One practice that I've often seen uh, part of cloud migrations is trying to replicate on-premise compute infrastructure in the cloud. For example, you may have servers with um, you know, six core processors and say, 
256 gigabytes of memory available. So the thinking is, well, that's what we have today and things are working, so let's just use the same setup in the cloud. This usually leads to a tremendous amount of waste. You know, you're paying for very large instance types that will be you know, very likely underutilized by your workload and end up costing you a lot of you know, wasted money. Ideally, you'd want to use smaller instance types for the workload and do horizontal scaling for workload demand rather than these large vertically scaled instances just copied from the traditional IT environment. We'll touch on the horizontal and vertical scaling concepts briefly uh, later in the course, but this is more an area that's covered by the associate and professional uh, exam scopes. So from the scope of our exam topic here on the identification of operations that would benefit from right sizing and moving to the cloud, what should we be looking for? From this hypothetical uh, cloud migration example we're working on here, uh, it would make sense to identify workloads that have the most variable demand first. These often lead to the greatest gains in the cloud and are the most problematic for traditional IT environments. You'll want to look for those services and workloads that can benefit from the vast array of instance types so you can fine tune the CPU and memory ratios to the workload demand and reduce waste. Also, any workloads with applications that can horizontally scale well you know, taking advantage of those elastic load balancing capabilities to scale in and scale out to the peaks and valleys of your demand. Also workloads that don't have users on them 24 by 7 or prime candidates for moving to the cloud. For example, you may have a variety of lab, uh, test, or QA environments for your development teams. Now say your development team operates in the same time zone. So basically between, you know, 8 p.m. in the evening and 6 a.m. the next morning, there may be zero load on these environments. In the cloud, you can stop instances or scale in during these times and realize significant cost savings. You're essentially right-sizing entire development environments to the needs of the business. There can be tremendous cost savings here. For some organizations, the on-premises equipment or even cloud resources supporting the various development and quality assurance teams exceeds what is needed for the core production infrastructure. When these development teams are not working at nights or on weekends, why have all this equipment or cloud resources left running? In the cloud, you can stop these resources after hours and on weekends and spin them up again on weekday mornings so they're ready to go as teams start their day. In fact, there are many different ways to completely automate this type of approach in AWS. Now, storage is often a big win in the cloud compared to traditional data center solutions. Picking cloud storage solutions that are right-sized and matched to the performance, uh, size, access patterns, and retention requirements are often easy wins when looking to reduce costs with a cloud migration. Next, uh, databases are another key item to consider in the cloud. Uh, there's a variety of database technologies available to you in the cloud, as well as a huge variety of configurations of these uh, with the CPU, uh, memory and storage, depending on the database type we're talking about. All these options let you right-size your databases as well to your business needs. I'll quickly add that there are tremendous operational benefits with all these areas in the cloud as well. We'll be covering a few of these operational benefits in the next lessons, but I just wanted to mention this here to keep in the back of your mind. So you should have this basic understanding of this right-sizing concept and a few areas you can look at to identify some workloads and operations that could benefit from a move to cloud. Now, I'm going to include some links in the follow-up material uh, to this lesson. I'd like you to spend some time to go through them and review it just to deepen your understanding of the concepts from this lesson and also to introduce you to a few other areas of the AWS documentation. So with that, uh, thanks for viewing and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll understand a few of the benefits cloud infrastructure automation can provide. Now, as you can imagine in large organizations, the required cloud infrastructure to support your business can get very complex uh, and have huge scope across potentially you know, hundreds of different AWS services, uh, accounts, and you know, even global regions. Now, to help with the immense pain and manage very complex environments, a variety of tools are available to help automate many of these areas. 
The principle of this type of automation is rooted in the practice of infrastructure as code. Now, this is often abbreviated as IAC. The practice of using infrastructure as code in your organization is that all your cloud infrastructure and the configuration is created through code. In contrast to this, uh, say we need to deploy some type of application. Uh, now, for our example, we'll need uh, to set up a variety of networking configurations, uh, create a load balancer, uh, set up storage services, uh, create a database, and deploy maybe 50 virtual machines for the compute requirements. Now, you can certainly accomplish this through a web console by clicking you know, a thousand different things and filling in a variety of information into fields in order to provision all the supporting infrastructure. But I think you'd agree with me that you know, taking this approach would be very time consuming and error prone. Now on top of that, let's say we need to repeat the same deployment in four other regions, uh, you know, for production environments, um, and then maybe 20 replications of that environment for various development activities. You start to see the pain here. Uh, doing everything manually through web console is very error prone and certainly not scalable. You know, how can you guarantee that you know, those thousand mouse clicks and parameter fields you filled in in the web console uh, for the configuration are you know, consistent across all these different deployments? Now, I ran through this scenario just to highlight some of the pain the development and operations teams you know, supporting this cloud infrastructure would face when taking a fully manual approach. Okay, so now what are the benefits of automation then? Well, first we'll look at efficiency. Uh, when you can automate all these repeated activities, you can significantly reduce the time you spend managing all the infrastructure deployments and the configurations. All this time saved by your operations and development teams can be focused on your business. Now, a reminder here about the focus on your business and on differentiated heavy lifting topics we covered, they certainly apply here as well. You know, why have your best developers spending hours and hours clicking through a web console to deploy infrastructure when their time can be used to develop new features or products for the business? Now, moving on, uh, security is another benefit of automation. You know, through automation, you can bake in security best practices into your infrastructure and configuration. The automation can also ensure your environments are consistent. In large organizations with you know, 50 or more AWS accounts and hundreds or thousands of environments within them, ensuring all these are set up correctly with the proper security configurations and without some form of automation help is essentially impossible. Now, automation also helps remove the potential for human errors, creating configuration mistakes and leaving security holes in our environments. Now, automation can help us with auditing as well. Uh, the you know, automation tools typically have very verbose logging capabilities. So you can have a built-in way of doing an inventory of what resources are deployed in your environments and document how they're configured. The tools and their logging output also helps track and potentially alert to any changes to these resources in your environments. Next, automation can further enhance the elasticity benefits as well. While more of the scope of the associate and professional level exam topics, just know there are seemingly endless integrations and automations possible through interacting with the AWS Application Programming Interface, or API. You can build all kinds of unique workflow automations to provision, uh, scale, and configure resources in an elastic way. Next, automation can help with portability. Okay, so what is this portability thing? Well, this ties into the efficiency benefit as well, but basically the idea is that with automation, we can consistently re reproduce deployments or configurations. So if we need to deploy a complex infrastructure, uh, maybe made up of hundreds of services and configurations to make it work uh, in a different AWS region, you can typically just change a handful of variables in your code, and you can port that entire infrastructure to that new region. Now, there are many popular infrastructure as code tools that attempt to be cloud agnostic. This basically means that the infrastructure as code you create can often be reused for different cloud platforms, allowing easier portability of your infrastructure configurations between cloud providers. Now, there's a lot of caveats here in doing that that we won't get into, but know that the portability benefit of automation can extend beyond a single cloud platform as well. Now, a huge benefit of automation we need to mention is recoverability. With solid infrastructure as code practices in place at an organization, the automation benefits can allow you to quickly recover entire environments. 
scaled infrastructure changes can be quickly rolled back to a known good state. You can test infrastructure changes through automated pipelines and automated tests and quality assurance controls and dev and test environments you know, before promoting those changes to the production environments. There's also a component here around disaster recovery scenarios. Now, assuming a strict practice is in place with your infrastructure's code use, if you needed to quickly deploy your environment in another region or perhaps recover from some event that caused the deletion of many of your cloud resources, you could quickly restore your operational state through the automations available. Now, this automation benefit here also lends itself to less deployment and change risk. With less risk, your organization can make faster decisions knowing if things don't go to plan, you can quickly recover your infrastructure to a previous good state. Okay, to quickly recap, uh, we went over some of the pain involved with having to perform manual tasks related to your cloud infrastructure. You know, we learned doing things manually is very error prone and certainly doesn't scale. Uh, then we went through the benefits of automation in the cloud, uh, taking a look at the benefits of efficiency, uh, security, audibility, uh, elasticity, portability, and recoverability. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. This will be a fairly quick but important lesson here uh, where we explain the benefits of managed services and consider how these can also save you some money. First, what is a managed service? Well, this is where the cloud service provider offers some type of service for customers to consume and the service provider is responsible for the underlying management and configuration of the service. This should sound a bit familiar to our understanding of the cloud service models but managed services can end up blurring the lines between the infrastructure as a service and platform as a service models, and even software as a service, depending on what cloud product or service we're talking about. So let's mention why these managed services can be a benefit and how they can help reduce costs, and then get into some examples. I think walking through some actual managed services will help understand the concept best. Okay, so the cost savings identification aspect here largely comes down to the TCO story again. With managed services, a lot of the administrative headaches are gone, leaving your staff to focus on other areas of your business that bring more value. For example, AWS offers a managed database service called the Relational Database Service, or RDS. Now, you may be aware setting up a production-grade database can be quite complicated, especially when you start considering all the you know, snapshots and backup management, uh, high availability, uh, read replicas, perhaps even uh, multi-region designs. Now with AWS RDS, a lot of the database installation, uh, configuration, upgrades, uh, you know, the patching, replication, and backups are largely done for you by default. And you know, it's just a matter of a few clicks or command line entries to set up. Or of course, better yet, you're using your infrastructure as code tools of choice to provision the service. So now we no longer have the need for expensive database specialists to install, uh, configure, and maintain our databases. Again, managed services reduce our TCO as they can significantly reduce our operations overhead, which reduces our OPEX through you know, the salary savings of having these specialized database experts and reduce the overhead on our operations or DevOps teams. If you have existing database administrators, these people can now be trained with new skill sets instead of spending their time dedicated to maintaining databases. You know, they can work more closely with the data in the database, perhaps doing analytics or working towards data lake designs so your company can understand the data better and get more insights and business value from the data, you know, rather than doing this undifferentiated heavy lifting of maintaining the database. A similar example is the Amazon Elastic Kubernetes service known as EKS. Kubernetes is a popular container orchestration service that's well outside the scope of this exam, but a good example for this topic. Similar to our databases, installing, configuring, and maintaining a Kubernetes environment from scratch can be challenging. Specialized skill sets are needed, and there can be a tremendous amount of time spent on the proper design, configuration, and frequent patching and upgrades needed. As a managed service, EKS lets you create Kubernetes clusters quickly 
as well as automatically apply security patches and you know, ease the entire upgrade process for your organization and reducing your long-term TCO compared to doing all this stuff ourselves. Now, along with a variety of databases and container orchestration services like RDS, uh, DynamoDB, EKS, and the Amazon Elastic Container Service, or ECS, there are a large number of these managed service products available for you to choose from. If you leverage them where you can, you can realize significant savings with the total cost of ownership compared to building and maintaining these services on your own. So that's it for this lesson on understanding some of the benefits and cost-saving potential of managed services. See you in the next lesson. Welcome back once again. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at some of the cloud architecture and design principles. Now for the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, the scope of architectural design principles is to achieve just a high level understanding of some of these principles. We want to be able to explain why we need to design for failure in the cloud, uh, why we should decouple our monolith architectures into smaller components or individual functions, um, you know, why we should implement elasticity in the cloud, also, why do we need to think in parallel for our cloud architectures? Okay, so where do we find answers to these questions and where do all these design principles even come from to begin with? So imagine for a second that you wanted to deploy a, a new application to run on AWS or you're looking to migrate some large workloads from your data centers into AWS. Now, as you should be aware by now, there are many considerations to think about with these scenarios. So you could have teams literally spend months or you know, years training up on AWS and researching all the possible ways to set up the supporting architecture in AWS and enabling you know, the optimized way to safely migrate your infrastructure while keeping your business running. Now, wouldn't it be great if you could say, you know, find uh, you know, like a thousand companies similar to your business that have gone through the same thing? Now imagine all these companies share detailed guidance with you about all the best practices they had learned and more importantly, you learn from their mistakes so you don't encounter them yourself. This can potentially save you, know, you and your business from very costly mistakes uh, now and of course into the future as your company grows and you, know, you need to scale. This is largely what the AWS Well-Architected Framework is all about. AWS is basically taking the collective wisdom of you know, millions of customers through their feedback and the analysis done by their, you know, AWS solutions architects, uh, you know, the technical account managers, uh, AWS support teams, and even their professional services teams about what composes, you know, the most successful customer designs. All this information is, you know, collected and distilled down into a framework made up of guidelines and questions for you to consider. This framework can now be easily referenced so you can align to all this collective wisdom and avoid the mistakes of those that took the journey before you. The AWS Well-Architected Framework is made up of six pillars, each one focusing on an area that helps support the well-architected designs. Now I'm going to refer you to the next segment of the course where I will share you know, the links to the AWS Well-Architected Framework and design principles. Please take some time to read through the pages with you know, the mindset that you're hunting for answers around answering the following. What are some considerations for designing for failure? What are the benefits of decoupling your monolithic applications? What does think parallel mean? Now, remember for the scope of the exam, we don't need to drill too deep into the design principles and well-architected framework, but please ensure you have a good high-level understanding of the general theme of these design principles and frameworks. Now, if you have any questions while reviewing the links in the next section, please reach out to myself or fellow students in our Slack community for help. So with that, thanks for watching and see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. You made it to domain two. Uh, give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, we're going to keep the momentum going and dive straight into the security and compliance topics next. Cloud security at AWS is the highest priority. We've learned that as an AWS customer, you can use this advantage of cloud computing to help meet your security and compliance objectives. You know, you get to build your applications on a secure foundation, and you can take advantage of these economies of scale here as well 
you know, apply to the security areas. Now, as an AWS customer, you get all these economies of scale through specialized security skill sets, um, the experience, and the you know security financial budgets that far exceed what your organization would likely have. Now, through this domain, we'll be looking at understanding the shared responsibility model, uh, security and compliance concepts, uh, AWS access management capabilities, and just introduce you to a variety of resources uh, for support with your security needs. Now, this is an important domain, not only for the exam, but certainly for the real world. AWS takes security very seriously, as should you. So before diving into the domain topics, I'll leave you with this blog post describing how security is job zero at AWS. Now, this basically means that security is the highest priority over and above any other priority. So have a read through that article and really take note of the key takeaways at the bottom of the article. There's three simple common sense bullet points, but these are areas often overlooked and just not implemented well at a lot of organizations. So give that a read and it'll serve as a bit of a primer as we head into the next lessons uh, and I'll see you there. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to figure out the shared responsibility model. Okay, first let's do a quick refresher here. So in the traditional IT world, you may have your own data centers, uh, IT equipment, and tons of employees that operate the data center and all the IT equipment. Then all the uh, server operating systems and software was installed by folks in your organization. Your applications were developed and deployed by people within the company and all the systems were monitored and maintained by your staff. So who's responsible for security in that scenario? Of course, you are. All this operational security burden is yours, end to end. But when you're deploying stuff in AWS, now who's responsible for security? I'd like you to click on the correct choice here. Okay, is everyone done? Which one did you click on? Now, whatever your choice was, it was wrong. The buttons do nothing when you click on them, as this was perhaps a bit of a trick question. The right answer is somewhere in the middle, but the size of that middle area can vary depending on the situation and services you're using in AWS. So when thinking security with AWS, there's things AWS as the cloud provider takes care of, and there are things that you as the customer are responsible for securing. You should have an understanding now that the AWS platform is made up of hundreds of services and features. AWS provides these building blocks to you to use so you can deploy and operate your workloads in the cloud as you see fit, depending on your workload requirements. The security aspects of these building blocks can differ from block to block. So when you start looking at different AWS services and figure out what ones uh, you would need to run your workloads on AWS, in some cases, AWS would own 100% of the security burden. For other services, it may be a, a bit of a mix. Uh, the mix of security responsibilities between AWS and you as the customer can change depending on the individual building blocks or services you use. Now, in the end, both AWS and you as the customer are responsible for the overall security of what you run in AWS. AWS breaks this down easily into the concepts of security of the cloud and security in the cloud. For security of the cloud, this is the responsibility of AWS. AWS is responsible for securing their global infrastructure that runs on their services offered on their platform. All those global networking components of their infrastructure, uh, the servers and all the software that makes this stuff run, and of course the physical data centers that house all this equipment. Now, for security in the cloud, this is the customer's responsibility. The scope of your responsibility can vary depending on the service. We'll be looking at some AWS services in detail later in the course, so don't worry if you don't understand the service names and what they are quite yet. If you look at something like an EC2 instance, which is essentially a virtual server you create to run on AWS, uh, very similar to a physical server, you're responsible for uh, the operating system on that instance ensuring you're keeping up to date on security patches and operating system updates, all the application software you install on it and other software utilities. 
EWS doesn't have some magical mind reading capability. EWS doesn't know what you intend to use that instance for and what the application running on it may require for network communication and so forth. Therefore, you are responsible for ensuring the security groups, which act like a firewall for that instance, are configured correctly so that you can control the inbound and outbound traffic. For example, you launched an instance. Is it going to be a web server? Uh, is it going to be a database? Is it going to do some sort of data analytic functions on a variety of data sources? You know, maybe both internal and possibly external to AWS. Only you know that. All these different workloads you may deploy in the cloud likely have different requirements for the OS configuration, um, you know, the applications and utilities installed and you know, what inbound and outbound connectivity is required for it. This is all your responsibility to ensure the instance is properly secured. Now, if you use a service like RDS, which is a managed relational database service, there's a greater shift of responsibility to AWS, leaving you with less of that security heavy lifting burden. With RDS, AWS manages the operating system and database software patching. The virtual machine running the database instances is you know, abstracted away from you. The benefits of RDS go way beyond just this aspect. But for now, this is a good example of how your responsibility can change depending on what AWS services are being used. Now, to provide more context to the shared security model, the EC2 service is a good example to pick apart further. So for EC2, the service would be largely comprised of a mind-boggling amount of equipment, all living in a physical data centers as part of the AWS global infrastructure. This physical layer, the buildings, fences, security cameras, uh, security guards, uh, access control systems and all that stuff is AWS responsibility. Then there's all the networking equipment and the physical servers and storage systems enabling the capabilities of the service. All that physical equipment and the operating systems and software that run these is all AWS responsibility again. Now say we launched an EC2 instance, the virtual machine running within this service. This is pretty much the line in the sand where AWS responsibility ends. You now need to pick the operating system to run on the instance. You completely own this as a customer. AWS has no way to manage this instance for you. You own the encryption key and AWS has no access into this system. It is your responsibility to keep the OS updated and have your security patches applied yourself. In some cases, AWS may notify you if it knows you're running a specific operating system based on known Amazon machine images or AMIs that you know, new vulnerabilities have been discovered in that OS software, but AWS cannot manage this for you. You're responsible for the patching. To help understand this better, AWS breaks down the security of the cloud and security in the cloud concepts into a shared responsibility model. Now to explore the shared responsibility model further, we'll go straight to the source and look at the AWS documentation. So please click on the link and open this up in a new tab for you to review. Uh, but I did want to just touch on this graphic here. Now in this diagram, we can see the uh, blue and orange uh, where the customer responsibility and AWS responsibility is visually broken up for us. In this blue section, we have the customer responsibility for security in the cloud. And this orange section at the bottom, we have the AWS responsibility for security of the cloud. So please take some time to review this page thoroughly. Make sure you have a really good grasp on what you're responsible for as the customer for the security in the cloud and what AWS is responsible for for security of the cloud. Now, if you do have any questions on the shared responsibility model or any of the concepts, please reach out to myself or our Slack community for uh, any assistance. And that covers the lessons on the shared responsibility model. Um, so thanks for viewing and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, I'm going to go over where you can find information about compliance topics on AWS. Now, the chances are very high, no matter what type of project or activity you're working on related to running workloads in the cloud, you should be considering all the potential compliance standards at play. 
pretty much every industry has various standards you should be upholding and audited against to prove that you're meeting these standards. For example, in the United States, uh, healthcare-related applications will need to comply with HIPAA requirements. Or perhaps your organization is in the European Union, where you have customers within uh, EU territories, then you'll need to ensure you're in compliance with GDPR. Now, these are just some of the many, many compliance examples. Your organization will likely have internal policies layered on top of all these external compliance requirements. You also need to factor into your cloud workload designs and day-to-day -day operations as well. Okay, so at a high level, chances are you'll likely be involved with uh, some compliance topics in some form if you're you know, planning on running workloads in the cloud. Your responsibilities will differ greatly depending on your role in the organization and the role in running the workload on AWS. For this lesson, let's assume you get asked to help with some uh, variety of compliance objectives for the business and uh, perhaps some evidence gathering activities for upcoming compliance audits. Where do you even begin? Well, we know we have the shared responsibility model between AWS and us as customers of their cloud platform. That shared responsibility model extends into all these compliance areas as well. An easy example, uh, you know, there could be aspects of certain regulations that you know, relate to the physical security of data center buildings. Now, from what we know about the shared responsibility model, this is AWS's responsibility. But does the areas AWS is responsible for meet the regulatory requirements of your business? You know, you could have all the best world-class application design and policies in place to meet compliance requirements. But if you're, you know, running workloads on AWS and, you know, certain aspects of the AWS services or the platform itself is in compliant with the same, you know, regulations, uh, you likely won't be able to achieve your overall compliance requirements by running that workload in AWS. So as you can imagine, keeping compliance requirements in mind very early in the application design and architectural design process is critical. Uh, it can be very difficult, uh, disruptive, and costly you know, to realize AWS or you know, some other cloud provider won't be able to support your regulatory requirements after you've completed a massive uh, cloud migration project or uh, you know, end up running that new application in production that took years to develop. Now, maybe this is sounding a little bit scary, but I just want to get that point across to keep compliance requirements top of mind very early in your decisions about migrating to the cloud or designing some new application workload to you know, avoid that world of hurt down the road. Now, the good news, uh, very good news actually, is that running workloads on AWS can actually help your business achieve compliance objectives much more easier compared to what it would be involved with those uh, traditional on-premises IT environments. You know, a ton of AWS services meet a variety of uh, industry certifications, proving compliance across many of these industry compliance standards. Being able to build your business's IT workloads on top of these services reduces a lot of that heavy lifting for you. You know, you can often reach your compliance goals a lot faster and much more cost effectively when running your IT workloads in AWS. All right, so back to that question of where do I find out information about compliance on AWS that can help me with these early compliance design decisions or help gather evidence uh, for compliance for upcoming audits. We'll start off by taking a look at the AWS compliance page and then branch out to a few other resources before we take a look at the AWS artifact and AWS audit manager tools. So let's dive in. All right, so this is the AWS compliance page. This is probably one of the best spots as kind of a central resource to uh, navigate to other areas of uh, AWS compliance topics. Now, I suggest opening this link uh, just so you have it ready, and then you can navigate through this page, uh, explore some of the other areas uh, after the lesson here. But I just wanted to point your attention to a few uh, important areas. Now, as we start scrolling down the page, uh, just draw your attention to the wording here as well, where AWS is stating you can inherit the most comprehensive compliance controls with AWS. Again, this is the idea that you can build on top of their services and take advantage of their uh, compliance certifications that many of their services offer. Now, I also recommend uh, opening up this white paper in a new tab here, uh, just so you have it handy. But um, you, know, you can go through this and explore the different areas. Again, talking about the shared responsibility model, um, the AWS Risk and Compliance Program, then information on evaluating and uh, integrating the AWS controls, then also this link here on the Customer Cloud Compliance Governance. 
Now note this top line here stating that AWS customers are responsible for maintaining adequate governance over their entire IT control environment, regardless of how or where IT is deployed. Now I'm calling this out again here just to hammer home the point that, you know, just because you're running your workloads on AWS, it doesn't mean your compliance responsibilities end there. Now at the bottom of this section in the white paper, AWS describes an approach you can take to help get a better understanding of your uh, compliance and governance uh, environment. So before we jump back to the cloud compliance page, take a moment to uh, pause the video here and just review these items. Okay, so back to the cloud compliance page. Next, we'll jump in and take a look at the compliance programs webpage. Now this compliance programs page is super handy. It breaks down all the IT standards AWS complies with into different categories and even the geographical locations they apply to. Now again, pause the video here and you know, take a look through some of these. Uh, you may recognize a few of them from uh, your organization. Now also bring your attention here to the GDPR Center as GDPR applies to a lot of different businesses around the world. This is another page worth taking a moment or two to read through just to get a high level idea of the controls in place and how AWS handles that. And once you're done having a quick skim through here, let's jump back to the cloud compliance page. Now, as we go down further, uh, we also see the uh, shared responsibility model that we should know and love at this point. And then down further, we see a few areas where uh, AWS helps us meet our compliance goals. Now, two important areas I want to draw your attention to here is the AWS Audit Manager and Amazon Artifact. So as we wrap up the lesson here, I want you to take some time to watch this AWS Audit Manager video. And uh, you can also dig around into the documentation. I want you to understand what this service does and approach it like you're going to teach a colleague about this service. You know, watch the video, uh, find some documentation, make some notes, and you know, assemble it into your own words and try to form it in a way that you could explain what AWS Auto Manager is to a 10 year old. And when you're done with that, do the same for the Amazon Artifact Portal. My goal here is to direct you to the official AWS resources to find this information out for yourself. You'll learn a lot more by exploring these services yourself and taking that, you know, hands on approach to an active learning rather than me show you a few bullet points on these services. Being able to recognize these services and where to find information will be super helpful in the real world. Now, another great resource for compliance information on AWS is their blogs. You can filter these down to the compliance category to just hone in on all the new updates. Now, I found what shows up here in the compliance category might be a little too narrow. Uh, I think it just depends on the author and how the article is tagged. Um, but you can also kind of go to the security, identity, and compliance category. Um, most articles have like the link here, or you can also go to this category drop down, and uh, there's the security, identity, and compliance tab. This broadens it out to uh, all kinds of security blog articles as well as compliance. But uh, sometimes I find the compliance category alone uh, may not uh, show some of the other compliance articles. So this wraps up the resources I wanted to draw your attention to, to find information on uh, compliance on AWS. At the end of the lesson here, take a few minutes to go through some of the blog articles and don't forget to review the AWS Audit Manager service and the Amazon Artifact Portal. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, welcome back. This will be a quick lesson on understanding some of the encryption options available on AWS. Now, being this is a foundational course, we should probably start with the question, uh, what is encryption and why should we care about it in the cloud? Now, the topic of encryption and cryptography is quite vast to say the least. Uh, but for the scope of this exam and to get a foundational understanding in the context of the cloud aspects, we'll say that encryption is simply the encoding of data so that you know, only the intended people can access it. Now, in a simple example, uh, say I want to save some pictures of my dog to uh, a portable hard drive. Then later I want to, uh, you know, privately share that photo with a friend over the internet. Now let's pretend the photos of my dog are uh, top secret. 
Uh, here, my dog, Norman, is an uh, undercover agent getting ready for an uh, Arctic assignment, or perhaps uh, just getting ready for a walk in uh, Canadian winter. So what can I do to ensure only myself or um, you know, other authorized parties get access to the digital data that my image files are made up of? Well, first, in this example, we have two intentions for this data. Uh, I want to store the picture securely, uh, but also send that data to someone else. This brings us to two main categories of encryption. Encryption at rest, meaning the data is encrypted on some form of storage media, and encryption in transit, uh, meaning the data is encrypted as it's sent to some other destination over uh, a network. Now, let's get a little more uh, real world here and think about you know, running uh, applications in the cloud. Perhaps you have a variety of images that make up uh, your website, uh, you know, a database containing all kinds of customer and business data, and a variety of virtual machine instances that need to communicate with each other and uh, on the internet to serve the requests uh, from your customers and uh, for your business. Okay, so what encryption options do we have as customers of AWS? First, like most answers to cloud-related questions, uh, it depends. Again, going back to the shared responsibility model, AWS typically offers many options for their services, uh, encryption being one of them. However, it is up to us as customers to understand our workloads and the security and compliance requirements of that data. It is up to us as customers to choose the proper designs and encryption options to keep our data secure. Now, without getting too far down the rabbit hole of the variety of service AWS offers, I'm going to generalize by saying the vast majority of AWS services offer encryption options for the storage and transmission of our data. Now, it's up to us as customers to review the documentation around the specific services we will use. You know, we need to understand if encryption is enabled by default for the service, or if it's a setting we need to enable. Uh, does it you know, apply to data at rest, uh, in transit, uh, or both? Or is simply encryption an option at all? So let's talk about encryption at rest first. Again, you'll need to review the specifics around each service. But in general terms, when storing data in AWS in a storage service or uh, a database, you typically have two encryption options, uh, client-side encryption and server-side encryption. Now, at a high level, uh, client-side encryption is where our application would encrypt the data before sending it into the AWS service the information would be stored on. Therefore, before it even gets into the AWS storage media, the data is encrypted. Now, since it is our application that is responsible for the encryption, and of course, the decryption to access that data again, we as customers are responsible for the entire end-to-end -end encryption flow and you know, need to ensure our application is encrypting the data properly and we have the proper uh, encryption key management practices in place. Now, the other option is server-side encryption. Here, our application sends the data to the AWS service and it may be received in a unencrypted format. However, before the final step of storing that data on the storage media, the server performs the encryption and encodes the data before it's saved to the storage media. In this scenario, the burden of having our application do the data encryption is removed, leaving the AWS storage or database service to do the encryption work. Going with the server-side encryption path can help use our minds a bit that the data sent to the storage service or database is encrypted and not have to worry about perhaps uh, future application development work where you know, the encryption step may get missed for whatever reason and result in data being stored in a unencrypted format. Okay, so we have that high level understanding of how to get our data encrypted when it's sitting in some storage media in the cloud. But why is this especially important in a public cloud? Being in a public cloud, we don't have access to the data centers, uh, servers, and physical storage media like we would in traditional IT environments. While cloud providers go through great lengths to ensure the protection of these physical data centers and uh, their internal compute and storage components, you know, our potentially sensitive data could be sitting on a disk somewhere that we don't have access to. Now, while an extremely unlikely event, we want to protect against any unauthorized access to this data. If for whatever reason the physical storage media was taken from a cloud provider's data center, or perhaps defective disks were removed, uh, from service but not destroyed effectively, we want to ensure that our data is encrypted so any unauthorized party cannot access it. We should also recall from our previous lesson and review of the compliance documentation, the variety of processes and compliance standards at place for the AWS data centers. We should also recall from our previous lesson and review of the compliance documentation, 
the variety of processes and compliance standards at place for the AWS data centers. Since we're discussing the potential risks of data at rest in a public cloud, uh, you know, to set our minds at ease and as a quick review, pause here and take a moment to review the physical data layer protections in place at AWS. Okay, so let's jump into encryption and transit. Now, this is about encrypting your data we send over a network to some other destination. Now, the internet is a great example. Uh, if I want to send that super top secret picture of my dog to someone over the internet, I don't want anyone to be able to intercept that network communication and essentially read that data and gain access to my confidential image. Now, think when you do any online shopping or online banking activities, you want to ensure the information like credit cards and login credentials are not sent in a visible uh, plain text format that anyone could potentially gain access to. Now, in the cloud, the similar examples apply here as well. You know, say we're doing some uh, cloud migration activity and we want to send our uh, on-premises data into uh, an AWS storage service like S3 uh, through the internet. This data is likely to be highly confidential and we don't want anyone to be able to read it as it's flowing over uh, public networks through the internet on its path to the AWS service. You know, or perhaps even within our AWS account and uh, virtual private cloud uh, VPC networks, you know, we may have a variety of workloads running in it. Uh, the compute instances running in the VPC may be owned and operated by different teams or organizational units within our company, and the data being on some of the systems may be sensitive information and you know, shouldn't be accessible to other systems on the same network. This is all where the idea of encryption and transit comes into play. Basically, the client side sending the data performs a form of encryption of the data before it's sent over the network to its destination. The sender and receiver of the data would have some form of uh, encryption keys used to both encrypt and decrypt the information. So without that private key, anyone on the network wouldn't be able to see the sensitive data in uh, you know, a plain text format and gain access to our sensitive information. Now, similar to data at rest in AWS, with data in transit, we typically have a number of options available to us to send data to the AWS services. There are often options to enable encryption for the communication flows between different AWS services that may be involved in a number of uh, data processing activities we set up for application or analytic functions of our business. So the key takeaways here are understanding the encryption at rest and encryption and transit topics. Then also knowing we can do the encryption ourselves through the application side with uh, client-side encryption techniques, or have that encryption handled on the destination server side before the data is stored at rest. Then we also have a number of options across the AWS services for securely transmitting our data over the network. Now for an additional review of these encryption concepts on AWS, please check out the links to the AWS security pillar and logical separation on AWS in the following lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll understand the purpose and some of the best practices around the AWS account root user. Understanding what this root user is for and how to protect it is an important topic to understand for the exam and of course for the real world. So what is this AWS root user? Well, when you create a brand new AWS account, uh, the root user is the user identity you create when setting up the new account. This root user provides full account privileges to get started with the new account. You know, and this makes sense, right? Like you just created a new AWS account with uh, one user to access it with. Uh, it better allow you to do everything you need in order to set up the account. Uh, and of course, it does exactly that. The root user will provide access to everything from the uh, account billing details, uh, the ability to do any administrative tasks, and also to manage the identity and access management or IAM configuration of the account. This root user has very powerful permissions. Uh, it can basically do anything uh, with the account itself and anything within it. You, know, you can uh, create, uh, modify, delete uh, all the resources in the account, uh, create or modify users that access the account through the identity and access management configuration, uh, modify the billing details and uh, access financial data like invoices and usage details, uh, even fully close the AWS account. Now, while it's beyond the uh, scope of this lesson, I wanted to quickly mention uh, 
there are ways to restrict even what the user can do in the account through uh, AWS organizations and service control policies. Uh, just something to keep in mind. Okay, so if you tend to use this account for a production environment or really any AWS account uh, you or your company may use, having a root user that has the ability to do anything uh, inside and with the account itself is an obvious security concern. So let's go over some of the best practices to help keep this root user secure. An important best practice is that when you create your AWS account and set up those root user credentials, that you know, ensure you have a very long and complex password set for this user. This password should not be the same you use with any other uh, user credentials you may have. Now, I hope you're doing this for all your user passwords, but uh, this is especially critical for your AWS uh, root user credentials. If you're creating a new AWS account for your company, I'd also suggest using some type of alias or distribution list uh, email address where multiple people within the company uh, are on that email list. You want to ensure your company uh, owns that email address and will have access to it. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where uh, an important AWS account is tied to um, you know, an individual's email address uh, or worse, some type of uh, personal email address uh, external to your organization. You don't want to be in a situation where you have to figure out uh, what happens when that person leaves the company. This also ensures that if there's a forgotten password uh, reset attempt or some other account communications coming from AWS, that there are multiple people that would have visibility of this activity. So continuing on with best practices, uh, now this is another must have in my opinion. Uh, you wanna quickly enable multi-factor authentication for the root user account. If you're not quite clear on uh, what this is yet, we'll be taking a look at multi-factor authentication or uh, MFA in an upcoming lesson. Just be sure you consider the risk and be very purposeful about what you do with the root user credentials and MFA device. Often folks use a secure uh, password manager tool to store the credentials in. Then perhaps you may want to store this MFA device in a physical safe in the office. Then consider who has access to the username, password, and MFA device. Is it okay in your organization that a single person or multiple people have access to both the full root user login credentials and MFA device. And like most questions in the cloud, uh, the answer to that is it depends. Now, if we're talking about a production account where your multi-million dollar business runs uh, the majority of its IT infrastructure in, you likely want to carefully consider the risks here. Anyone with access to both the full credentials and MFA device has the potential to accidentally or intentionally wipe out your AWS resources and even close the AWS account completely. So perhaps as some uh, sanity checks, you may want to split the password between uh, two or more people. So there are at least additional folks that would need to be involved uh, anytime root user access is needed. Or maybe you keep the MFA device in a safe. The folks that have the uh, safe combination to get into the safe would not have access to the root user password and vice versa. Uh, the people that have the root user credentials uh, wouldn't have access to the safe combination. This can help ensure that uh, there are some procedures in place to ensure uh, the root user access requests are in fact necessary and authorized. Either way, put some thought into how you manage your root user accounts and keep those credentials safe. Continuing on with the best practices. Uh, so our root user is created with that uh, complex password and we have MFA configured. Next, you'll want to create an IAM user with the AWS account uh, with full administrator privileges. This identity and access management or IAM service will be explored in an upcoming lesson as well if you're unsure of what we're uh, talking about here quite yet. Uh, just take some notes on this stuff at this point and trust it'll make sense over the next few lessons. So with that IAM administrator account created, uh, you'll use that to create further IAM users, uh, groups, roles, and policy configurations for your organization, and then start using those IAM users for your day-to-day -day activities in the account. You should not use the root user for everyday tasks. Other than a few uh, account billing uh, and service management operations, the root user is not required. Now, taking the approach of uh, least privilege access, if you don't need the scope of privileges the root user provides, uh, don't use it. Especially don't hand out the root user credentials to others in the organization to perform uh, regular administration tasks. Now, as a quick reference, uh, pause here and take a look at the changes that actually require the root user to accomplish. All right, so given that we have an idea now of what tasks the uh, root user is required for, 
Um, basically, those account level changes and some emergency restorals of uh, IM uh, administrator accounts. Do you think you'd ever need to perform these types of changes through a computer terminal or have some type of application that would make API calls to perform those functions as the root user? I wouldn't think so. Typically, you'd be logging into the AWS console, uh, clicking around to make just the bare minimum changes that you need to do as the root user, and that's it. So with what you know now about the AWS account root user, do you think it's uh, necessary or smart to create programmatic API access key credentials for this root user? API keys that would be used for uh, the command line or application level integrations with your AWS account. Does the root user actually need this? Very likely not. You don't want to manage another type of credential for the root user. Why open up even more access capabilities for the root user that you've gone through uh, great lengths to secure, uh, especially when you're unlikely to ever even use the API access or uh, you, know, you shouldn't be anyways. Just think really, really hard about why you need API access keys for the root user before you create them. If you already have uh, API keys enabled for your root user account, uh, it'd be worth a discussion at your organization to ensure there's a clear understanding of the uh, intent of this and uh, you know that the risks are understood. Uh, chances are the API access keys could be disabled. Okay, so a quick recap. Uh, we know the root user is the initial user created when creating our AWS account. And it essentially owns the account itself and has full permissions to everything that would run inside it. We want to ensure that we're intentional with the email address we use for the root user, especially if you're setting up a new account in your company. Make sure the right person or people have the visibility to uh, the activities going on in this account. Next, we need to create a unique, uh, long, complex password and ensure that password is stored securely and that only the proper person or people have access. Next, we need the MFA device set up with the account. Similar to the password, we want to ensure that access to the MFA device is also properly managed. Also, the chances are you don't need API access keys for this account. Uh, don't enable them unless you're very clear about the reason why. And last, don't use the root account for your day-to-day -day operations. There are only a handful of things the uh, root user is absolutely necessary to accomplish with the account. You want to use the IAM users uh, you'll set up for the regular operations of the account instead. And with that, uh, it wraps up the overview of the AWS account root user. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. Multi-factor authentication. Let's get into it. So what is this multi-factor authentication stuff? And uh, let's just call it MFA from now on. And while we're at it, let's uh, rewind further and understand what the heck uh, a factor even means. In our context here, a factor is just a uh, type of authentication used to confirm your identity. So with MFA, it's the idea that we need to provide multiple types of authentication in order to authenticate yourself and you know prove that you're you. Its purpose is to add another layer of security to the authentication process since it requires the user to provide uh, another form of authentication other than just uh, something you know, uh, like your uh, username and password. So we typically have a username and password to log into various things. This is an authentication type we're uh, very familiar with, right? Uh, so we can say a password is one type of factor. It's a factor that we know. It's uh, etched in our minds. Uh, well, likely more these days, it's uh, you know etched into our password manager tool. Uh, but let's not get sidetracked here. Our, our passwords are etched in our mind. Your password should be something you and you alone know so that it helps uh, uniquely identify you. Now, another common authentication factor can come in the form of something physical. Uh, things like fingerprints, uh, retinal scans, and uh, using hardware devices are all examples of other factors of authentication that can help uniquely identify you. So how does this MFA stuff actually help us? Well, let's say our uh, password is compromised somehow. So someone other than you now has access to your uh, login credentials. If you have MFA configured uh, in addition to that password, You'd also need to provide that other factor as part of the authentication process to successfully log in. So even if someone uh, has your password, 
If they don't have your MFA token or phone or uh, stolen your finger or eyeball, uh, the login attempt would fail. Basically, with MFA, you need more than just the password alone to successfully authenticate. You'll need something you know and something you have. Now, when we're looking at MFA uh, with our AWS account users, AWS supports three MFA types. Uh, there's hardware MFA devices, uh, UTF uh, security keys, and virtual MFA devices. A hardware MFA device is usually a small hardware token. Uh, it's usually something like a key fob that generates a six-digit code every uh, minute or so. When you log into AWS, you're prompted for this code along with your password. So you need to know that uh, account password and also be in possession of this physical MFA device. Again, something you know and something you have. Now, a UTF security key is another hardware-based MFA device that uh, you connect to your computer's USB port. With this UTF key, uh, when you attempt to log in with your username and password uh, with AWS, you'll need to tap on this uh, UTF device that's plugged into your computer to complete the authentication process. There is no code for you to enter with uh, that type of device. And then last, there's the virtual MFA device. Now, this uh, method is software-based instead of a physical hardware token. You typically have an app on your phone that functions like a hardware MFA device. You know, this app generates the six-digit code you'll need as part of the authentication mechanism. So to log in with AWS here, you, of course, need to know the uh, user password, but also uh, be in possession of your phone and then be able to, uh, you know, log into your phone so you can access your apps then open the virtual MFA app and get the MFA code to enter in. Again, the same theme here of having the password that you know and something physical you have. Google Authenticator and Authy are uh, just some examples of these virtual MFA applications you can use here. With these virtual MFA devices, uh, when you set up your AWS user, you're usually given a, a QR code on the AWS side to scan with the virtual MFA app. Uh, which you know then syncs this app to your account to start generating the uh, MFA token codes. You'll start using as the second factor for your authentication going forward. Using virtual MFA devices are convenient, as uh, many folks have mobile devices with them all the time these days. Now, in contrast, uh, an important thing to remember is that if you pick one of the hardware MFA options, uh, these do not come from AWS. AWS doesn't send you these devices uh, you know, for your account or uh, you can't order them through AWS. Uh, you need to purchase these through some vendor that sells these uh, hardware tokens and then sync them with your account. Now, if the plan is to have uh, hardware MFA devices, but you don't have any uh, MFA configured for your AWS user uh, accounts today, uh, it may be worth considering to enable the virtual MFA at least uh, temporarily until the hardware tokens are ordered and shipped by the vendor. So you at least have some form of MFA protection uh, for your user accounts until then. Now, which one of these MFA options that AWS supports uh, should you pick? Well, that really depends on your organization's practices, uh, security policies, and compliance requirements. There are a ton of hardware MFA device types out there. Uh, take some time to ensure you're picking the right option for uh, you or your business. Regardless of the MFA type, uh, any MFA is better than nothing. I urge you to ensure that MFA is enabled for your AWS root users and your IAM or SSO users. You know, that extra five second inconvenience of logging in with MFA is well worth the security benefits. Now, before I wrap this up, I wanted to mention uh, modern password manager tools. Many of these offer virtual MFA capabilities uh, built into the application. Now, I personally don't like using the MFA capabilities of these password manager apps. Why, you ask? Well, let's think about the end goal here with MFA. You know, we're trying to secure our AWS account, uh, so it's protected by two separate authentication factors. So if one gets compromised somehow, the other factor would still be needed to log in and our account should be safe. But now let's say we use a password manager tool uh, where we store our super secure, complex passwords in it. Uh, perfect, no problems. But then we also use that same app uh, for our virtual MFA device that generates our MFA code. So now in a single application, we have both our login credentials, 
as well as our MFA codes accessible in the same place on the same device. To me, this breaks the goal of MFA. If you have this password manager as an app on your phone, and perhaps the password manager is a you know, browser plugin app that uh, you know, are synced with each other, uh, changes are your password manager has fairly long timeouts for your uh, master password uh, that gets used for your password vault, uh, you know, where you store all these credentials in and your MFA codes. What happens if you or an employee in your organization leaves your phone unlocked somewhere or you leave that uh, laptop unlocked while you walk away for a moment? But you know, think of this, you now have your login credentials and your MFA token codes available in the same convenient place for uh, some author unauthorized person to you know, easily log into your AWS account with both factors for your MFA. It's no longer something you know and something physical you have. Both factors are now stored together conveniently in the same application and accessible from the same device like your uh, phone or laptop. Now I get the convenience of doing this, but please really think about the risks and if that convenience is worth the risk of having all your uh, authentication factors together conveniently in one single place. Now that wraps up our lesson here on MFA with AWS. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the identity and access management service of AWS, uh, also known as IAM. Um, there's a lot of concepts we'll be going over here, uh, so it's probably best to represent this sort of visually. Uh, so let's dive in. So let's take a look at AWS identity and access management from the perspective of having an AWS account and you know trying to do something within it. For our simple example, uh, we'll say, you know, we just want to store an image into the AWS S3 storage service. Our goal is to, you know, save this uh, JPEG image file as an object in uh, S3. But how do we actually interact with the AWS account and its services? I've mentioned before in other lessons that, uh, you know, everything you do within the AWS account is done uh, through the application programming interface or API. Okay, great, but how do we use these AWS APIs? Now for the scope of this course and the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam, you'll likely be using the uh, AWS console the most. The you know, AWS Management Console is a web-based user interface to access your AWS account information and you know, start using the hundreds of services the AWS Cloud Platform offers. If you're just starting out, the AWS Management Console is a great way to you know, begin learning how to interact with all these services and start getting things configured and you know, deploying those initial workloads into your account. Now, as you progress in your learning journey and you know, need to accomplish more complex and larger scale tasks in the account, you'll likely end up using the AWS command line interface for a lot of your tasks and also have your like, applications interact with the AWS API directly and uh, you know, help automate some of these uh, AWS service configurations. So these are the three ways to interact with the AWS APIs. Um, again, the AWS Management Console, the AWS Command Line Interface, or CLI, and uh, of course, using the AWS APIs directly. So getting back to our example of wanting to uh, store our picture file into the S3 service, uh, how does this actually work? Well, we'll start with the concept of principles. Um, you know, a principal can be an actual uh, person, um, an assumed role, or uh, you know, a federated user that is authenticated through uh, something like Facebook, for example, or uh, you know, even an application. So basically, a principal is the uh, person or thing that is intending to make a request to AWS to perform some type of uh, action within the AWS account. Now, for our uh, simplified example here, uh, you know, we're just a, a person looking to upload our picture. So now as this uh, principal here, um, you know, a uh, person, uh, we need to authenticate ourselves with the AWS IAM service. So what is this IAM service? The AWS IAM service provides the infrastructure necessary to you know, control authentication and authorization for your AWS account. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the IAM service is considered a, a global service, uh, meaning that it exists in your AWS account and it's not you know, region specific. Your IAM configurations are set up at the account level, and it doesn't matter if you're using services in different regions. So for example, you don't need to set up um, IAM users in each AWS region uh, individually. 
All right. So we know now that, uh, you know, as a principal, uh, we need to authenticate with AWS in order to send our request to upload that image. So our principal identity uh, has the potential now to use the uh, root user or the IAM entities uh, being a, a user or a role to authenticate with the AWS account. Now, we already learned about the AWS root user in a previous lesson. Um, you know, again, just to recap, this root user has full access to the account. There's exceptions to this when we start looking at AWS organizations and using uh, service control policies. But for our scope here, uh, just remember that the root user has full access to everything in the account. And this is why it's very important to make sure we keep that root user properly secured. Now, we know we're not supposed to use the root user for our day-to-day uh, -day activities within the account. We're supposed to use the IAM users instead. So let's do that. Now, let's say we already created a IAM user uh, called Mike. This Mike IAM user would have, uh, you know, potentially a username or password or um, API access keys or uh, both of those. For example, we'd just be uh, using the AWS management console here. So uh, Mike would log in with just the username and password, and that authenticates us with the AWS account through the IAM service. So at this stage, our person principal identity has authenticated with AWS as a IAM user called Mike. And now we're ready to make our image upload request through the management console we're logged into. So at a high level, Mike would just access the uh, S3 service through the management console and basically upload an image into S3. Now behind the scenes, the management console takes our inputs from that uh, web user interface and generates all those API calls to perform that image upload request. Again, everything in the AWS account is done through the API. The management console just abstracts that away a bit, it makes creating these API requests uh, easy for you by providing that visual interface to use instead. Um, but just know that behind the scenes, there's a series of API requests taking place to perform all the actions you're doing through the console. All right, so now that we're um, authenticated here as the IAM user Mike, uh, should we be allowed to do anything we want within the account? Probably not. To restrict what users can do within the AWS account, uh, IAM uses policies that uh, help us define what actions can be performed and on what resources. These policies can then get associated to an IAM identity like a IAM user uh, group or role. An IAM identity is something that our IAM permission policies can get associated with. In contrast, an IAM entity is what we can use to authenticate to AWS IAM with. And note here that uh, groups are not included as a IAM entity. Now, say my job is to upload these images to S3, uh, but now we've hired 100 other people to help do the same activity. It'd be quite tedious to apply all these IAM permission policies to each of these users individually and then have to you know, maintain them all. So to make something like this a lot easier, uh, IAM has three identity types we can use. An IAM user, which uh, you know, we already know about, uh, IAM groups and IAM roles. An IAM group is you know, ideal when you have multiple users that need to perform the same activities with your uh, AWS account. The IAM permission policy gets applied at the group level. So any individual IAM users that belong to that group uh, inherit those permissions. And while we're at it, uh, let's talk about this role thing. So an IAM role is another type of IAM identity that you can define permissions for through AWS policies. I think of roles as a special type of IAM user. Um, you know, since they're an IAM identity uh, that you can associate IAM permission policies to and define what that identity is able to do within your account. The key difference with a role though is, you know, it's not uniquely associated to one person. The role is intended to be uh, assumable by other IAM entities. A role is basically a set of IAM permissions that can be temporarily borrowed by an IAM user. Now, unlike a regular IAM user, roles do not have the usual long-term password or access key permissions associated with them. When you assume the role, the IAM service provides temporary security credentials to your role session. I like to think of assuming a role as you're you know, just borrowing a hat that gives you uh, superpowers while you're wearing it. Roles are great when you want to provide access to users, uh, applications, or services that don't normally have access to your AWS resources. Like for our example, uh, let's say my Mike IAM user has policy permissions associated with it that just let me upload images to the AWS S3 service. You know, that's all I need for my day-to-day -day job functions. 
but occasionally an image may get uploaded an error, and I'll need to delete that object out of S3. My typical permissions would not let me do this. We also don't want to open up Mike's uh, permission policy to allow object deletion long term. So, you know, we're just looking for a temporary way to elevate Mike's user permissions to perform the necessary delete action of the image. So with a role, you know, assuming I have the permissions to uh, assume or, you know, borrow this role in the first place, my mic user can assume this role. And this gives me the temporary security credentials associated with it. This will then allow this mic user to uh, delete the object from S3. The temporary security credentials would eventually expire and my mic user is then back to their main uh, IAM user permissions that don't allow for the deletion of objects in S3. Now, roles can also be assumed by a variety of AWS resources to perform uh, functions within the AWS account. Let's say we have an application running on a EC2 compute instance that needs to upload images to S3 as well. This application would need some way to authenticate to the AWS account to get the necessary permissions to perform that upload action. So we know we have the option of uh, you know username and password credentials. You know those are intended more for human users. Then we have the API access keys for the uh, programmatic access to AWS APIs, which would be ideal for our applications to use to perform these image uploads. But we want to avoid saving uh, you know these types of credentials into the application configuration running on the instance. You know the idea of hard coding security credentials into uh, your application can be a huge security risk. We won't get into all the specifics here, but we certainly want to avoid having our AWS access keys saved into our application code or um, on our EC2 server instance configuration files. So how do we provide access to the AWS S3 service to the EC2 compute instance running our application? Um, you know, this is the instance running our application so that it can upload images to S3. We can actually assign an instance profile to the EC2 resource that uh, defines a IAM role the instance can use. So whatever permission policy is associated to that role, the entire EC2 instance and uh, whatever applications would run on it would be able to perform those actions with the AWS account. And this is all accomplished without having to provide any you know, passwords or access keys to the EC2 instance or application code itself. Now I'm trying to keep the scope of things here aligned to the Certified Cloud Practitioner exam uh, course focus. So I'm not getting into all the mechanics, uh, you know, the security and design considerations around uh, roles and IAM in general. But you know, this should give you an understanding of what a role is and a few uh, use cases for them. I'll also be providing some links in the course section uh, following this video uh, for those of you that want to explore these areas a bit more. So recapping here, uh, where we're at in our image upload example. Uh, we have our principal identity person that has authenticated with uh, the AWS account using their username and password to access the AWS management console. We also know about uh, users, groups, and roles, and that these three identity types can have uh, IAM permission policies apply to them. So for our example here, we'll say that Mike's IAM user had a permission policy directly associated to it that allows for you know just those uploads of images to S3. So this mic user would now go through the AWS Management Console, uh, navigate to the S3 service, and upload that image to an S3 bucket. Oh, but Mike uploaded the wrong image here. So Mike actually needs to go and delete this image out of the S3 bucket. But we don't actually have the correct permissions to perform that delete action for our images within that S3 service. So here, if we had a IAM role named, um, you know, maybe Image Cleanup that we associate an IAM permission policy to, you know, which allows for the actions needed to delete that image from the S3 service, we could have that IAM user uh, Mike assume this role uh, and therefore get the temporary abilities to fix the mistake. So I hope this lesson helps understand the function of the IAM service and some of the uh, terminology around it, as well as kind of understanding the basic authentication flow of uh, principal identities to the AWS account and the you know, general idea of when users, groups, and roles can be used. Our upcoming courses focusing more on the associate and professional level exam scopes will dive much more deeper into the IAM areas, so keep an eye out for those. But also check out for the links uh, following this lesson uh, for more resources to help understand the IAM service. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, welcome back uh, once again. 
the next few lessons here will be fairly short as we're just addressing the section in the exam blueprint about being able to identify resources for security support. Now for the scope of the exam uh, and this course, we'll just want to get that high level understanding of what these resources are and where to find more information about them. Over the next few videos, you'll have a bit of reading to go through here, but you know the time spent will help build that foundation for your uh, knowledge of AWS. And especially as you progress to the upcoming lessons uh, of this course and you know, of course, onto the uh, you know associate and professional exams in the future. Now, first up, we have the native AWS uh, network security services. These are summarized nicely for us on this uh, network application protection page. Please take some time to read over the page and you know get an understanding of the names of some of these uh, security resources. We'll be covering some of these uh, a bit later in the course, but it certainly wouldn't hurt if you wanted to uh, dive into each of them briefly and you know get that initial understanding on your own. So have fun uh, reading through this and, uh, you know, taking some notes and, uh, you know, reach out to the uh, Slack community here if you uh, need any help. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. As we continue to learn to identify AWS security resources, in this video, we'll be adding in the AWS Marketplace in our uh, toolbox of resources we can use. The AWS Marketplace has tons of uh, vendors for all types of solutions and you know, they're purpose-built to run on the AWS platform. For this lesson though, we'll uh, hone in on some of the security vendors in this space. Now again, for our scope here, we just need to know about the AWS Marketplace and how its partner ecosystem can help address some of the potential security aspects for us. Now open up this page here to the AWS Marketplace and uh, we'll explore this together. Now again, there's hundreds and hundreds of vendors and solutions on the AWS Marketplace. Um, and we can use these categories to uh, you know, help filter out some of the noise and you know, quickly get to the solutions we're uh, interested in. Now for the scope of the lesson here, we're talking about uh, network security. So let's try to hone in on some options we have in this space. So from this category list here, we can uh, go into something like uh, security and start reviewing uh, some of the vendors and options available to us. But this is giving us uh, you know, thousands of results across the entire security domain. And we wanted to focus in on uh, network security. So we could go back up to the categories here and perhaps pick uh, network infrastructure. And this might be getting us a little bit uh, closer to what we're after. Um, here you can see some, uh, you know, next gen firewall options. Um, but let's take another look. If you need to find uh, marketplace options that perhaps span uh, different categories here, uh, what we may want to do is actually use the search bar to uh, find what we're after. So we'll just type in network security here and uh, see what results we get. So now we should be getting results here that uh, hone in on the network security aspect. Again, we see some uh, next-gen firewall options here. Um, of course, Aviatrix, uh, you know, great vendor if you're uh, looking for sort of uh, network and network security solutions, uh, especially in uh, you know multi-cloud options. Certainly a, a great vendor to uh, to check out. Um, and we have lots of other options here. Again, a variety of firewalls. So these are all kinds of options that exist for us on the AWS marketplace, uh, particularly around network security and all kinds of different uh, categories. Now I take a few minutes here to explore some of these vendors and just get familiar with searching around the AWS marketplace. And that's it for this quick lesson. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. This will be another short lesson here as we talk about the AWS Trusted Advisor. Now we've already uh, learned about the AWS Well-Architected Framework and the design principles of those pillars. Now imagine you could check your workloads in AWS against these best practices. Well, it's possible, and this is where the Trusted Advisor comes into the picture. Trusted Advisor is the tool AWS provides through the management console where it can perform uh, checks across your AWS environment and make recommendations for uh, you know, saving money, uh, improving system performance, or closing security gaps. Now, the recommendations are effectively the advice coming from a trusted advisor 
is broken down into the following categories. Cost optimization, which are the recommendations that can potentially save you money by highlighting unused resources and opportunities to reduce your cloud bill. Performance, advice around where you may be able to improve the speed and responsiveness of your applications. Security, recommendations around security settings to help make your AWS workloads more secure. Fault tolerance, recommendations that can help highlight uh, redundancy shortfalls and help point out overused resources that may cause impacts to your applications. And last but not least, service limits. Now these are the checks uh, done across your account to let you know if you're approaching the service limits or uh, quota settings uh, for your account. The number of checks available in the Trusted Advisor tool will vary depending on the support plan you have on the account. Now we'll be talking about support plans a bit later in the course, but just know that you'll need either the business or enterprise AWS support plan to unlock all the Trusted Advisor checks as well as the API access to the tool. So if you're ever after some advice around optimizing costs, uh, performance, security, fault tolerance, or you know those service limits for your existing workloads running in AWS, Trusted Advisor is a great tool to start with. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. You made it. Welcome to domain three of the Certified Cloud Practitioner Exam Blueprint, where we'll dive into the technology areas of AWS. Referring back to the exam blueprint, the main theme here is identify and describe. There's hundreds of AWS services available on their platform, and we'll be taking a look at some of the core services offered. And you know, the depth here again will be just to identify perhaps what a given service is and at a high level, describe what uh, it would be used for. This section will also be a great foundational base of knowledge should you wish to pursue those uh, associate level exams, which get into uh, a bit of wider breadth of services and expect more depth of knowledge and uh, real world experience with them. So domain three, let's go, and I'll see you in the lessons ahead. Okay, we learned a lot about cloud technology and AWS so far, but how do you get things done on AWS? First, you need to understand that everything in AWS is performed through API calls. These application programming interfaces can be thought of as a set of rules that determine what you can do on the AWS platform. They're basically a menu for you and are used to allow the communication between you and your applications to the backend AWS services. If we think uh, about going into a cloud computing restaurant, uh, you're super hungry for a storage lunch. You take a look at the API menu and determine you want to create a storage bucket to put some pictures of your favorite uh, lunches in it. You look at the menu and find the S3 create bucket API call reference. Now this menu is provided to you, but you have a variety of options on how to order from it. Maybe it's a restaurant with those uh, interactive tables that you can order through the touchscreen tabletop, or maybe you order through a tablet at the table, or uh, perhaps just communicate your order by talking with your server. Again, the AWS APIs are predetermined ways AWS allows you to interact with their services and provision and configure uh, and manage those resources. Now, similar to this restaurant menu example, you can interact with this API menu in a variety of ways. A lot of times you'll be using the AWS console through your browser. Behind the scenes though, the AWS console is translating your navigation of the console and your inputs and selections you make into the browser into the API requests that are sent to AWS. It's these API requests that actually perform the actions within the uh, backend services based on your browser inputs through the web console. Now, as the AWS console is browser-based, New users often find this the best way to initially uh, navigate around the AWS platform. The AWS console is your uh, visual graphical user interface or GUI. Now in the web console, AWS services often have configuration wizards for services to help walk you through the service creation and setup steps. The AWS console is also a great way to create quick 
proof of concept environments. You may know what you need done and within a few clicks, your service can be ready to start building uh, great things on. For these quick tests, it's often not worth the extra time and effort to use the AWS CLI or other uh, infrastructure automation tools, which we'll talk about shortly. The web console is also great for looking at some of the service monitoring aspects of your AWS environments, as there's a variety of dashboards available in the browser-based console. The console is also great for viewing the non-technical aspects of your AWS account, like your billing information. Through the AWS console, you can quickly view your invoices and billing details. You can also access the AWS Cost Explorer to get a variety of visual insights into your AWS usage and costs. We'll be going over Cost Explorer a bit further later in the course as well. So the AWS console seems great, right? Uh, it's easy to navigate around. Uh, there's all kinds of visual ways of selecting and configuring resources. And uh, there's those helpful wizards that guide you through the service creation and configuration. But there are some downsides. What do you think some of the challenges would be with uh, only using that web console? Well, let's think when you want to start to deploy environments consisting of uh, multiple networks, thousands of EC2 instances, uh, hundreds of databases, uh, a variety of storage services, API gateways, uh, all the DNS routing, networking, access control lists, security groups, WAF, auto scaling groups, load balancers, uh, all the other supported infrastructure uh, to run the business and workload on. Uh, you get the idea. Um, there are potentially hundreds or thousands of mouse clicks and configuration inputs uh, needed to perform the uh, deployment activities of a complex environment like this. For this reason, there are many tool options available to automate these activities through scripts or programmatic methods. A common alternative to the web console is the AWS command line interface or CLI. With the AWS CLI, you now have the benefit of automation with this non-visual way of interacting with the AWS APIs. With the CLI, you can create scripts for common activities you need to perform, so they're easily repeatable and help avoid the human error aspect when configuring tons of these AWS resources. So you need to create uh, 100 EC2 instances exactly the same way. With the AWS CLI and perhaps some uh, Bash or Python scripting, this uh, daunting task could take a, you know, a matter of seconds. Compared to the console, you've saved yourself hundreds of mouse clicks and likely hours of time. And that's not even considering that through the long manual process, uh, you didn't make any errors uh, with the setup of the 100 instances that were supposed to be configured exactly the same way. Now we've talked about how you can interact with the AWS services, but what if you have an application that needs to perform some actions with AWS services as well? How can you get your application code to interact with the AWS APIs? When building applications that need to interact with AWS services, you would use the AWS Software Development Kits, or SDKs, and these make it easy to have your applications uh, communicate with the AWS APIs using the programming language of your choice. There are also a variety of infrastructure orchestration tools available that also interact with the AWS APIs. Tools like CloudFormation and third-party tools like the popular Terraform fall into this category. There are tools where you can define the AWS resources and configuration details in some form of code, uh, often in a JSON or YAML syntax, and the tool handles all the orchestration magic to make it happen. This is the beauty of these infrastructure as code or IAC tools, is their declarative methodology where you basically define uh, what you want the end result of your infrastructure to be, and the tool figures out all the dependencies uh, and the order of resources being requested. When deploying multiple infrastructure services, there's often a specific order these need to be deployed so you can build other things on top of them or associate other resources to it. These IAC tools take care of these uh, dependency aspects and also handle the API calls to the respective AWS service APIs to make the deployment magic happen. A key benefit with these IAC tools is that all this infrastructure resource deployment is very repeatable. If you're very strict about only using IAC tools to define and deploy your AWS resources, you'd always have a type of backup of your entire AWS infrastructure. You know, if disaster strikes, you could easily rebuild your entire AWS environment from scratch. Uh, or if you wanted a, you know, a replica of a production environment for testing, 
by changing a few variables, you could basically deploy a mirror of your production environment for doing uh, performance testing or other development work. All the benefits of IAC tools are well outside the scope of the exam, but just keep in mind that these infrastructures or tools like AWS CloudFormation exist and some of the benefits they can provide. The benefits come through the declarative orchestration of your resources and allow a more automated and repeatable process of creating these resources. Now, just as we close out the lesson here, think about how you may use AWS. Do you think you'll be sticking with the AWS web-based console or perhaps leverage the command line methods of interacting with the AWS APIs? Or uh, would you invest the time to do everything through infrastructure as code tools? There's no right or wrong answer here. It all depends on what you're trying to achieve, but I just want you to think about the pros and cons of some of the ways you can deploy and operate your AWS environment. So with that, we're done with this lesson. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. We touched on the AWS global infrastructure topic briefly in an earlier lesson, but now let's deepen our knowledge on this material and understand how this stuff translates into real world benefits for AWS customers. If we think back to the uh, AWS well architected framework again, recall that designing for failure was a common theme of the design principles. As customers were expected to ensure the design of our cloud infrastructure can withstand various failure scenarios. But thinking back to that uh, shared responsibility model, the physical aspects of the infrastructure are largely AWS's responsibility. So what is the AWS global infrastructure comprised of that allows AWS to offer these highly available uh, solutions to us as customers? For example, uh, what happens if there's a power failure at an AWS data center? Uh, what happens to our services running on AWS if there's some large you know, natural disaster scenario that can impact uh, an entire geographic area. Well, the AWS global infrastructure is very impressive uh, and it keeps growing. AWS provides a number of options to us to leverage their global infrastructure so we can design our workloads to withstand these types of scenarios. At a very high level, AWS infrastructure can be broken down into three core areas, uh, regions, availability zones, and edge locations. So starting with regions, uh, a region is a physical location somewhere in the world where AWS has data centers available for you to operate your workloads on. At the time of recording here, AWS offers 26 regions to us to choose from and eight more announced locations that will be online in the near future. Having all these region options for us as customers is amazing. Uh, you can simply pick a global location to host your services based on where your customers are located for you know, that best possible experience. Now, in the real world, the decision of uh, what region to select for your workloads can get complicated. Now, while largely out of the scope of this course and exam, uh, to get you thinking about this a bit though, you know, beyond simply trying to run your workloads close to where your customers are geographically, there may be a variety of other compliance and business related factors that weigh in on the decision. Uh, and then you add to the mix that AWS often prices their services differently in different regions. But getting back on track here, um, having all these AWS region choices allows for some great disaster recovery strategies for your business. You can leverage these region locations to host your services on different sides of the continent or other parts of the world to avoid localized natural disaster events from affecting your business. Now, something to keep in mind is AWS regions are created with at least two availability zones which we'll talk about in a moment. Regions are also their own isolated container as well. By default, your information and data does not move across regions. AWS does not move or replicate the data outside of your region it resides in, unless you configure the services specifically to do so. There's of course, uh, possible law enforcement or government order scenarios that AWS may need to comply with, but for our scope here, we can you know, rest assured that if we have data in an AWS region, that data stays in that region, unless of course we as customers configure the AWS services to do otherwise. So along with the benefits around improving customer experience by running our services as close to uh, our customers as possible uh, to reduce latency and allow us as customers pr to uh, protect against natural disasters or uh, large power grid disruptions, 
This region isolation is important if you have uh, special regulatory requirements around data residency as well. Now we mentioned that AWS regions have at least two things called availability zones, which are often abbreviated to AZs. So what is an AZ? Well, an AZ is a logical zone made up of uh, one or more data centers. This design helps make each AZ highly available. The data centers that make up an AZ are locally separated and uh, the design and location uh, would consider things like power utility connections, uh, floodplains, and so forth. However, the data centers belonging to the same AZ are still relatively close to one another and connected with very high-speed network connections to minimize the uh, latency between them. Now, AZs within a region are generally close to one another to keep network latency to a bare minimum, yet uh, far enough apart to protect against somewhat uh, local disasters. Now, I imagine this varies a lot from location to location, but AWS documentation notes that there's uh, a meaningful distance between AZs, but they are typically less than 100 kilometers or 60 miles apart. So to quickly review, um, we have regions all over the globe, and each region has multiple AZs. Then each of those AZs have one or more dedicated data centers behind it. Now, thinking back to the beginning of the course where we discussed some of the benefits of cloud computing, think how expensive and how long it would take for a company today to create this type of global infrastructure with multiple global regions, um, each with multiple AZs, all connected with super fast backbone network designs. With AWS, you get to benefit from all this incredible global infrastructure without having any capital expenses to set this up yourself. Now, one thing I'll mention for you to be aware of is that not all cloud providers define their infrastructure the same way as AWS. While some providers may list that they support a lot of regions, this may mean the cloud provider uh, just has a single data center available there. Now compare that with what we know about the AWS infrastructure design, where each region is made up of multiple AZs, then each of those has multiple uh, highly available data centers within it. Now we won't get into any uh, debates here about which cloud provider has the best cloud infrastructure, uh, where really that answer has a ton of variables to think about uh, for your particular workloads and business objectives. But I just want you to understand that while AWS uses these terms of regions and AZs, the same terms can mean different things with different cloud service providers. The underlying redundancy and design of the physical cloud provider infrastructure is uh, important to understand once you start designing your applications to run in the cloud and uh, you need to understand what types of failure situations you need to prepare for. Now, as a quick example here, something like an AZ for AWS may be advertised as a full region for a different cloud provider. If this is the case, without multiple AZs back in the region, you may have to think about deploying your workloads across multiple regions with uh, other cloud providers for similar highly available architectures. Now, one other piece I wanna call out are the AWS edge locations. Now, Edge locations don't have the same capabilities of, of a full AWS region. Um, I'm likely oversimplifying it a bit, but in my mind, Edge location is simply a spot where there's specialized uh, networking equipment that uh, caches content so it can deliver that uh, cache data to customers uh, close to the Edge location with very low latency. Now, as an example, uh, if we make up a website called uh, you know Top 100 Cat Photos, you have cat lovers that use the site from all around the world. Now our website runs on AWS Compute Services, but stores the pictures users upload to an object storage service called S3. Um, we'll be covering some of these services in upcoming lessons, so don't worry if uh, you know, it doesn't make sense quite yet. Now, even if you don't have all the technical understanding of how a website would accomplish this, we can logically think that for every time a person goes to our website and the web server needs to then grab the image files from uh, where they're stored in S3 in order to display them for the user's browser. So there is a bit of overhead on the web server and a bit on the performance and monetary cost associated with the web server having to request and transfer that cat image file each time a user views it. Now, if your web page has all top 100 cats displayed at once, we'd be making 100 requests and 100 image downloads and transfers for each person that accesses our site. Now, getting back to caching, uh, in this example, we would temporarily store the cat image files in memory or 
uh, very fast storage system that the web server can access almost instantly. So there is no more request to the original storage source uh, to download the cat image each time. Images usually benefit greatly from caching as they typically do not change often once they're uploaded. So the first time the website or whatever application needs the image has to retrieve it, it would uh, check this cache for it. And if it didn't exist, it then has to pull the image from the storage backend. Uh, but this time it saves uh, that image in the cache as well. So the next request will be a lot faster. Edge locations do this type of caching and uh, would store certain types of data as close to your customers as possible, improving the performance of your site or applications since there's no uh, backend processing needed anymore for retrieving files or perhaps getting information from a database. Since these edge locations are connected into the AWS global infrastructure uh, backbone network connections, they often serve as access points for services like S3 Transfer Accelerator, where you can quickly access the AWS backbone network for data transfer and you know, reduce that reliance on public internet for the entire process. Uh, thereby you know, improving your speed and reliability of your data transfers. AWS also has a number of edge computing options that allow you to perform a variety of uh, data processing at these edge locations that would be closer to your end users. So you can you know, improve the, your latency for certain scenarios or offload a variety of compute functions to the edge and reduce the compute overhead on your backend systems. Now, one more area of the AWS's global infrastructure is something called local zones. As of this recording, there are not many supported uh, cities offered yet, but I would suggest to skim over the documentation just to understand that this exists and the potential use cases for local zones. I'll include some links in the uh, follow-up material for after this lesson for you to review. All right, so we covered off the AWS global infrastructure by understanding AWS regions, and how these regions are comprised of multiple availability zones, and that the AZs themselves may be comprised of one or more physical data center facilities. We also touched on the purpose of AWS edge locations for caching certain types of data uh, with the intent to reduce latency for users around the world and perhaps also uh, help reduce some backend processing overhead for our infrastructure. So take some time with the documentation and other links in the next ebook lesson to solidify your understanding of these important AWS global infrastructure concepts. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Hello again, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to talk about high availability through uh, using availability zones in AWS. In a previous lesson, we discussed the AWS regions, availability zones, and edge locations, but we're going to uh, take a deeper look here at availability zones and how we can leverage them as customers to achieve uh, highly available services in AWS. Now, I think these AZ concepts are better understood with some visuals, so let's dive in. So to illustrate the concepts of how we can leverage AWS's availability zones to improve our overall service availability, let's take a look at a very simplistic example. Say we have an online store that we want to run in AWS and uh, it requires six backend web servers to handle the load of our site. We know most of our users are in a certain geographic area, uh, so we pick an AWS region closest to that spot. The region we pick happens to have, uh, say, three availability zones, AZ1, AZ2, and AZ3. And to help us out in this example, we'll uh, throw in a component called a load balancer. Now, I'm not going to get into the details here, but essentially this load balancer uh, will just distribute our incoming web traffic to the available backend web servers. Now, our example business is just getting going here. Uh, we have a new engineering team, and we just want to keep our design simple. So we run our six servers in AZ1. So our site's up and running, uh, things are going great, everyone's happy, um, but wait. Three weeks after our big site launch, some type of event caused these AZ1 data centers to go offline. At this point, we lost our entire capability to run our website. Disaster. But okay, it's our fault. We learned about the well-architected framework and the design for failure principle, and our design didn't really accommodate the loss of an AZ. We had all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. 
So we learn from that situation and decide to leverage two AZs. We now put three servers in one AZ and three in another. This essentially costs the same to do this. We're still running uh, six servers just spread out over two AZs, uh, but now we're protected against the failure of an AZ. Somewhat. If we lose AZ2 now, is that okay? Well, that kind of depends. In our example, we needed six servers to maintain our site traffic load. With AZ2 gone now, we lost half our capacity. Now, depending on the specifics of our site, uh, it may be able to handle this scenario temporarily, but it may not. In our example here, let's say we actually do need the six servers to handle our traffic load, and this AZ failure still caused some issues for us. Now, it wasn't as bad as before, uh, our site was still running, but a lot of users were complaining of it being slow and running into a lot of errors accessing our site. Uh, essentially a lot of unhappy customers and of course lots of lost revenue during this time. Now with the learning experience from this AZ2 failure, we know we don't like having half our capacity being unavailable. So this time around we still want to leverage the two AZs, but this time we run our minimum six servers in each AZ. So now we're in a much better spot, right? We have six servers in AZ1, so if either AZ goes down again, we still have our six servers available to us to handle the traffic, and the loss of the AZ is essentially unnoticeable to the end users of our site. But what's the catch here? Well, we need six servers, but to protect against a loss of an AZ, we now need to run 12 servers all the time. We have the six in AZ1 and six in AZ2. Our cost to run our applications in AWS is essentially doubled now. So what else can we do here? Well, if we take the same approach, but utilize more of the AZs available to us, the loss of a single AZ would have a lower overall impact on us. Now in our example, our region we pick just has three AZs available, but even still, this means we could put three servers in each AZ instead if we're trying to protect it against a single AZ failure scenario. So if we do this and put three in AZ1, three in AZ2, and three in AZ3, we're only running nine servers now, but we can maintain our full six servers in the event of a single AZ failure. Now there's many caveats to this, but in general, the more AZs you can distribute your workloads across, the lower the impact of an AZ loss would have on your overall infrastructure. And uh, you can also likely reduce the amount of over-provisioned capacity needed and reduce those wasted costs as well. Our upcoming courses will dive a lot deeper on these uh, multi-AZ design considerations and load balancers, but now you should have that conceptual understanding of how you may be able to leverage the AWS AZs to achieve highly available applications. And that concludes this quick lesson. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll quickly review some of the reasons to take advantage of AWS regions and also discuss uh, what you should be thinking about when selecting your regions for your business. Now, some of this should be reviewed at this point, so we'll just uh, you know keep things simple here and run through some of the core ideas for multi-region use cases. Now, first, multi-region application designs are better protected against a number of disaster scenarios. There may be natural disaster events that could take out an AWS region service capabilities, um, or there may be an, any number of uh, human errors from uh, you know both your side as an AWS customer, or uh, maybe AWS, and you know perhaps there's some type of uh, AWS upgrades or changes taking place that don't go as planned, and result in some sort of instability or uh, you know even a complete loss of some of the core services. Now the same goes for your business here too. Uh, perhaps you have some type of uh, planned deployment that goes wrong and you need a quick way to fail back to uh, a good environment. Um, you know, regardless of the cause of the disaster scenario, uh, having the ability to run your applications in different regions opens up many options for disaster recovery. Now, if you design things well, you can help prevent these regional disaster events from becoming a disaster for your business. There's a number of solutions that can help your business do a fully automated failover between regions should the situation ever arise. Now, remember that key theme from earlier lessons to design for failure. Don't let AWS's problem become your problem. 
that AWS regions are great tools available to your business to prevent against these types of disasters. Use them. Now, these disaster recovery benefits are a massive use case for multi-region application design, but what else? Well, we should be keeping our end customers in mind. Do you have uh, global customers or are customers in different parts of the country? Chances are that you can better serve your customers and reduce application latency by running your infrastructure in regions that are located closer to them. Okay, so we know multi-region designs make a lot of sense in many situations, but AWS has a ton of locations around the world today. How does one go about picking a region? Well, the answer to this is, of course, it depends. But I'll help get you thinking about a few things on your journey to select the best region or regions for you. We'll go over four core aspects to help narrow down the optimal region or regions for you. Now, the first one on our list of things here are compliance considerations for your business. And this needs to be the first thing you think about. If your business has compliance-based obligations or restrictions on where you need to store and process data, uh, this can help narrow down things very fast. Maybe your data needs to stay within Canada or the UK. Whatever the case, ensure you understand what your compliance requirements are before picking a region. Next, with our remaining region choices based on our compliance filter we used, we need to look at what AWS services we need to run our workloads. Not all AWS regions are created equally. We've learned that an AWS region can have different amounts of availability zones in them, but they can also have different services and feature capabilities. Be sure to check out the links in the follow-up material to this video here. But in general, if you know what services you need and certain AWS regions simply don't offer those services, it may further narrow down your choices very quickly. So with those out of the way, we can consider a few other factors to help make a region decision. Now, how you weigh these will vary depending on your business goals. But in general, you may want to think about picking regions that are closest to your customers. Due to known physics at this time, like the uh, speed of light, we want to avoid introducing unnecessary latency due to the data transfer limitations over very long distances. So picking a region that has the best proximity to the bulk of your customers can make a lot of sense. And last but not least, costs. You can imagine that running massive data centers and all the you know staffing, uh, government regulations, uh, tax structures, and other geographical logistics could uh, vary greatly from region to region and impact AWS's CapEx and OpEx overhead. So because of this, AWS pricing may actually differ from region to region. Now, there's no surprises to you here as a customer, though. Uh, you know, all this pricing information is available to you to review before making a decision about what region to select. So to summarize quickly, if you need to select an AWS region for something, uh, first, do you have any compliance or uh, business constraints that would limit where you can store or process your data? Then, do you know what uh, AWS services and features you need for your workloads and what regions support all of those? And then, what regions would be closest to my customers? Uh, if you're left with a few options at this point, perhaps rank them in best to worst in terms of uh, proximity to your customers. Then maybe take a look at that list in factor and costs. Are there any price differences between the regions? Does the cost difference justify picking a different region at the expense of increasing latency for your customers? In large global enterprise environments, the answer is often a mix and match of all these factors. This is getting more into the architectural discussions here, but recall from our quick lesson on the AWS global infrastructure and edge locations, we know these edge locations can cache our data and potentially improve latency. So if we add this into our thinking here, uh, perhaps we can pick a less expensive AWS region for our core infrastructure to save costs, but we can reduce some of the application latency our customers may experience by leveraging edge locations. Therefore, we can utilize the most cost-effective region, and it may not have adverse effects on our customers by also using those edge cache locations as well. So that concludes the lesson here. Uh, a reminder to check out the reference links in the course around the regional service availability and uh, region pricing comparisons to help narrow down the best regions for you. Again, great job. I uh, hope you're enjoying the course so far. Uh, keep that learning voyage going and don't forget to reach out to our Slack group if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. You're progressing nicely through the course so far, uh, and now we'll shift things even a bit further from the theory aspects of cloud and 
AWS as we start taking a look at some of the core AWS services you'll need to know. Now again, don't stress if you're uh, not a technical person. Uh, the focus of this course and exam isn't to know these services inside and out at this point. We just need to understand what some of the AWS core services are, uh, what they do, and uh, you know how you may start to leverage them to your advantage. Now to help form a mental roadmap of what we'll be looking at, I've always found it easiest to consider the AWS service categories. You know, with hundreds of uh, services available to us as AWS customers, it can be a challenge to even understand what these services do and where each one fits into the big picture of uh, you know, what you're trying to accomplish in the cloud. Now, there's a few spots that list services based on the category, and I'll include some of the links in the follow-up material for you to check out as a helpful reference. Uh, but the one I'll uh, pick for this discussion here is simply from the AWS documentation page. Uh, so let's take a look. To get to this documentation page, just from the top menu here, we can go to this documentation link and then view all documentation. I'll include the interactive link here as well if you want to follow along. And now we can see all the services grouped into the AWS service categories. I'm just going to zoom in a bit here. Although there's a lot of categories and certainly a lot of services within them, uh, don't feel overwhelmed at this point. There's just a few core categories we'll be diving into for the scope of the Cloud Practitioner exam. Now, take a moment or two here to uh, go through and review these categories and uh, think perhaps about your job role or perhaps what types of uh, products or services your company provides. You know, what service categories do you think would be the most important? Now, regardless of your role, if you're looking to understand AWS, it's important to be familiar with at least the core service categories identified in the Cloud Practitioner exam guide, uh, especially the network and content delivery, uh, security, identity, and compliance, uh, compute, storage, and database categories. All right, so let's start exploring some of these core services. I'll see you in the next video. Hi everyone, welcome back. In the next few lessons, we'll be taking a look at a few of the core services within the AWS compute category. Now we won't be diving into each uh, compute service for the scope of this exam in depth. Our focus will be just to understand at a high level what some of these core services offer and ensure you have a general understanding of what these uh, different services provide and how you may benefit from them. We'll be taking a look at the Elastic Cloud Compute Service called EC2 which is at the you know, heart of the uh, compute services offered by AWS. Then we'll take a look at the Elastic Load Balancer uh, and then the auto-scaling features, and then how we can combine those two together to uh, adapt to changing business demands. We'll then touch on AWS Lambda, which provides ways to directly execute code so you can perform a variety of functions, uh, you know, function-driven workflows for your applications. Then finally, we'll explore the container orchestration services uh, taking a look at the Elastic Container Service called ECS and the Elastic Kubernetes Service called EKS. We've got lots to cover here, so let's get started. Welcome back. In this video, we'll take a look at the Elastic Cloud Compute Service from AWS known as EC2. So what's this EC2 service for exactly, and how can you benefit from it as an AWS customer? Well, EC2 is the service where you'd provision virtual servers in AWS. All right, got it. But this is a foundational lesson, and some of you may be asking, what do you mean by a server, and uh, how can it be virtual? Well, to keep things simple, let's say uh, a server for our discussion here is just a computer that's typically made up of a combination of a uh, central processing unit, uh, some memory chips, and perhaps some uh, storage media. Uh, a server is typically needed when you need to perform some type of high-performance computational work. If we think of a simple website as an example, we often interact with a number of these servers behind the scenes that process our requests. We're using our browser as a client, uh, making these requests to uh, a server or a pool of servers that receive our browser client requests it made. The servers may then take these requests and do any number of activities depending on how our web application is designed. 
you know, it may be simply generating some dynamic new web pages for our browser uh, to make our experience on the site more engaging or personalized. Or perhaps it's taking some information we input through our web browser, uh, you know, perhaps on a payment checkout page, that the server may receive that input data we typed in, uh, perform some checks on it, and perhaps communicate with uh, other servers to process the payment transaction uh, with our you know, financial institution or credit card company. Um, and then from there, you know, it may restore some resulting data in a database. Uh, you know, these are some basic examples, but there are endless reasons why you may need some type of compute resources for your business. Now, from our lessons early on in the course, we explored the more traditional data center approach companies took with servers. Recall doing that capacity planning guessing game exercise, you know, uh, buying tons of expensive servers and tying up the organization's capital in the process. You know, uh, waiting for weeks to, uh, you know, get the servers, then waiting further for data center technicians to unbox, uh, install, and cable to servers with, uh, you know, networking and power connections, uh, and then test them. So we have huge upfront costs with that approach and huge delays of, you know, weeks to months before we can actually use the servers. Also, don't forget that whole uh, CapEx and OpEx exercise we did around the data center facilities to house all these servers as well. So long story short, it's a rather slow, frustrating, and very expensive process to add compute resources in their traditional IT data center world. So how does this Amazon EC2 service help us out then? Well, if we recall from our discussion on the shared responsibility model, we shift all this physical data center and server burden to AWS. AWS provides us its mind-boggling inventory of servers to use as customers, and we can essentially just rent the servers we need from AWS instead of having all the uh, upfront capital expense and operational heavy lifting on our shoulders. So let's take a look at how this all works a bit deeper. Now, modern servers have a tremendous amount of compute and memory capacity to them. It's pretty rare that application workloads would happen to need the exact compute and memory offered by a specific server configuration and use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's often a ton of waste occurring on these servers. The high-powered processor and high-performance RAM capacity is simply not used 100% of the time. Now, as an example, let's say we did some capacity calculations for our organization and we decided we needed to buy a bunch of the latest servers, uh, each with a 40-core CPU processor and 512 gigabytes of RAM, to meet our current peak workload demands and still have maybe a, you know, say a 20% buffer, uh, you know, a safety net just in case that peak gets any bigger. Well, right away, we're wasting 20% of these expensive servers capability by simply having that buffer. Now, we bought these specific high performance configurations of servers to meet our organization's peak load demands based on our capacity calculations. But that peak, uh, let's say, you know, only occurs once a day for about uh, 40 minutes, as an example. We had to ensure that we could handle that peak, but once that demand decreases, our servers sit largely idle, perhaps wasting 95% or more of that server's capabilities. Then what happens six months from now when our application changes, uh, maybe there's some code optimizations that were made to reduce the uh, compute requirements by you know, 60%. Uh, what happens if there's shifts in the overall amount of demand due to uh, loss of customers or you know other business dynamics at play that peak load that we expect our service to handle is now uh, half of what it was a year ago so long story short in the traditional it world with buying and managing these physical servers yourself you're more often than not left with tremendous amounts of wasted resources and you're stuck with this expensive hardware if you get those capacity requirement guesses wrong now with the amazon ec2 service AWS uses a technology called virtualization to better utilize the physical server resources. We won't get into the low-level details here, but virtualization is accomplished through specialized hypervisor software technology that interacts with the physical server hardware components to create smaller logical slices of them. The hypervisor manages the creation of these slices and can assemble them as a virtual machine. With virtualization, we can carve up the physical CPU, memory, uh, networking, and storage resources in any number of variations. And we can create, you know, tens or perhaps hundreds of these smaller virtual compute machine resources from the same physical server with, you know, different mixes of the CPU and memory configurations if needed. The hypervisor layer 
works its magic to isolate each virtual machine from one another as well. So this virtual machine uh, here would have no idea that the other virtual machine exists on the same physical server. There's basically no way to interact with the other virtual machine's uh, CPU or memory slices. From within the virtual machine, you can install your own operating system and applications. And you know, from that perspective, uh, your operating system and applications would have no idea it's running on a virtual machine instead of a physical one. Now, a core reason for virtualization is that we can pack more of these smaller virtual machines onto the physical server to make better use of the physical hardware resources of that host. Now, if we start to think about this from the AWS angle, we can sort of start to understand how this service works and how it's so cost effective for us to use as customers. So AWS would have these data centers with uh, a ton of servers, and then they add this hypervisor layer to them to allow the creation of these virtual machines on top of them. Now, how does this benefit us as customers? Well, first think back to our lesson on the economies of scale. AWS has tremendous buying power and highly customized hardware and silicone chips in some cases to essentially get that raw physical server capabilities at a far lower cost than you know most organizations ever could. Then think of that server underutilization issue we just talked about. You know, it's still an issue uh, with these AWS servers as well, but it's not our problem anymore. It's AWS's problem. AWS has that capital investment in this server hardware, and they want to ensure that capacity is not going to waste. So AWS pools massive amounts of these servers together for their huge customer base to use, and they're able to manage that virtualization effectively to pack customers' virtual machines onto these servers and reduce that capacity waste as much as possible on these servers. So from the AWS perspective here, we have very, very cost-efficient physical server hardware through the AWS buying power because of their sheer scale and volume. And then the servers are operated very efficiently, so there's very little wasted capacity. These efficiencies of AWS's scale weave all through the you know, data centers and operational overhead. This all results in very cost-efficient operations of the overall compute capacity of the EC2 service, which AWS passes all these savings and efficiencies onto you in the form of low-cost virtual machines. Now, after all this, we know that Amazon EC2 servers can provide us with cost-effective virtual machines to use. But what are other benefits to us as customers here? So with EC2, we no longer have that uh, traditional data center overhead or the pain and expense of dealing with physical servers. And we can now leverage the power of virtual machines to create virtual compute resources that match our actual workload requirements. We can request a new EC2 virtual machine, which uh, AWS calls an instance, or even thousands of new instances. Then in a matter of minutes, we have fully provisioned compute resources for us to use and immediately start to run our workloads on. There's no more waiting for you know, weeks to order and rack and stack servers before we can use them compared to those uh, traditional IT days. Now, another key EC2 benefit is it's easy come, easy go. Just as you can simply request new EC2 instances based on uh, perhaps increases in your workload demand um, or whatever your business reasons, you can just as simply uh, stop or terminate these instances when you don't need them anymore. You're not stuck with expensive, unused physical servers when your capacity needs decrease. Now, we've touched on this a bit already in the course, and we'll be exploring billing concepts in a lot more depth later on. But with EC2, you can pick the virtual machine capacity you need, and that's what you pay for. Further, you only pay for the length of time that EC2 instance is running. As an example, if you have an EC2 instance type that is billed by the second, if you, you know, only need the instance for, say, three hours, eight minutes, and uh, 21 seconds, uh, and then stop or terminate it at that point, you're only billed by AWS for just that three hours, eight minutes, and 21 seconds. Then consider if you have varying compute demands for your organization, as most do. Uh, perhaps you have some type of, uh, you know, daily spikes of traffic for two hours each day, or perhaps on the weekend, your demand drops 90%. Think of the flexibility and cost savings a service like EC2 offers us as customers to uh, scale in and out our consumption of these EC2 instance resources exactly to our business needs. And we only pay for what we use. We're not paying for potentially hundreds of physical servers uh, sitting around idle like we would in the traditional IT environments. Now this EC2 scaling flexibility is offered in two flavors. 
Horizontal scaling, where we can add more of the same instance types to handle increases in our workload, or if there's uh, perhaps new application behavior or changes in the consumption ratios of uh, our needs for processing power compared to memory resources, we can also change the instance types and do what's called vertical scaling. To use an example, with vertical scaling, instead of adding four more EC2 instances, Perhaps we may be better off to change our instance type to one that has uh, four times the memory size as our original instance. We're vertically changing that single instance up or down to meet our needs rather than adding more of the same instance type with the horizontal scaling approach. Typically, horizontal scaling is the better option, but this really depends on your workload requirements and application specifics as to what the best choice would be for you. But regardless, the, the point here is that with EC2, you have this choice and freedom to scale in or out or up or down, all within the matter of minutes. Now to hammer home this flexibility benefit the EC2 service provides us, beyond all the scaling capabilities mentioned, we then have the configuration flexibility to run various Linux or Windows operating systems on them. And then we can configure a variety of storage options with instances as well. And then we have control over the networking configuration of the instances. We may want to set them up so that they're only internally accessible within our virtual private cloud network. Or we may want to set them up so that they're publicly accessible. The point I'm trying to make here is that there's endless configuration flexibility with these EC2 instances. I hope you've enjoyed this intro here on the Amazon EC2 service and learned how it may benefit you or your organization. We've just been looking at the you know, tip of the iceberg here with this core service from AWS. We'll be taking a look at more areas of EC2, like understanding the different instance types available to us, uh, automatic scaling capabilities, and the load balancing features in upcoming lessons. So with that, I'll end the lesson here, and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be exploring the Amazon EC2 instance types a bit, now, the uh, Cloud Practitioner exam scope here is more focused on knowing just the higher level uh, instance types families at this point. So what do I mean by instance families? Well, these are just the different uh, groupings or categories of the hundreds of different instance type variations available to us as AWS customers. Okay, but let's back this up a bit here. Why would I even want different instance types? For an example, let's say you need to buy uh, a vehicle. Well, everyone has different criteria for what they want out of that vehicle and provide them the best value. It needs to perform its purpose, but we want to avoid wasting money on something that isn't, uh, you know, the best choice based on our requirements. For some folks, a bicycle may be a great option, uh, cheap, convenient, uh, efficient, or perhaps you have a family and need some type of family sedan, or perhaps the kids, uh, you know, are all hockey goalies and, you know, you frequently do these long road trips and need, uh, you know, lots of storage space for all that gear. You always have, uh, you know, stuff that just won't fit into the trunk of a, you know, typical car. So perhaps you look at some form of uh, SUV for your needs. Or perhaps someone in the family has a uh, construction business uh, and they're constantly hauling around tools, uh, landscaping supplies, or perhaps pulling large trailers. In this case, uh, you know, a pickup truck may be the best solution here. Now there's, of course, a variety of trade-offs with these different types of vehicles. Uh, the big ones being around uh, cost and efficiency. Then if we take this example to uh, extremes a bit, uh, think of a transport truck or something like a F1 race car. These are very purpose-built vehicles to do a specific job. They're not great general purpose vehicles. Uh, an F1 car can seat uh, one person uh, and it's designed for speed and you know, highly tuned for specific race circuits. Uh, you know, it's extremely expensive to buy uh, and maintain, but, you know, it's purpose-built to win F1 races. So just like this vehicle example, AWS offers us hundreds of variations of these virtual instances that we can choose from to meet our specific workload requirements. Now, we can think about these general instance-type families as the class of vehicle. Uh, you know, the family sedans, uh, sports cars, uh, the SUVs, the pickup trucks, the race cars. Now within each category here, we have a lot of variations to help even further pick the right instance types or vehicle in our example uh, for our needs. So within these vehicle categories, we have a number of different manufacturers and models of vehicles. Then of those, 
They're often offered in a number of configurations with, uh, you know, different engines, uh, wheels, features, and even colors. And that's exactly like these instance types. We can say, uh, you know, we need to pick a general purpose category of instance types where we need that uh, simple balance of compute, uh, memory, storage, and network performance. Uh, then from within that category, we can tune further by, you know, whatever our criteria is. Um, do we need a you know, four-cylinder engine vehicle or do we need that turbocharged V8? Or perhaps our workload is very uh, compute intensive and you know, we pick something from you know, that sports car category. We have a higher bias for compute capacity compared to memory requirements for our workload. So maybe we pick that uh, Porsche 911 GT3 RS. Anyways, we'll go over the instance types families in a moment here, but I hope this helps understand the need for all these different instance types by AWS customers. You know, everyone's workload and application requirements are unique, and this amount of choice allows us to pick the you know, best fit for those requirements so we can maximize our performance while keeping our costs as low as possible. Okay, so let's jump over to the AWS documentation about these instance types. All right, so this is the Amazon EC2 instance type documentation page here. There's tons of information about the different uh, instance types and uh, all the variations of them. Now, what I want to draw your attention to here is just over on the left, all these instance uh, families or categories here. We have your uh, you know, general purpose category, the compute optimized, memory optimized, accelerated computing, and storage optimized. Now, this uh, general purpose category here is already expanded for us. And we can see within each category here all these different uh, you know, flavors of instance types within that category. You know, I guess we could say these are all the different uh, you know, makes and models of uh, different vehicles within this category. And we're not going to get too in-depth with all these instance types for the scope of the Cloud Practitioner exam here, but let's take a look at some of these categories and what's inside. So again, starting with this general purpose category here, uh, you can see sort of the breakdown of the different types of uh, processors that are in here. Um, and all the different instance sizes and a breakdown of the CPU configuration compared to the uh, you know, memory configuration. So if we take a look at this uh, first one here, the M6i.large, we see that it has two uh, virtual CPUs or vCPUs and eight gigabytes of memory for that option. Now in comparison, if we take a look here at the uh, compute optimized instances, if we look at this uh, C6i.large, this one has uh, two vCPUs and four gigabytes of memory. So in this compute optimized category, the ratio of the uh, CPUs compared to the memory is a lot higher on the uh, CPU side. So for this uh, C6i instance type example that exists in the compute optimized category, we can see that the memory here is essentially uh, double what the uh, CPU specs are. Now, if you go back and compare that with these general purpose instance types, we see a different ratio of the CPU and memory. So looking at this M6i example here in the general purpose category, we can see we have this like four to one ratio of the uh, memory to vCPU. So for the examples that we were just looking at in the general purpose category, we have that four to one ratio of memory to vCPU. And in this compute optimized category here again, we had sort of that uh, two to one ratio. Now, if we take a look at the memory optimized category here, we'll pick the uh, R6i instance as an example. Now we can see the ratios change again. In this category, we're typically getting that uh, eight to one ratio of uh, you know, memory to uh, CPU. So these types of instances belonging to the memory optimized family would certainly be a better fit if your workload requires high memory requirements compared to compute capacity. Now, for fun, if we take a look at the uh, accelerated computing category, we'll look at this uh, P4 example here. And we can see in this case, we have uh, a new category of GPUs, where this instance type actually has eight of those, 96 vCPUs, and 1,152 gigabytes of memory. I hope it's clear that this example here is a you know, highly specialized use case for machine learning and high-performance computing and likely not a great fit for your uh, general purpose web hosting types of applications. Now, I recommend you uh, go through these instance types families and just get familiar with them a bit further. Uh, you can also check out uh, this other page here um, in the documentation that goes into a bit more details about the different sizes and instance types. And that concludes our overview here on the Amazon EC2 instance families. 
Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. So hopefully you went through that quick primer on uh, serverless and have that bird's eye view of the concept and also uh, functions of a service. Um, so we'll build on that a bit more here and uh, you know put some more context around this by discussing the AWS Lambda service. So AWS Lambda is the serverless event-driven service that allows us to execute code without having to worry about the underlying virtual machine instances. Now for a comparison, Let's recall the EC2 service quickly. We can launch and run virtual machine instances in the cloud to provide us that desired compute capacity for our workload. But with these instances, we likely need to do some uh, maintenance with them, uh, perhaps do OS updates and security patches. And you know they're always running until we shut them down or you know some automated process does that for us like uh, auto scaling groups to, to scale back in. Uh, in contrast, AWS Lambda is designed for executing short-lived code functions, and you're largely billed for the just the time it takes to execute that code. Now, there's other factors around billing for the AWS Lambda service, which we won't get into for this lesson scope here, but the bulk of the costs are just for the execution time of running your code. AWS Lambda is also great at these event-driven application architectures, where you can essentially you know, stitch hundreds of these Lambda functions together and each one is basically a decoupled, massively scalable piece of the puzzle. As an example, if we have some uh, type of website checkout page, uh, maybe it's some you know, special holiday sale event and it starts at a specific time, you could have 100,000 checkout orders all happen at midnight. You know, with a serverless event-driven application design, you may have a variety of specific Lambda functions to handle uh, different aspects of that checkout process. Uh, like new account signups, um, input form validations, uh, shipping calculations based on uh, you know the addresses input, tax calculations, the uh, payment processing, and uh, you know that might trigger some internal ordering processing steps to the warehouse, uh, sending notices to the courier to you know pick up the package and so on. Now again, this is just a high level example here, but each one of these steps can be scaled independently and scaled a lot. With AWS Lambda, you can you know, run theoretically infinite numbers of these functions in parallel to handle you know, a wide number of scenarios at huge scales. Okay, so you should have an idea now about the concept of serverless and that the AWS Lambda service provides this serverless compute service from AWS. With AWS Lambda, you're not concerned with the underlying virtual machine setup and maintenance. You simply provide the code you need to execute and the Lambda function executes it. The AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate and other AWS exams start to dive into this wonderful world of possibilities with serverless and AWS Lambda. Uh, I'd encourage you to continue your AWS journey after your cloud practitioner exam focus to start diving deeper into this service and many more. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we'll be covering the Amazon Elastic Container Service called ECS. Now, you should have a basic understanding about containers from my uh, YouTube video, uh, just going over the basic uh, container concepts, but the scope of that video didn't really get into any of the actual uh, setup aspects. Uh, but you should understand that just like using VMs, there's a lot of overhead involved with creating uh, and launching containers, uh, and then setting up the networking to uh, route traffic to the containers. Uh, and also keeping up with the uh, scaling of possibly, you know, hundreds or thousands of containers uh, in and out to uh, keep up with changing workload demands. And also, how do you deploy uh, updates of new container images? Containers provide us with a lot of these benefits, uh, and they're hugely popular. But with all this admin burden of uh, setting them up and operating them at, uh, you know, any type of production scale, containers present us with a lot of challenges we need to deal with. So to help solve many of these challenges, uh, container orchestration services exist to take advantage of the benefits and flexibility of containers, but still allow us to more easily configure their setup, uh, networking, uh, doing all the image updates, and uh, scaling the container services. The Amazon Elastic Container Service, or ECS, is one such container orchestration service to help us out with all this. ECS is a container orchestration service that lets you manage all of your containers in a much more manageable way, especially at large scale. We don't need to dive 
you know, too deep for uh, the scope of the course and exam here. But the basic idea with ECS is that you create a ECS cluster. This cluster defines the underlying compute resources the cluster would use to uh, run the containers on. And, you know, we would typically leverage uh, Fargate or EC2 instances for this. Then you'd create these task definitions, uh, which basically let us define our containers that we want to run. We can tell it like what kind of container image to use, how much CPU and memory the container should be allocated, then maybe what storage uh, resources it should connect to. And it also has a number of ways we can automatically scale our containers and the uh, compute layer of our ECS cluster based on changing workload demands. Now, ECS is a container orchestration service built by AWS for customers to use. And this ECS service only runs inside of AWS. It isn't a uh, you know open source tool you can leverage outside of AWS. Now, another aspect to keep in mind is that there's no cost to this uh, container orchestration management layer that uh, ECS provides us. The ECS service itself doesn't cost us anything to use, but the underlying resources that make up the resulting ECS cluster do. So we'd still have to pay for things like our EC2 instances, the EBS storage volumes, and you know any other related services and those uh, data transfer costs. Now, as an alternative option to ECS, there's a popular open source container orchestration service called Kubernetes. Now, using this free open source Kubernetes service can come with its own set of challenges to deploy uh, and maintain that container management layer as you typically have to do this all yourself and have the expertise to configure it all properly. Uh, and this is unlike ECS, which is a fully managed AWS service. However, given the popularity of Kubernetes in recent years, AWS has packaged up Kubernetes as a managed service offering as well to help avoid some of that deployment and maintenance overhead with doing this all on your own. This AWS managed Kubernetes service is called Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service or EKS. So in concept, the Amazon ECS service and the managed Kubernetes service, EKS, uh, serve similar goals around simplifying the container orchestration task involved with running uh, containerized applications at scale. Now, there's a lot of pros and cons to think about, uh, you know, choosing between EKS or the ECS option. And all this is well outside the scope of the uh, exam, but uh, just be aware that these two options exist. AWS provides us with these two great container management services to choose from depending on our use cases and business requirements. So that's it for this quick lesson on the Amazon Elastic Container Service uh, with, I guess, a bit of a teaser on the EKS service as well. We'll be actually diving into the EKS service in the next video, so I'll see you there. everyone, welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be looking at the Amazon Elastic Kubernetes service called EKS. Now, we just took a look at the Amazon uh, ECS service, which is the AWS managed service, to help with your container orchestration needs. Uh, but here we'll be exploring the popular Kubernetes alternative uh, packaged up in a managed service itself called EKS. So Kubernetes is a very popular tool originally developed by Google and then provided to the world as a free open source software solution for containerized application orchestration. Now, similar to ECS, Kubernetes provides that management layer for your containerized workloads. Now, the Kubernetes service itself can be deployed and hosted in a number of ways, and the configuration flexibility makes Kubernetes very powerful to manage everything from small personal container projects to uh, powering some of the largest applications in the world. All these options and configurations, though, require a lot of expertise to ensure this uh, management layer is highly available, uh, secure, has all the proper access controls in place, and is set up according to a number of best practices. Then there's the operational overhead. Uh, there's a frequent release cycle with this Kubernetes project, driven by a very large and active community of contributors that help to make constant improvements and innovations with the service. Then there's the operational overhead. There's a frequent release cycle with this Kubernetes project. Uh, it's driven by a very large and active community of contributors that help to make constant improvements and innovations. So you'd need to frequently update your Kubernetes cluster with the latest releases to ensure you have the latest security and feature enhancements. 
operating Kubernetes can take some specialized skill sets to ensure you, the uh, environment is set up and properly maintained. Amazon EKS uses the core open source Kubernetes project and packages it up as a managed service for customers to use. So now instead of having to uh, figure out all the deployment configurations and best practices, uh, and also handle all the frequent upgrades from scratch on your own, you can quickly get up and running with a Kubernetes cluster by using EKS. Now recall that ECS does not cost anything to run that uh, container management layer. You just pay for the compute and the other resources that make up the cluster itself, like the uh, EC2 instances that your containers would run on and so forth. However, with EKS, since AWS has taken on the heavy lifting of bundling up the uh, open source Kubernetes service and uh, largely maintaining the entire management layer for you, there's a small hourly operational cost with using the EKS managed service. Now, for some very small organizations with limited budgets or uh, you know, maybe your personal projects, the cost overhead of EKS may persuade you to use the ECS service instead. Now, I mentioned this in the last video, but there's a lot of pros and cons to either option that uh, are out of the scope of this video and the uh, course here. But with the EKS option, you're paying for this managed Kubernetes orchestration layer on top of the compute and other resources that make up your EKS cluster. With ECS, that management layer does not cost you anything. So as a quick recap here, Amazon ECS is the AWS built managed service for managing your container workloads. And this only runs on AWS but there's no cost to the ECS service itself. You just pay for the other resources used within the cluster, like your uh, EC2 host or Fargate compute capacity. Then with EKS, this is the free open source software that we can run basically anywhere, uh, inside or outside of AWS, but there can be a lot of heavy lifting with the deployment, uh, configuration and maintenance of the service. So instead of doing that heavy lifting yourself, you can pay a small hourly fee to use the AWS managed version of Kubernetes instead. Then on top of this cost to use the EKS service, you still have that same compute and other resource layer costs similar to ECS. Now I'll provide you with a few optional links for you to review if you'd like to dive deeper into ECS and EKS further, but that's a wrap for our overview of the AWS managed container orchestration services. So I'll see you in the next videos. Welcome back. It's time to dive into EC2 autoscaling groups. Now we had these autoscaling groups or ESGs pop up in a few of our lesson discussions already, but let's take a further look at these in isolation to dive a bit deeper. Now we've learned about the flexibility benefits of the AWS cloud, especially with the EC2 service. We can deploy thousands of servers in a matter of minutes to adjust to growing workload demands, and we can just as easily uh, terminate those instances when they're not needed to save costs. But when you're at that scale of needing hundreds or thousands of EC2 instances uh, spread across tens or perhaps you know, hundreds of different application workloads in an organization, you can imagine having to keep track of all these instances and just the you know, sheer effort involved with manually keeping an eye on your workload performance metrics, uh, and then having to adjust the amount of instances up and down all the time to keep that ideal balance uh, you know, of maintaining your minimum performance levels for your application to keep your workload healthy, uh, but not having, you know, excess EC2 instances where their capacity is, you know, just not adding any value and it's just extra resources and, you know, again, extra costs involved. This is where autoscaling groups swoop in to save the day. Autoscaling groups act like the accordion for your capacity needs. You know, it's the instrument that helps scale out by adding more EC2 instances to keep up with the uh, growing low demands or, you know, scale back in by terminating these EC2 instances to match, you know, the de decrease in low demands for your applications. The autoscaling groups are one of the, you know, main tools that AWS customers can use to help save on compute costs in the cloud. They can help ensure you're running at the, you know, optimal compute capacity all the time and not spending money on wasted resources just sitting idle. This is also a huge differentiator compared to the traditional IT days with our own physical data centers. This concept of autoscaling is simply not possible with the same type of speed and flexibility offered here. With data centers, you need to buy and operate enough server capacity for that peak load demand, and it may take you know, weeks or months to scale out for increased capacity needs. Then if you know, that demand decreases, you're stuck with potentially hundreds of expensive servers 
sitting there doing nothing but making heat. There's a tremendous amount of OPEX tied up with this traditional IT approach and the capacity planning game always ends up being a losing battle. You're rushing to play catch up with increased demands. Uh, you want to avoid that situation again. So you add some buffer to your next server order. Uh, so then you have that breathing room in case that load increases even further. Uh, and then you either, you know, repeat the cycle over and over, or if that demand decreases, you're sitting on tons of expensive servers, adding no value to the business. So let's talk about some of the core functions of these auto scaling groups known as ASGs. First, they let us define the type of instances within the ASG. We can essentially tell the ASG the details of what servers need to be there for our workload, like what type of instance types they need to be. We basically define the you know, cookie cutter shape and the ASG stamps out more of the same cookies as needed, uh, or again, eats them to get rid of them. Now, another important feature is the auto recovery capabilities an ASG provides. If we have one of our instances or a number of them go offline for whatever reason, the ASG will automatically trigger the launch of new instances to replace them. How cool is that? Seriously. So if something happens on the AWS side and the physical server that our EC2 virtual machine instance runs on, uh, you know, has some type of issue and our instance becomes unavailable, or if we have some type of application level crash within our software running on it, the ASGs can replace these servers very quickly to maintain that optimal capacity level we desire. Then these ASGs give us some options on how we want to scale our capacity within these groups. We can say that I want full control over the scaling operations of my EC2 resources and pick a manual scaling option here. We trade off the automated scale in and scale out benefits of an ASG, but in turn, we have full control over this activity. Even with this full manual approach, we still get the auto recovery benefits of ASGs. Now, we can also use some dynamic scaling options to automate that scaling process for us. Now, there's also a scheduled scaling option that can add or decrease capacity based on a certain time and different days of the week. Now, this is helpful if we have a fairly stable demand curve at different times of the day. We can use scheduled scaling to proactively scale out our compute capacity to meet the expected demand so that our instances are all launched and ready to serve traffic just prior to the demand increase. Now, we can also leverage something called target tracking. As an example, uh, let's keep it simple and pick our instance CPU utilization as our metric of interest. With this target tracking, we can say we want to keep our CPU level at uh, perhaps 70% as an example to you know, make good use of our instance's capacity and keep our application workload healthy. With this target tracking method, the ASG will average out the CPU utilization of the entire ASG group and scale it in or out to keep the average around that 70% mark. Now, if we have a sudden load increase and our average CPU hits 78%, the ASG may add three more instances to the group to help balance the load better and get the overall average on all the instances to 70% again. We define that target, uh, that 70% CPU utilization in our example, and the ASG will dynamically add or remove capacity to keep things as close as possible to that target metric as it can. Now, again, we used CPU here for the example, but the target metric can be really any type of custom host or application level performance metric that's the best reflection of demand for your workload in these instances. Then there are simple and step scaling options. Now, there's a lot of configuration variations possible within these options, but the idea is that we define the scaling action behavior and thresholds here. Now, between simple scaling and step scaling, step scaling is the more modern option to pick. The idea with step scaling is that you define scaling step adjustments based on you know, the metric that you define. When that actual value of that metric hits one of our thresholds, the ASG scales out by a predefined amount. So as an example, if we were you know, 10% over our metric value, we may want to add two instances to our ASG. But if we're 20% over, we may want to take a more aggressive step here to quickly address the load change. So we'll perhaps add six instances. Now, if we're 30% over, maybe we add 10 instances. And the same applies for scaling back in. We can configure the logic of how the ASG shrinks back down again. Now, target tracking is the easier choice. But again, we don't have that control over the scaling behavior. By default, it will try to scale out as fast as it can to keep the ASG load at your target metric value. And then it takes a bit more conservative scale in approach to you know, bring things back down again. If you know your workload and traffic patterns very well, and they're somewhat predictable, 
and you also have those well-defined and tested scaling metric values, the step scaling approach can have its advantages where you can more finely tune the scaling behavior to maximize your cost savings. However, you may find that the target tracking approach is reliable enough for your needs, and it's a million times better than having to scale in and out manually each time. Now, yet another option I'll mention quickly here is the predictive scaling option. To me, this is like a more intelligent scheduled scaling method. What this predictive scaling option does here is use our historical load data that AWS captures in a service called CloudWatch, and then does a machine learning based analysis of this data. It essentially uses our past load data and makes a statistical best guess of what our load will be at a given point in time. Now, the more consistent our traffic patterns are over the course of multiple days or weeks or months, the more accurate the predictions this option can make for us. So the benefit here is that instead of us having to do that guessing ourselves and set up predefined auto-scaling events to add capacity at certain times of the day, we can now rely on the AWS machine learning models to use our historical data and make these often much more accurate scaling decisions for us. Now, we have all these EC2 instances being added or removed from our ASG to handle some type of workload traffic, but how does the client side, uh, basically that requesting side trying to use our service, know about this additional capacity or what happens when the ASG scales in? This is often where we'd want to use the power of an elastic load balancer for a central endpoint for our service. The ASG would then contain all our EC2 capacity that would handle these requests. The beautiful thing with using uh, an ELB along with the ASG is that you can simply attach your ASG to the ELB through the configuration options. And then the instances in the ASG automatically register and deregister themselves from the ELB. So in a scale out scenario, uh, say 10 new instances get added to our ASG, those 10 new instances will automatically be registered with the ELB, basically saying, hey, look at me, uh, give me some work to do and the ELB will start directing some of that incoming traffic to those new hosts. Now, like most AWS services and features, there's a lot more to discover here. There's a lot of configuration options available to us to tune all these target metric values for our workload, uh, the scaling behaviors of the ASG, and how the ELB and ASG interact with each other through health checks and other options. But I'll stop here for this ASG overview lesson, but you should have a good understanding now of the purpose and power of these auto-scaling groups especially when used in combination with the Elastic Load Balancer to build highly resilient, self-healing, and flexible compute resources for AWS workloads. See you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll take a look at the Elastic Load Balancer service of AWS. In our previous lesson, where we looked at the AWS availability zones, we had a quick preview of what a load balancer can help us with in terms of high availability. But let's take a more focused look specifically at the Elastic Load Balancer service known as the ELB. So what is a load balancer and why would we even need this thing? Well, let's take a look. So to use a simple example here again, Let's say we have a user accessing our website. Um, she would go through uh, you know, the internet here and the browser request would eventually get to our web server here. The web server would then do its magic and send the response back to the user. And the user may see that response in terms of uh, you know, perhaps a, a payment being processed. But what happens now when there's uh, you know, maybe hundreds or thousands of new users? Now we could have potentially thousands of connections coming through the internet and all hitting our web server. Now, as our user base grows, at some point, this server here will run into some kind of uh, resource limit. You know, that could be, uh, you know, CPU, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, memory, or even, uh, you know, networking. You know, once that server reaches its, uh, you know, limits, it would cause uh, impact to the site and uh, user experience. So we definitely want to make sure we don't have any performance problems for the site. So what's one option we can do in this situation? Well, we looked at this briefly in another lesson about uh, vertical scaling versus horizontal scaling. Again, with the vertical scaling, we could add more CPU or memory to this uh, particular server here so that this uh, you know, physical server or perhaps a virtual machine could process more of this traffic. Now, there can be two main problems with this approach. Eventually, you're going to hit some sort of limit for how much uh, capacity you can add to that single host or instance. So in AWS, 
you may eventually get to the point where you're limited by the available instance sizes, where you simply just don't have a choice uh, for adding additional CPU or memory. Now, the other big issue here is we have one single server handling all our requests. We certainly haven't uh, designed for failure in this situation. If the single host or virtual machine goes down or something happens, our entire site or you know, business operations could be down for potentially hours. So a better approach here might be doing something called horizontal scaling. We're adding more of the same servers to our infrastructure. So magically, we've added two more servers here to our environment. Now, the idea here is we want to start to send some of the traffic to these other new servers. We want to reduce some of the load coming through to uh, you know, our original one and start balancing that across to these new ones. In a perfect world, we'd have you know, one third of our traffic going to each of these servers. Now the trick becomes, how do you have some users go through the internet and access this server, and then have other users make sure that they use other servers? You basically need some sort of mechanism that can balance all this traffic across the servers. So at a high level, this is one of the challenges a load balancer is trying to solve for us. So if we add a load balancer or a elastic load balancer in the case of AWS here, how does this help us out? Well, this load balancer is now going to act as the central endpoint for all our incoming traffic sources. So our users would make the request through the internet and they would access our elastic load balancer in this case as that central endpoint. The load balancer then connects to uh, you know, any number of backend services or targets that would actually uh, you know, process the request and you know, respond back. The load balancer can then connect to uh, you know, any number of these backend services here. And the server, again, would process the user's requests and return the response back to the user. So with this load balancer involved, our infrastructure is in a lot better spot. If our traffic demands continue to grow, we can you know, keep adding more and more servers here to horizontally scale our infrastructure. These new servers would connect to the load balancer, and our traffic, again, could be balanced to these new additions. So again, a great thing with this approach, if something were to happen to you know, this server here, we still have the load balancer as the central connection point for our users. All these scaling activities are largely transparent to the customers. Now, in addition to balancing load, as their name implies, load balancers can serve uh, many other functions as well. Now, most of the time, we'd want our website traffic that would travel through the internet to be encrypted. Now, as a very simple example, we'd have some sort of uh, you know, encryption key, all our users' traffic would essentially be scrambled now so that if it was intercepted over the internet, the data would basically be unusable. And that encrypted data would be delivered to the servers. They would also have another uh, decryption key. And that server would then perform the somewhat computationally heavy task of decrypting that traffic. Now, as an example, let's say our web application here is more uh, memory hungry versus uh, CPU hungry. So we need more uh, memory or RAM on these uh, servers here versus uh, our CPU. Now in our other lesson on instance types, I uh, hope you can see how this all ties together here, but you can get an idea that we might want those memory optimized family of instances for this situation. So we'd have the higher uh, memory bias compared to the uh, CPU. But now because our website traffic's encrypted here, we have the CPU intensive task of decrypting all this traffic. The instance types we pick for our web application here aren't ideal to handle these kind of heavy CPU intensive operations. So one option is we could maybe switch these out for perhaps uh, general purpose instances where we have a better balance of CPU to memory. But in that case, we might need to add more instances to this horizontally scaled pool of servers to handle the you know, memory requirements of our application still. Another benefit these elastic load balancers can help us out with is offloading this decryption activity. So instead of having the you know, decryption key on our servers, we would then place it on our elastic load balancer. In this case, our user's traffic would be encrypted through the internet. It would hit our load balancer. The load balancer would then distribute traffic to its uh, pool of servers here as usual. However, since that traffic has been decrypted here at the load balancer, the data now being sent from the load balancer to the servers is essentially plain text. So the servers no longer have to perform that uh, you know, decryption activity. So again, the benefit here is our load balancer is now handling that computationally heavy decryption activity. We no longer need to worry about the additional computational overhead on our backend servers. We can leave those to perform their intended task of running our web application without the additional overhead of the encryption processing. Another benefit of the load balancers is how they work with auto scaling groups. So back to our example here of our load balancer distributing our incoming traffic to all these servers. 
how do we actually know when we need to, uh, you know, maybe add additional servers or perhaps certain times a day the traffic on our site decreases? We might wa actually want to shut down a bunch of these servers to save costs. Now, we touched on this in other lessons, but we can use the power of a auto-scaling group to uh, dynamically scale in and scale out our capacity here. The elastic load balancers can perform what are called health checks on these servers. And those checks can be on a number of metrics, such as, uh, you know, CPU, uh, server load, or perhaps your own uh, custom application metrics. Then using these metrics, the load balancer can make intelligent decisions about where to route traffic to, to best distribute that incoming load. And with that, that concludes our lesson here on our first look at load balancers and the Amazon Elastic Load Balancer known as the ELB. Hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back again. We're progressing nicely through this uh, technology section here. So let's take a look at some of the core storage services offered by AWS. Businesses today rely on data more than ever, and the amount of data being captured by organizations keeps increasing at a crazy pace. Company data, uh, user data, system logs, uh, application logs, you name it. Uh, we need a variety of storage options to use depending on the type of data we're trying to store and how we'll actually be using that data. So in the next few videos, we'll be taking a look at some of these uh, main storage service offerings by AWS. So let's get going. Hello and welcome back. In this video, we're gonna be taking a look at the Amazon Simple Storage Service. Uh, now that's a lot of S words, uh, three of them to be exact. Uh, so we actually call the service S3. Now data is the fuel that powers today's modern businesses. Uh, and there's endless types of data organizations need to store. Um, everything from documents, videos, spreadsheets, uh, logs, uh, user data, application data, um, and all this data can be tremendously useful to store uh, and later analyze and help you understand your business and your customers, uh, make better product decisions, and uh, you know how to best serve your customers. Organizations today need a highly reliable and essentially unlimited way to store all these growing mountains of data. Uh, and this is where the S3 service can come and help us out. Now, S3 takes a bit of a different storage approach to what you uh, may be thinking of comparing it to your uh, typical laptop or computer hard drive. Uh, these are typically block storage devices that live inside your personal computers. So that PDF file you save uh, is basically chopped up into chunks of data. Uh, and these chunks are stored within the data blocks that your hard drive is configured into. The operating system does the magic here of managing uh, what blocks get uh, written to and uh, how to get the best use out of your drive capacity and also keep track of what uh, blocks actually make up the file once it's stored to disk. Now, if you make an edit in file, uh, generally you're just updating the blocks that would have the changed data in them. Now, S3 differs in that it's an object-based storage system. So rather than the data being written to some storage media as a bunch of blocks, the entire file is one single thing, uh, an object. S3 gives us tremendous flexibility in the uh, types of data we want to store. It doesn't really care what that file type really is. It treats the file as an independent object. Uh, we can provide a bunch of our own information about that object to describe the file further uh, or other important information we may want to associate it with it called metadata. We can pretty much store any type of data as objects in S3. Anything from a zero byte file where maybe we only have some type of metadata reference to it, uh, but no actual object data, uh, all the way up to five terabytes for a single object. Now as AWS customers, if we store data in S3, we wanna be sure it stays there. Uh, like what good is the service gonna be if the data becomes corrupted somehow and lost forever? Well. S3 is a very durable storage solution. AWS provides an 11 nines durability service level metric for this S3 service. Now to put this in perspective, let's take a look at an old AWS blog post where they break this down a bit. This gives us a bit of a more real world example of what this 11 nines of durability actually means for us. So from this blog post, it goes on to say that if we store 10,000 objects into the S3 standard tier of the service, over the span of 10 million years, only one of these 10,000 objects may be lost. And this level of durability is crazy to me. 
If you think about traditional data centers, even with very large IT budgets and top of the line storage systems, it's extremely hard to come even close to this level of data durability that S3 offers us. Now we mentioned with block storage that if you edit a file, you're likely just rewriting the data of uh, those particular blocks that had the changed information. With objects, however, you can't edit them. You'd have to upload a new version of the updated object to replace the original one. Now, for some use cases, you may always want to have a copy of the changes of an object. So S3 also offers object versioning capabilities. So now if you update an object, uh, the original is still saved along with the other updated versions if you have multiple changes to that object. So your object in S3 is always the latest change version you uploaded last, but if some reason you needed to reference or restore a previous version instead, you always have that full version history at your fingertips. This versioning is also very helpful to protect against uh, human errors. If the object is deleted by someone and you have versioning enabled, that object is basically just hidden instead of actually deleted. Uh, you're using what's called a delete marker, and it essentially just makes the object behave as if it's deleted, uh, but it can be later restored if needed or recovered if it was accidentally deleted. Now with S3, we store all our objects into something called a bucket. It's uh, basically a just big logical container that we throw all our objects into. And you can create lots of these buckets to help organize your objects however you need. The buckets also become important when we get down to access controls. Uh, S3 provides us with a number of ways to prevent access to our buckets and the objects within them. S3 also gives us the flexibility to reduce our storage costs depending on our business needs and use cases of our objects we're storing there. So that 11.9's durability stuff is essentially the default S3 tier called S3 standard. But maybe we don't need that much durability. Or maybe these objects will rarely ever get used. We could be just trying to archive some data for compliance purposes. We might need to keep this information for a long time, like 10 years, but have no real need to use it on a regular basis. Like maybe we would access it uh, once every two to three years for uh, an audit or some type of investigation uh, where we'll need to dig through those objects. But on a uh, regular day-to-day -day perspective, this data is not being used. So what if we could trade off some of this durability or quick access to the objects for even further cost savings? And this is where different tiers of this S3 service come into play. So other than S3 standard, there's a number of options to fit our use cases. Now let's take a quick look at the Amazon docs here to see what all these S3 tier service options look like for us. Uh, they have a great layout and it highlights some of the example use cases for each one. All right, so we're going to look at the Amazon S3 storage classes here. And first up, of course, we have S3 standard. Now this is going to be for objects that we access a couple times a month and we need to access them quite quickly. Here again, we have those 11 nines of durability. And it's also designed for four nines of availability. Now quickly, what's the difference between these two? So durability in this context is more the measurement of the possibility of losing your data. Now again, going back to our example, if you had 10,000 different objects stored in S3 based on this 11 nines of durability, it would take about 10 million years for the possibility of losing one of those objects. So again, most of the storage classes within the S3 service are very highly durable. So quickly again, durability is a measurement of the potential of uh, losing data. Now this availability column speaks more to your ability to access the objects in S3. So as you can see, the access is a lot lower than the 11 nines of uh, durability. Now basically what this means is that uh, throughout a year, you may have a few minutes uh, due to upgrades or uh, different network issues that AWS may experience that you may not have access to uh, your objects temporarily but the objects themselves are still very safely stored because of that durability level. Now quickly, we have the availability zone column, just showing the uh, number of availability zones that your objects are replicated across. So with S3 standard, your objects are replicated uh, at a minimum of three availability zones. Now the minimum storage duration, we won't get into uh, too much here, 
but uh, some of the storage tiers have a minimum duration. The objects have to stay within that tier before you can move it to a different one. Now the minimum billable object size here, some of the tiers will charge you uh, for 128 kilobytes of storage, even if the object you add is a lot smaller than that. So if you had a small 10 uh, kilobyte object here, uh, you would still be charged for the uh, 128 kilobyte storage cost for that object. Now this might not seem like a big deal, but if you do have, uh, you know, tens of thousands of very small objects, maybe just a few kilobytes in size, with these uh, infrequently accessed uh, storage tiers here, it's definitely something to do some calculations about to uh, figure out if using these storage tiers would make sense. For certain use cases, the S3 standard may be actually the uh, less expensive option. You'd pay a little bit more for the storage for S3 standard versus uh, the infrequently accessed tiers, but because you have a lot of small objects, you're at a minimum paying for that 128 kilobyte size. So depending on the difference between the actual object size and this minimum here, multiplied across uh, perhaps thousands of objects, there can actually be a lot of waste there. So you actually end up paying more for using these uh, lower tier services versus the uh, standard one. All right, so now that we have a better idea of some of the columns and what they represent here, we'll jump down to the next storage class, the S3 standard and frequently accessed or IA. So here this is very similar to S3 standard. We still get the 11 nines of durability, but this is meant for objects that we may access uh, just once a month. In contrast to S3 standard where we're accessing the objects uh, more than once a month. Now this tier may be good for something like uh, backups. We want those to be uh, again highly durable, but our chances of using them may actually be quite low. So we can save a bit of money by using this infrequently accessed tier. Now for this example though, pay attention to the availability here. S3 standard infrequently accessed tier gives us slightly lower availability at three nines. So throughout the course of a year, our risk of not being able to access uh, our objects might be a bit higher with the uh, infrequently accessed tier. Now we may be saving a bit of money for our uh, backups by using this tier, but because of the lower availability, they may not be accessible in those critical times when we need to restore something. Now, 3.9's availability is still very good. Some type of uh, service interruption that would cause your objects to be inaccessible at the exact same time you need to actually restore something or uh, quite low, but it is certainly a risk to consider. Now, another important thing is the per gigabyte retrieval fee for accessing your objects in this tier. So again, this tier is designed for objects that you only need to access about once a month. If for some reason there are some objects that you need to access, uh, let's say 10 times a month, and the objects are maybe uh, 20 gigabytes in size, this retrieval fee here can cost you more than if you would have just uh, placed those objects in S3 standard. Now we'll jump down to the S3 intelligent tiering. Now this storage class is actually pretty interesting. And this is great if maybe we have a bucket that uh, a lot of different teams use within our organization. Maybe we're part of a cloud infrastructure team and uh, create a bucket for different groups to use. But we may not necessarily know the use cases or what types of objects or types of data that would be stored within it. And we don't know how frequently the objects may be accessed by all these different teams and people. So it'd be very hard for us to pick the best storage class to use. Now with S3 intelligent tiering, it essentially monitors your objects. And then based on the patterns it detects of uh, how frequently those objects are being used, it'll actually transition some of your objects between the different storage class tiers. Now because of all this monitoring and automation that AWS is providing us behind the scenes for this intelligent tiering storage class, there's a small fee per object. Now because this charge is for each object, again if you had tens or hundreds of thousands of very small objects within your bucket, the intelligent tiering storage class may not make sense. In some situations, again, the S3 standard storage class may actually be a lower cost option if you have a lot of smaller objects. Okay, I'm just going to clear off some of my scribbles here, and we'll continue to look at some of the other storage classes. So next up, we have the S3 one zone infrequently accessed. Now, this is almost exactly the same as the other infrequently accessed tier, except that we have only one availability zone durability. Now this is almost exactly like the other infrequently accessed storage tier, except our data is only now in one availability zone. And that's an important thing to consider here, that this storage tier is not resilient to the loss of an availability zone. 
along with that, we're also sacrificing a bit of the availability as well. Now, this storage tier is great for something where you have uh, data that you can regenerate. So maybe you have uh, image files stored in S3 standard. But then from that original image, you might make uh, thumbnails or convert it into different uh, image file types. The thumbnails and other processed images can be stored in this uh, one zone and frequently accessed storage tier to save costs. And then if something were to go wrong with the uh, availability zone where your objects were stored in, you could uh, recreate them. You'd still have the original image in the S3 bucket. Uh, you could trigger something to regenerate the uh, thumbnails and other uh, images that were pr uh, processed after. So again, the S3 one zone in frequently accessed storage tier is designed for the recreatable and frequently accessed data. Now we start diving into the Glacier storage classes. So these S3 Glacier tiers are great for archive data. They're objects that you need to keep for a very long time and don't typically need to access them very frequently. The S3 Glacier tiers are extremely cost effective for long-term storage. And there's a lot of options here based on how fast we need to retrieve this archive data. So for the S3 Glacier uh, instant retrieval here, it's maybe data we need to access uh, again, uh, sort of once a quarter with the uh, typical millisecond access times. Then we have the S3 Glacier flexible retrieval, again, for objects that we may access once a year and retrieval times of uh, minutes to hours. I'm just gonna clean this up here and then we'll look at the remaining storage classes. Now, sort of the last storage class here for S3 is the S3 Glacier Deep Archive. Now this is a very low cost storage option for uh, very long lived archive data. That's important to note here. This again is for data that you access uh, less than once a year, uh, but you have retrieval times of up to hours. So if you need quick access to your objects, the Deep Archive is certainly not a tier that uh, you'd want to pick for that use case. Now last and kind of least is the Reduced Redundancy Storage. This is sort of a legacy storage tier that's not recommended to use anymore. The better alternative now being the S3 one zone and frequently accessed storage tier. So that about covers it for our Amazon S3 storage class run through. I hope this was helpful to just showcase all the different storage classes within the S3 service. Now we quickly saw that intelligent tiering option for those uh, unknown and unpredictable storage and access needs. But what if we know what our data is and what our use cases are? and how that data would be used over time. Well, instead of having that slight cost overhead of using that intelligent tiering option uh, to make that automated best guesses for us, we can use something called lifecycle policies here. So as an example, maybe we have uh, database backups. Maybe we store these in S3 standard initially, as within that first month of the backup being created, it's the most likely when we'd uh, need to actually restore from that backup. And when we need to restore a database, it's usually some critical issue that we need to fix fast. So we want instant access to the back file object. We can't wait hours to retrieve it if our production environment is down and customers are complaining. Then maybe after 30 days pass, the chances of using that backup are a lot lower. Uh, we'd have more recent backups at that point that we'd likely restore from uh, rather than this one that's now 30 days old but maybe we still want to keep it just in case. Um, and we may also have some type of compliance reasons that we need to keep this backup data for uh, perhaps like a number of years. But all these backups increase our storage costs. So after 30 days, we can have a lifecycle policy move that backup object to a different, less expensive S3 tier automatically. So our lifecycle policy configuration may look something like this. We'd have our backups in S3 standard for up to 30 days. Uh, for that initial durable and instant access option here in case we need to quickly restore a database from it. Then after 30 days, it transitions that object into S3 and frequently access storage tier. We don't think we need to use the backups past 30 days, but just in case it's there for us when we need it and uh, we're able to reduce our storage costs as well. Then after 90 days, the chances of needing that backup at that point are basically zero but we still need to keep this data around for our uh, regulatory compliance reasons. Here, our lifecycle policy may move the uh, objects older than 90 days into something like a Glacier Deep Archive. When you have these very long-term storage requirements for stuff you won't need to access much, the S3 Glacier tier should come to mind here. 
Basically, if you need to freeze your data on ice for you know many months or years, storing this type of data in S3 Glacier can significantly reduce your storage costs compared to S3 Standard and other storage options. Now on this audit topic a bit, if you have other data that you need to store for compliance reasons, you can also use Glacier Vaults and Vault Locks to further protect this data. You can put your objects in the Glacier Vault with a Vault Lock and effectively prevent against changes to the data to help with your compliance requirements. Now that should do it for our overview here of the Amazon S3 service. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be going over some of the storage options that can go along with your EC2 instances, focusing in on the Elastic Block Storage or EBS. Now in the S3 overview, we learned that S3 is an object-based storage solution. But this object-based storage isn't always the uh, best solution for many applications and workloads. Uh, many times we need block level storage options to meet our application and performance requirements. Now we touched on this quickly in the S3 video, but let's refresh your memory a bit on block storage. So block storage is the type of storage you're likely using with your laptop or desktop computer. Your storage drive is divided up into blocks and your files are written into these blocks. Now when you need to modify a file in this case, you're generally not replacing the whole file. So if we had a 500 megabyte text document, and updated one word in it, just the block that would contain the part of the file stored on the disk would be changed. Now, in contrast with something like S3 object storage, that same file or object would need to be fully replaced again, requiring us to upload the entire 500 megabyte file object again that contained uh, our changes. So for a lot of use cases like operating system file systems, and applications that need fast access to perform reads and writes of frequently changing uh, files uh, and many databases, uh, block storage is the obvious choice here. Now, before we get into EBS, let's look at a local storage option called instance store volumes that some EC2 instances can have depending on the instance type. Now, these instance store volumes are basically the logical block storage volume provided to your EC2 instance, and it's based off the physical storage of the server your EC2 virtual machine is actually running on. So this is perfect for needing fast read and writes to storage, as the physical storage is right on the same server your VM is on, so there's extremely low latency with the reading and writing of data from these instance store volumes. Now all this sounds great, but there's a catch. If we think back to how the EC2 service works at a data center level, our EC2 instance virtual machine can launch on any one of possibly thousands of physical servers that make up the hardware pool that supports our instance type we picked. But what if there's an issue with the physical server our VM is running on and we lose our instance? Or what if we don't need the instance for a few weeks and uh, terminate it to save some costs? What happens to our data stored on the instance store volumes? Well, it's gone forever. So any data that goes into an instance store volume is local to that specific physical server uh, hosting our instance. And if we stop our instance by our own intentional actions, or if there's a hardware issue and our instance is terminated, all of our data is wiped out. Instance store volumes are great for any type of data that you can easily regenerate. Uh, any type of temporary data or local caches can be a very good use case. Or if you have a pool of EC2 instances working together behind a load balancer and this data is replicated somehow across them where the loss of one of these instance store volumes doesn't really cause an impact, instance store volumes can be a great option for this temporary and frequently changing types of data storage scenarios. But what if you need your data to survive the stopping and starting of your EC2 instances and be resilient to the loss of a physical server? Well, this is where the Elastic Block Store, or EBS, comes to save the day. Now, EBS volumes are another form of these virtual block storage devices that our EC2 instances can use. But unlike the instance store volumes, with EBS, these storage devices are not backed by the physical server our instance runs on. Instead, they're backed by some type of AWS secret sauce, uh, physical storage equipment that you can attach to your EC2 instances through a high-performance network. 
All this means that your data stays persistent on the EBS storage volumes independent of your EC2 instance state or the physical hypervisor server that actually hosts it. So now you can stop your EC2 instances whenever you need and your EBS volume data uh, stays intact. Uh, then you can start up the EC2 instance again, uh, which will likely run on a different physical hypervisor server than it did before. And you just reattach the EBS volume again through the network. Then now your EC2 instance has access to all the data that was on it before it stopped. Now these EBS volumes are very much like the hard drives on your personal computer. Uh, any number of things can happen from a operating system level uh, or some application issue, uh, or of course, even human error, uh, all of which can lead to corrupted or deleted data. Now, EBS volumes provide us the ability to take these uh, point in time snapshots as backups of our EBS drives uh, that we can use to restore from or even create new EBS volumes altogether. Now, before we wrap this lesson up here, we have that super low latency but ephemeral instance store volumes available, where our data would disappear if the instances stop for whatever reason. Then we have those EBS volumes for the persistent storage option for a block storage that lives independently of our running instance. Each has their pros and cons, but here's the thing, you don't necessarily need to choose between them. You can actually combine instance store and EBS volumes with an EC2 instance. So you can put data that uh, you need persistent on EBS and then your temporary or cache type data on a instance store volume. You can also attach multiple EBS volumes depending on your needs. Now we won't get into it too much for this video here, but EBS provides a variety of storage types, uh, sizes, and performance configurations for you to pick from and tune based on your storage and usage requirements. Now, I'll include some of these additional links in the next lesson of the course if you want to get a quick overview of the different EBS storage options, uh, but they're a little outside the scope of the cloud practitioner exam here. I always encourage you to take the extra few minutes and overlearn and explore on your own uh, after the lessons just to deepen your understanding and build better uh, mental connections between the material you're learning. That little bit of extra time and effort at this level to overlearn these topics will certainly uh, serve you well on the job and certainly if you transition into future AWS certification goals. Um, as always, thanks for watching. Uh, keep going. You're doing great. And I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. Now we're progressing nicely through the technology domain of the course. And the next few lessons will be touching on uh, network services of AWS, uh, taking a look at the VPC or virtual private cloud, uh, different ways we can connect our private infrastructure into AWS through things like uh, Direct Connect and uh, DNS services like Route 53, and also touching on some security aspects on how we can secure our network through uh, using access control lists and uh, security groups as well. So stay tuned for the next few lessons and I uh, hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at the Amazon Virtual Private Cloud or VPC. Now, uh, Virtual Private Cloud or VPC is basically your uh, own private network in AWS. You can think of it as your own private virtual data center running within the AWS cloud. Now with VPCs, we create this logical uh, isolated private cloud and define an IP address range for it. Then within this VPC, we can deploy a number of uh, AWS services, things like our databases, uh, load balancers, uh, and of course our EC2 instances and Lambda functions, just to name a few. Now, as you start building out a variety of workload designs in AWS, you typically have the need to separate some of this network traffic. Uh, just like in a traditional data center, you may have a lot of different applications and workloads running within it uh, with different consumers of these services. So uh, some of these might be internal employees accessing uh, some marketing applications. Uh, then you may have your online storefront or some other publicly you know, internet facing users. Um, and we generally need ways to further separate our network and isolate uh, certain components or services. So within the VPC itself, 
we can create subnets to help uh, covering up the VPC further and better isolate and control our network traffic on AWS. Subnets have a, an especially important function within our VPCs as part of a control boundary that allows our AWS resources to be uh, completely private or have them exposed to the uh, public internet. Now, VPCs by themselves are isolated uh, logical network boundaries. And if we need to connect to resources uh, within the VPC uh, from somewhere outside of the VPC, like through the public internet, or perhaps from our office headquarters on our company network, we need something that can create a, basically a bridge between our VPC and these external networks. Uh, and this is where gateways come into play. We can use internet gateways to provide that, uh, basically the door between our VPC and public internet or virtual private gateways for the situations where we need to connect to other private networks like our corporate offices or on-premises data centers. Now for those private network connections, we can do site-to-site uh, -site VPN connections uh, between an office or uh, a data center to our VPC. And this provides us that encrypted data transfer over the internet to reach our VPC resources uh, from perhaps an office location as an example. Or similarly, we can have a client VPN connection where we have an encrypted VPN connection straight from our laptop if we're working remotely. Then there's the use cases where we may want to avoid sending traffic over the public internet to reach our VPC. Now, this may be to avoid the highly variable performance and latency of traffic across the public internet to reach our VPC. Or maybe we have sensitive data we're transmitting and uh, we have some type of regulatory or uh, company policy considerations where we can't send this data over the public internet, uh, even if it is encrypted. In these situations, we can use AWS Direct Connect, which is where we can create a private uh, networking connection between our company network and our AWS VPC. Now, this is usually done for those uh, hybrid cloud scenarios where you have resources running in a private data center that needs to interact with other AWS resources running in a VPC. Direct Connect allows you to create this private connection for this traffic so your data isn't traversing the public internet. Now, this Amazon VPC topic is huge. Uh, there's so many different ways to set up your VPC and network design that we won't get into for the scope of the exam here. But this should give you a basic understanding of what uh, the VPC is all about and how you can use VPCs and subnets to help enable network connectivity to your AWS resources. And just as importantly, keep your private resources private. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In a previous lesson, we looked at the Amazon VPC and subnets uh, and should have a high level understanding that these can help us isolate our AWS resources and basically have our own logical private data center running in the AWS cloud. But more often than not, we'll need to enable connectivity between services running on different AWS resources and across different subnets, uh, and even possibly needing to allow traffic into and out of our VPC from uh, the public internet or uh, some other private network. Now this lesson explores two important security layers that can help us uh, to allow the intended types of network traffic and communications to our resources and filter out any potential unwanted traffic. We'll be exploring uh, network access control lists or NACLs or security groups or SGs, uh, which can help perform some of these basic firewall capabilities for us. Now, since we'll be covering NACLs and security groups here, uh, and doing a bit of a comparison between them, an important concept to understand here is the difference between stateful and stateless firewalls. Now, for our example here, we'll just use a simple web server, uh, maybe hosting our cloudvikings.io website. And we're just trying to access it through uh, maybe a Chrome browser on our laptop. So we just have a very simple uh, client server model. Now, basically, our uh, browser application here is basically going to reach out over the internet. So again, we're going through the internet here to reach our web server. Now, we're just looking at this from a very simplistic view uh, just to understand the differences between stateful and stateless firewalls. Uh, we won't get into all the uh, details around, uh, you know, the DNS resolution and, you know, TCP protocol communications that are happening here. But again, we're just keeping this simple to uh, understand the concepts. Now, for our client to reach the server here, it's going to a well-known port, 
typically the uh, TCP ports 80 or 443. And this is basically like a, a communication uh, doorway here that uh, our traffic goes through. For our server to understand, this is uh, web application traffic uh, coming in. Now, maybe the server is only hosting our web application traffic, and we know uh, we don't want any traffic coming in from uh, ports other than 80 or 443. So we may want to add a, a firewall into the uh, communication path. And then we configure this firewall to allow in uh, the uh, TCP ports 80 and uh, 443. And everything should be great. But there's a problem here. Our server actually needs to communicate back to our client, uh, like our laptop in this example, uh, so our browser can display our website. So the server needs to communicate back through the internet to reach our laptop and to our browser again so it can display the website. And we know for our uh, client side to reach the web server, it's using the well-known ports of 80 or 443. But what happens with the return traffic? Now, again, we're not getting into the details of uh, the TCP communications, but essentially the client side picks a uh, dynamic or ephemeral port from a large range. Now, the client side uh, basically picks a unused port in this range, and uh, that's part of the communications when it initiates the connection to the server. Now, for our example, say we used uh, TCP port 7077. So when our server is trying to uh, return that traffic back to the client side, it's going back uh, to the source destination through the internet uh, on port 7077. Now, what do we do about the firewall here? So we need something to handle the uh, outbound connection as well. Now we could certainly uh, configure it to allow the outbound TCP port uh, 7077, and that would allow that uh, return traffic through. But what if we have uh, other users on the internet trying to access our site, or uh, the, the same uh, client here opens a new tab in the browser and tries to access it? Chances are very good that we'll have a different uh, TCP port picked uh, within this dynamic range here. Now what would typically happen is, Instead of having the you know single uh, outbound TCP port, uh, we would have the entire uh, range of uh, 1,024 to uh, 65,553. And this may become a bit of a security risk. Uh, we're essentially allowing our server to communicate to any destination out on the internet uh, across that uh, very broad port range. And this is essentially the level a stateless firewall would work at. Uh, we simply configure inbound and outbound rules for that firewall. Now, in contrast, a uh, stateless firewall has a bit of uh, a memory or kind of uh, some intelligence to it. As a simple example, uh, instead of using maybe an IP, we'll just call this uh, client side mic and uh, use that same port 7077. It's going to make a connection out through the internet, reaching our server here on a destination port of. Uh, 80. Now what would happen as this connection uh, would be made and come through our firewall is it would actually remember this session. So it knows it's allowed in a connection from Mike with the uh, source port of 7077. So now with a stateless firewall, we don't necessarily need to configure these outbound rules. It essentially remembers the uh, state of that incoming connection. So it knows we've allowed in Mike uh, through the internet to port 80 to reach our server. And since we've allowed that connection coming in, we're going to allow the return path uh, through the internet to Mike on uh, port 7077. We don't need to configure uh, necessarily the outbound uh, port range. So our web server is just remembering the uh, state of the connection. So anything that uh, allows in, it allows the uh, return path out. And then as an administrator, we don't necessarily need to configure all these outbound rules or open up the entire port range to any destination on the internet. So how does this tie into uh, network access control lists or security groups in AWS? So again, as a very simple example, if we have our uh, AWS account, and then within that, our VPC, And within the VPC, we have a subnet that we use. And then within our subnet, to keep things simple, we'll have a EC2 instance. Now, if we have our uh, internet gateway sitting within our VPC, 
And this is basically allowing the uh, communication from the uh, public internet uh, into our VPC. I'm going to assume here that we have all the routing in place to allow uh, this EC2 instance to uh, basically access the public internet. Now, how can we use the network access control list or NACLs and security groups to uh, help protect this EC2 instance better? Now, network access control lists operate at the subnet layer. And these are your stateless firewall. So we would need to explicitly configure the inbound and outbound rules for this uh, network access control list. Now, if this was, again, a web server, we might have our uh, NACL with like an inbound rule allowing port 80 and 443. And this would essentially allow the incoming uh, web traffic uh, to our EC2 host. And then for the outbound traffic, we may have something that would allow all outbound traffic. Or maybe we just define the uh, port range again. Now through the NACL, we can filter on IP addresses as, as well as ports or a combination of both of those. So if we know the specific IP addresses of the sources that would be trying to uh, access our web server here, we could uh, put those into our NACL to filter out traffic at the subnet level. Now in our example, because it's a web host and we have uh, users potentially all over the world, we don't really have a great way to filter out based on IP address blocks. So we just use the ports uh, 80 and 443 and allow those inbound. Now, what if we wanted to tighten up our security here? Uh, maybe we're concerned with this, uh, allowing all the outbound traffic to any destination on the internet. So with our EC2 instance, we essentially get a virtualized network adapter uh, called a Elastic Network Interface, or ENI. Now, it's at this uh, EC2 instance, or ENI level, that security groups operate. Now, unlike the NACL, that's essentially a stateless firewall, security groups are a stateful firewall. Now, what we could do with the security group here is define a further inbound rule to only allow the TC ports uh, 80 and 443. And this can help us restrict our outbound network traffic. These stateful security groups can be configured in a way that it only allows the return traffic uh, based on the incoming connection requests. So it's not letting our EC2 instance in this case uh, send any traffic to any destination on the internet on potentially any port or part of that uh, range that we've configured in our NACL. It's only allowing the return path for the uh, traffic based on the incoming connection request and source. Now to use the example before, if we have a uh, client here, uh, Mike, and it's using that TCP port uh, 7077, and we go through the internet to try to reach our EC2 instance uh, web host in this case. So we're going through the uh, internet gateway of the VPC. Uh, the traffic would route through our uh, network access control list, and uh, it would allow that connection on either port uh, 80 or 443 in this case. Then the next layer that traffic would have to go through is through our security group here. And this traffic is allowed because of our inbound rules on that same port 80 or 443. It would come through the ENI and reach our uh, web server application. So our web server receives that request and now has to send a response back. Now again, because the security group is stateful, it knows it received that incoming traffic from uh, the source of Mike using the client port of 7077. So it's allowing the return path back out through the security group in this case. Then the return traffic goes back out to our NACL. And again, we've maybe either configured a uh, allow all for the outbound traffic or define that broad uh, TCP port range for the uh, dynamic or ephemeral port range. And now our request is routed back out to the uh, client. Now, what if our EC2 instance was trying to make a connection outbound to a uh, different destination on the internet, uh, let's say Sally, on that same uh, 7077 port. Now this connection is being initiated from our EC2 instance and trying to reach out uh, to the uh, internet destination. Now because of the stateful nature of the security group here, um, any requests that are being initiated from the EC2 uh, instance here through the ENI 
if it hasn't received a uh, incoming connection first, it's going to actually deny this outbound traffic. So again, with the stateful firewalls, it essentially has a memory or some logic built in that it remembers the incoming connections, therefore allows the uh, return path back out. So I hope that was helpful in understanding the differences between the uh, AWS Network Access Control List and AWS Security Groups, and uh, just the differences between the uh, stateful and stateless nature of them. Now, an important thing to uh, keep in mind is that the uh, NACLs operate at the subnet level and the security groups operate at the ENI level. I'll include some links if you want to dive into the network access control list and security groups a bit further. And uh, this will be especially important if you want to continue on to the uh, Solutions Architect Associate exam. I'm planning some courses for that in the future and we'll certainly dive into these uh, NACLs and security groups in a lot more depth. But for our Cloud Practitioner scope here, uh, that should be it. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll go over the AWS service called Route 53. Now, Amazon Route 53 is a domain name service or DNS. But what is DNS and what do we use it for? Now, chances are that you'll be running some type of uh, application workload in AWS that you want other users or customers to access. Now, the internet largely works off the uh, internet protocol, and our machines are given an IP address as a type of identifier that helps our machines communicate with each other over different networks. Now, IP addresses aren't the easiest thing to remember, especially if you had to remember uh, hundreds of them for you know, each of your favorite websites. Uh, they're usually in the IP version 4 format of something like uh, you know, 192.168.100.111. Now, imagine if you had to remember uh, you know, a different string of numbers like this for each of your favorite websites that you visit. Or you know, just getting a URL link to something with an IP address, and you'd really have no idea you know, what site that would actually take you to. Humans are much better at remembering names. Uh, we can get domain names that are easy to remember and represent our site, uh, something like example.com. But if we use our laptop and try to reach uh, example.com over the internet, our laptop really has no idea how to reach the web server hosting this site. Remember, our systems communicate by IP address. So how do we take this human-friendly domain name and map it to the IP address of the web server hosting uh, our example.com site here? This is where the domain name service or DNS comes in. DNS is a service that can translate our human friendly domain names to the IP addresses representing the systems hosting that site. So as an owner for example.com here, we would configure our public DNS records with the mapping of the domain that we own to the uh, IP address of our web server. And this is what Route 53 does. It's our AWS DNS service we can use to define our private or public mappings of IP addresses and uh, service endpoints in some cases to these easy to remember names. So if we have example.com uh, running on a EC2 instance with a public IP address assigned, we can create a mapping or a record saying that our example.com domain name should point to this IP. Now, keeping things high level for this example, if we browse to example.com from our laptop, our laptop initially has no idea what IP address it should try to reach out to. Our laptop would have a DNS resolver configured. Now, this resolver is a DNS server as well that performs these DNS lookups on the DNS name and uh, returns back the IP address to our laptop in this case. These DNS resolvers may be something within your company network or uh, perhaps some type of public DNS service. But the chances are high that even this DNS resolver doesn't know what that IP address for our example.com site should be either. Remember, we configured this DNS mapping in Route 53 on AWS, not in our DNS resolver. Now, we'll skip the details here for simplicity, but through the magic of DNS, our DNS resolver knows that to look up the IP for example.com, it needs to ask the AWS Route 53 service for the IP. The IP address is then sent all the way back to our DNS resolver and uh, ultimately back to our laptop. 
And now we can start sending our network packets over the network to the destination IP address of the site. This service is highly reliable and provides a variety of ways to leverage the AWS global infrastructure to best serve your customers. Now, as an example, if you had customers all over the world, you may want to take advantage of deploying your uh, web servers in a number of these regions to reduce latency and improve the overall customer experience. Now, we still just want to have our single domain name of example.com for all our global users, but how do we get our customers' traffic going to the optimal region in this case? Route 53 provides a number of routing policy options to control the traffic distribution to multiple targets associated with the domain name record. For our example here, we may want to use a geolocation routing policy. In this case, Route 53 would look up the source IP address um, our laptop's public IP in this case, and do its best to figure out the general area we're located in. And based on that information, return back the IP address for the web server that's in the closest region to us. Now, Amazon Route 53 provides many configuration and routing options, and it's highly integrated with many AWS services. Uh, you can use Route 53 in combination with CloudFront uh, and your load balancers, there are even other AWS service endpoint names to help enable your customers and users to access your applications hosted in AWS in the most efficient and highly available way. So that's it for this name to IP translation service called Route 53. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll explore some other network connectivity options to reach our services running in the AWS VPCs. Now, in the last few lessons, we looked at ways we can enable uh, network connectivity to our resources running inside of AWS through our use of uh, the VPCs, subnets, uh, those NACLs and security groups to add some security layers on top of all that, and then uh, using Route 53 for the DNS aspects. But what if we have resources within our VPC that are just for internal use within an organization? We don't want them exposed on the internet. We just want certain employees that have the proper authentication in place to access those resources. Now, we may have a scenario where we have a small company office and we need to use the internet to access uh, AWS. But how can we keep our resources private so not everyone on the public internet can reach them uh, but still allow our internal employees the ability to access them. And this is where we can set up what's called a virtual private network or VPN. Now, AWS provides uh, a couple of options for VPN connectivity, and we'll be taking a quick look at the uh, client VPN and site-to-site -site VPN options. So if we take our small office example, we'll typically have some kind of uh, office building with a uh, internal network that connects all our workstations and other services together here. And this would typically be a private network. Now this network would be uh, fairly isolated from the public internet. But we'd likely have some type of specialized uh, networking equipment here that would allow our internal private network to reach out to the public internet. This kind of specialized uh, edge networking uh, gear here might be uh, different routers and firewalls that uh, would enable the internal private networks to reach out to the public internet. Now on the other side, we may have our AWS account, then our VPC within that. And for our example, perhaps we have a, a database. Now for example, maybe an employee in our uh, office here needs to do some queries against the database for some uh, data analytics. But this database isn't part of a public subnet. We don't want anybody on the public internet to be able to reach this uh, database server. So how do we enable this user in the private office network to go out, use the public internet, and reach our database server that's in a private subnet on AWS? And this is where VPN comes into play. So for this simplified example here, we typically have a virtual private gateway on our AWS VPC and then set up a site-to-site -site VPN connection. Now, essentially what happens in this case is using the specialized networking hardware at the edge of our uh, private office network, 
we would configure a VPN connection, this virtual private network, to terminate at the virtual private gateway of our AWS VPC. This allows our users' traffic to go through our office network uh, out to the internet. Now, as that traffic uh, tries to reach our destination, being the uh, database host in our AWS VPC, through the routing configuration here, the network appliance here would essentially put a uh, encrypted bubble around our data traffic that would uh, go out through the public internet to our virtual private gateway. So in this case, we're still sending our traffic across the public internet, but now we have an extra layer of protection from the uh, VPN encapsulation. We basically created a virtual tunnel here across the public internet for our traffic to reach through to our AWS resources. Now, as that traffic reaches our virtual private gateway here, it can then be sent to our database host as it essentially sees this traffic as uh, local traffic to the VPC. It would consider the traffic coming from our private network across the tunnel, the same as, uh, you know, as if that, you know, user had a EC2 host maybe sitting within our VPC and was trying to access the database uh, within the AWS VPC itself. But what if our employee isn't actually in the physical office at this point? Uh, maybe we have a remote workforce. So this person could be pretty much anywhere in the world. And this is where the client VPN solution comes into play. Now it works very similar to our other uh, site to site VPN option here, but instead of having this uh, physical networking gear uh, doing the VPN encapsulation and uh, basically handling this uh, VPN tunnel connection here, we would install some software on perhaps the user's laptop. And essentially this is a client side VPN. So now our user's traffic would uh, just leave their laptop directly going through our client VPN. And that client VPN software essentially creates that new tunnel to the uh, virtual private gateway here. And again, our connection is going through the public internet, but now all the data that's going through here is encrypted through a VPN encapsulated tunnel. So now our remote worker here could access our database to do their job from pretty much anywhere in the world, uh, just like they could from the physical office network. So the AWS VPN options here are great solutions to enable connectivity between your private networks or remote workers to resources running in the AWS cloud. You can use the public internet to enable the connectivity across uh, pretty much anywhere in the world, but have that VPN encapsulation to keep the data sent over the public internet safe. In the next few lessons, we're taking a look at some other networking options to enable the private network connectivity between perhaps larger office sites or even data centers to connect into your AWS resources within a VPC. Uh, but that's it for now on the AWS VPN options. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be looking at another network connectivity option with AWS called Direct Connect. So we looked at the AWS VPN and how it enables us to create these secure ways to connect different uh, networks or uh, even end user systems to AWS by using the public internet uh, through a VPN tunnel. The you know network traffic going through this tunnel is encrypted and provides a layer of security as our data is sent across the internet and enables our AWS VPC to identify the source network or client VPN application as a trusted source that allows our traffic into the VPC. But the internet is shared by millions and millions of people. And, you know, it may not always be the most consistent experience when sending large amounts of traffic or, you know, data through the uh, public internet. We may also have some type of policy or regulatory requirements for our business where we just simply can't send certain types of sensitive data over the public internet. So how do we connect our large corporate office sites or uh, the traditional data centers to our AWS VPC without using the public internet? Well, we can use AWS Direct Connect as a connectivity solution here. AWS Direct Connect allows us to establish a dedicated private network connection between our large office locations or uh, you know, those on-premise traditional data center facilities to our AWS VPC. Now, there's a lot of details and options we won't dive into with establishing these uh, direct connect connections. But the basic idea is that in most cases, we would establish a dedicated network connection through one of many uh, direct connect partner internet service providers. This is basically your private network link between your network and the network router present within the direct connect location facility. 
We also need to make a direct connect request for our AWS account. And this can take a few days for uh, the approval process from the AWS side. And once that's complete, we get a special authorization letter to provide to our network partner uh, creating this network link for us. Now within this direct connect location, AWS also has networking equipment that will connect into the AWS backbone network. So our direct connect partner we're working with to establish this link would then use this authorization letter and their special security clearances to access the secured AWS networking equipment and establish this cross connect between their routing equipment and AWS. This effectively gives you that private network connection into the AWS backbone network. Now, depending on the direct connect location and the partners you're working with, you can get direct connect uh, connection speeds from uh, 50 megabits per second uh, all the way up to 100 gigabits per second. So along with the benefits of having your own private network link between your office or data center location to AWS to uh, you know, help improve the speed and latency compared to going over the public internet, there's also the potential to save a lot of money here if you have a lot of data transfer between your office or data center locations uh, to your VPC in AWS. Now, as an example, say we're in a uh, AWS region and have a volume tier where we'd pay uh, nine cents per gigabyte of traffic that we'd send out uh, through the internet. With the site-to-site -site VPN option, this is the price we'd pay for the uh, data leaving uh, AWS back to our office or data center sites as that goes out over the internet. However, with Direct Connect, we'd pay something like two cents per gigabyte for our data being sent back out from AWS to our office or data center. So if you're sending tens of terabytes or more of traffic from AWS to your office locations, the data center uh, transfer cost savings can be quite significant. And also don't forget that along with the savings, you also have the benefit of that dedicated network connection and potential for a lot of higher bandwidth compared to uh, using the internet. Now we won't get into the details here, but there's a lot more to consider with these direct connect options. The price we mentioned above can vary significantly depending on the region you're in and the amount of traffic volume you have. And you'd also need to uh, factor in the cost of establishing these uh, dedicated uh, network links through your uh, network provider, along with the AWS cost of running this connection. AWS charges what they call uh, port hours. These port hours are the cost AWS has of maintaining this private connection, uh, regardless if you send any data over the Direct Connect link or not. So depending on your uh, connection bandwidth capacity you've requested, uh, this can cost from anywhere from uh, three cents an hour up to over $22 an hour. Now I know we're in the cloud practitioner uh, scope of things here, but if we take a look back at this high level visual of a Direct Connect uh, connection and put a bit of a imaginary network architect hat on here, what risks do you see with a design like this? Well, we have our private dedicated network connection from our facility to AWS, which bypasses the internet. So everything looks great here. The issue is that stuff breaks all the time. And with Direct Connect, this is a single network connection. If our network equipment in the office or the data center fails, or maybe we need to do some maintenance on it and do a software update and reboot the router, or maybe uh, a new bridge is being built somewhere in the uh, area and a big backhoe claws apart the uh, network fiber cables that our uh, internet service provider partner set up for that uh, dedicated connection, um, or the partner's router fails, uh, or even the AWS has some you know, maintenance activity going on on the direct connect equipment that uh, we tie into. Now, regardless of the situation there, uh, there's multiple points of failure possible along this single network connection. So if you're considering direct connect connections to AWS, chances are you'll likely need at least two of them to provide some sort of uh, redundancy and help safeguard against these uh, failure scenarios or uh, planned maintenance events and uh, keep your business critical traffic flowing from your data center or offices to and from AWS. So that's it for now for our intro on AWS Direct Connect. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. We made it to another section of this technology domain and uh, in the next few lessons, we'll be taking a look at some of the database options AWS provides us. We'll be taking a look at how we can run our own databases on EC2 instances and contrast that with some of the managed database options available. So let's dive in.
Hello and welcome back. Now we'll start our exploration of databases on AWS by looking at an approach many may be familiar with coming from the traditional IT world. As we know, EC2 instances are the virtual machines we can deploy in AWS. And these EC2 instances can be of many variations of CPU and memory configurations. We can get very high performance EC2 instance types, uh, many of which are a great fit for running large production databases on them. Now, if you're thinking of a lift and shift migration to AWS from some of your uh, on-premises databases, it's very likely you can find a similar EC2 instance type that would match the CPU and memory specifications of the current server hardware hosting your uh, existing database. Now, since you know that the database performs well on the existing physical server hardware, chances are quite good that, you know, if you pick an instance type with a similar CPU and memory profile, that database would behave uh, very similarly when running on a virtual machine instance on AWS. Now, similar with EBS, we can find uh, storage volume solutions that match our read and write data transfer requirements for the database as well. Now, with running a database on an EC2 instance, remember you're responsible for a lot of the aspects here. Uh, first, of course, the EC2 instance itself and possibly the EBS storage configuration. Uh, then you need the operating system install. And that has a lot of ongoing overhead uh, with upgrading and uh, applying uh, package updates and security patches to it. Then we need to have a deep understanding of our database software and ensure the installation and the configuration of it are aligned to a variety of best practices and that you know this meets the requirements of the types of data we'll be storing in it and supports the way the data will be used. For business critical databases, you may have specialized staff handling the administration of the operating system aspects and keeping up with the security and package updates for it. Uh, then there's specialized database administrators or uh, DBAs that are experts with the uh, install, configuration, uh, performance tuning, and the upgrade processes for the database software itself. Now, I'm just giving the surface here of the value uh, and scope of responsibilities system administrators and DBAs would have here, but bear in mind that there's a lot of operational overhead with this approach. There's just so much you need to do all on your own to successfully run a business critical database on an Amazon EC2 instance, and then continue to invest more time and energy to do the maintenance activities to keep this instance and the database updated and secure. Now, while all this heavy lifting of running a database on EC2 sounds like a big headache, and it can be for a lot of organizations, this is actually the main benefit of this option of deploying databases in AWS. So although you have all that uh, installation uh, set up and ongoing maintenance and you know all the tuning aspects uh, with this type of approach, uh, and you probably need the specialized uh, staff skill sets to do this well, this option of running your database directly on EC2 gives you a tremendous amount of control and uh, customization for you. So if you have that highly specialized database configuration, or maybe you already have a great team of system administrators and uh, DBAs to handle all this, uh, running a database on EC2 may be a great option. Now, if you don't truly have some of these unique database requirements that necessitate this uh, level of control, and you think about all the operational overhead of the staff time to set up and maintain the operating system and all the database aspects here, all this time adds up to a lot of additional operating costs for the business. Now, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to do all this heavy lifting yourself? Uh, what if you could simply pick from a variety of database types to meet your business requirements and have your database ready to go within a few minutes? Um, all of this configured to a variety of best practices uh, with no operating system and uh, database engine upgrades to manage end-to-end. Uh, -end. Plus, you have a number of options around uh, high availability and backup solutions built in within a few simple clicks. Well, this exists in the form of AWS managed database options, and we'll be exploring those in the next few lessons. Uh, but keep in mind, running your database on EC2 directly gives you a tremendous amount of control, which can be a great thing, or even a necessity for some cases for those specialized database requirements, but be prepared for the operational overhead that comes with it. So onward we go to look at some of the AWS managed database options. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be going over some of the managed relational database options on AWS. Now, as we know from the previous lesson, we can certainly uh, run our databases directly on EC2 instances, 
But with that option, there's a lot of that overhead involved with setting that up properly. And of course, the ongoing maintenance involved with the uh, operating system layers, along with the uh, database software itself. Now, RDS is the acronym for Relational Database Service. Now, the uh, database service part makes sense, but what does this relational thing mean? Well, organizations often need to store a variety of information, and this data is often in a very structured format. As an example, we may have a person's first and last name, uh, along with an email address, and maybe some unique identifier, and put all that into a table made up of columns and rows. Now, say we had some type of uh, imaginary business here, and maybe we have other tables in our database that store information about the products we sell, uh, then some tables around the info for our orders that we process and so forth. Usually we have some type of data in these tables that relates to the other ones. Uh, so maybe we have uh, an example where we need to send a thank you email for the purchase of a certain product. In that case, we would need to reference the product table uh, to see you know, what the uh, unique identifier was of the item, then uh, look up that ID in the orders table to see what the uh, user's ID was that actually bought the product, and then use that uh, user ID to look up the email address associated to each of those uh, unique user IDs. Now, this is just a basic example but I just want to demonstrate the idea here of relational data in the context of a database. Now, because of all these relationships between all this structured data in these database tables, we can perform very complex queries on this data to gain a variety of useful business insights about our products, uh, our users, the orders, and so forth. These queries or searches across all this relational data often uses the structured query language or SQL. Now, there's a number of database options out there that are designed for this type of structured data use case. Uh, databases like uh, MySQL, uh, Postgres, uh, Oracle, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, just to name a few. Now, Amazon RDS supports most of these common database types and lets you quickly deploy your database and have it up and running within minutes. Amazon RDS gives you all this relational database service flexibility uh, with the built-in managed service options for uh, backup, high availability, uh, failover capabilities, as well as you don't have that overhead of having to do the OS and database patches. Now, if you're running any uh, large-scale production databases, AWS offers another type of relational database option you may want to consider, and it's called Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora is a database that's compatible with the MySQL or Postgres database engines. And this just means that it supports all the same data types and uh, functions of that database engine. So your database data would easily migrate over into Aurora, and you shouldn't have to rewrite any of your application code or your SQL queries that you already have. Amazon Aurora provides a highly managed database with some incredible scaling and performance capabilities. Uh, all this with a claim savings of up to uh, 90% compared to the cost of other commercial database solutions around. Now, depending on the database engine, along with the cost savings here, there's a claimed uh, three times to five times throughput performance increase with using Amazon Aurora as well. So that's it here for a quick overview of the Amazon RDS and Amazon Aurora services for your uh, managed relational database needs uh, that you store your structured data in it. But what if the type of data you have isn't so structured and the format of it may change frequently? Well, for that, you'll have to join me in the upcoming lesson. Thanks for watching. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be looking at another type of managed database option from AWS called Amazon DynamoDB. So we should have a high level idea now about the relational databases from our other lesson. And these relational databases are great when you know you have very uh, structured types of data and you can easily predetermine what the data will be. Now, since you know all this ahead of time, you can set up your database table schemas according to the data types you'll be storing and the ways you expect that data to be accessed by your applications or users. Relational databases, in a way, enforce this strict structure of the data that you'll be storing in them. But what if you have data where it isn't easy to predetermine the exact structure of the data or you may have a variety of changing types of data that you uh, expect you'll need to account for in the future, but you don't quite know what all those are quite yet. Or maybe you know based on the uh, types of uh, queries your application or users make 
that a relational database just isn't the ideal uh, database choice for your performance requirements. For these and other use cases, there are non-relational databases available. Now, if you recall, we typically use the structured query language, or SQL, to interact with our relational database. But with non-relational databases, we wouldn't typically use SQL. So these types of databases are often referred to as NoSQL databases. Now, Amazon DynamoDB uh, uses a key value structure to the database table, where these key value pairs can provide tremendous flexibility to the type of data you can store within it. Now, even if you have uh, structured data, but don't have the need for that data to be related to multiple tables, NoSQL databases like DynamoDB are often a great use case as well. If you have a large single table of data, you can take advantage of the performance and scaling capabilities that uh, NoSQL databases can provide. Amazon DynamoDB is a serverless managed service by AWS. Now, of course, there's compute resources powering DynamoDB in the back end, but this is abstracted away from you as the customer. AWS manages that compute layer and can quickly uh, scale in or out to match your real-time database load demands. So with Amazon DynamoDB, you're not paying for idle resources, and it can scale up quickly to meet any uh, peak load requirements that come your way. With NoSQL databases like DynamoDB, these typically scale horizontally, uh, adding or removing capacity as needed. In contrast to relational databases, these generally scale vertically, where you need to add more CPU and memory resources to the host running your database. Now, there's a number of other types of non-relational databases available, and AWS offers some great options for these different use cases as well. But for the scope of the exam here, we just need to understand some of the uh, basics between uh, SQL and NoSQL databases, and some of the core options AWS offers within these categories. We have the option to run your database directly on EC2, and uh, that, of course, could be a relational database or a NoSQL database. Remember that you, know, you have all the flexibility to run whatever database you want on EC2 and configure it from the OS layer on up to meet your needs, but you have all that burden of doing all that setup and ongoing maintenance. Then we have the AWS managed database options of uh, Amazon RDS and uh, Amazon Aurora for your relational database needs. And we have Amazon DynamoDB as that core NoSQL key value-based solution offering incredible performance and scaling characteristics. Now, I'll include some follow-up links here after the lesson to review some other NoSQL options AWS offers if you're curious, um, and some other resources to help compare the differences between SQL and NoSQL databases. Now, there's no need to go too deep on any of these topics for the scope of the exam blueprint here, uh, but of course, it never hurts to be curious and overlearn some of these topics. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll look at a completely different category of databases that's optimized for complex analytical queries of large historical data sets. Now, we've looked at a few database options for our relational database needs with uh, Amazon RDS and, uh, of course, Amazon Aurora. And we saw how DynamoDB can fit that NoSQL use case for our uh, structured and unstructured data, where we don't have the requirement of all these uh, data table relationships and can benefit from its uh, massive scaling and serverless design uh, and its performance capabilities. But these types of databases are optimized to handle the constant real-time uh, creation, deletion, and updates of data within the database tables and the demands of uh, immediate real-time queries. The read and write capabilities of these databases are designed around providing the optimal mix of uh, these real-time create, read, update, and delete functions. Now, these databases can provide some amazing performance characteristics, but for some situations where we have uh, large amounts of historical data and need to perform some advanced analytical queries across these large data sets, the database solutions we explored already can fall short. These databases aren't really optimized for handling the uh, specialized storage and optimized read capabilities needed for these types of complex analytical queries across massive amounts of data. Now, while you can certainly run analytical types of queries against relational and non-relational databases, once you get into the situation where you need to do complex analytics across a variety of different data sets for your business and uh, looking at millions and millions of rows of database entries, you're starting to enter into that world of big data. 
And this is where a more purpose-built category of databases called a data warehouse comes into the picture. Now, just like the relational and non-relational database options, there are a number of data warehouse solutions you can use. And just like the others, we can deploy a data warehouse into AWS directly onto uh, EC2. But as we know, this comes with a lot of the uh, burden of having to install, uh, set up, and of course that ongoing operational work. To help AWS customers avoid this burden of running a data warehouse solution on their own, AWS offers their own managed data warehouse service called Amazon Redshift. Amazon Redshift is purpose-built for doing your business intelligence or BI analytics across these massive data sets, being able to handle petabytes to uh, potentially exabytes worth of data. Along with being able to handle these huge amounts of data, Amazon Redshift provides a big performance improvement over the relational database engines. So if your business has big data in the terabytes or exabytes of size, and you need to perform some complex analytics across this historical data for your uh, business intelligence or BI needs, a purpose-built data warehouse solution like Amazon Redshift can be a great solution. And that's a wrap for our quick intro on Amazon Redshift. See you in the next lesson. Welcome to a new section of the technology domain, where we'll go over some of the resources you should know about to get help and find more supporting information around all these different AWS technology services. Now, throughout the course so far, you've already been exposed to a lot of these resources, but we'll review them one by one uh, based on the exam blueprint here, and just reinforce your understanding of the supporting resources available to you as AWS customers and how to access them. So let's dive in. Hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll go over the AWS support plan tiers available as an AWS customer. Now, once you start using AWS to build your business IT infrastructure on and run your production workloads, your support needs become more important and can change over time as your business grows. So AWS offers a number of paid support plan tiers to help you along your AWS journey and offer varying amounts of support and features, uh, and of course, varying costs. So let's take a look at these AWS support plans and see what they're all about. So this is the AWS support plan page. Now, one thing I wanted to uh, bring your attention to is that although we're going to be looking at some of the premium support options, that uh, basic support is included for all AWS customers. You still get access to customer service and of course, all the documentation and uh, the AWS forum. And you get a subset of checks through uh, the AWS Trusted Advisor service, which we'll look into in a future lesson and access to the AWS Personal Health Dashboard. And this Personal Health Dashboard is just a personalized view of the alerts. So if there's something that's uh, going to be impacting one of the services in AWS, uh, you'll only get that alert if you're actually using that service. And it helps reduce some of the uh, alert noise. Now, moving on beyond the basic support that's included for all AWS customers, we have the breakdown between developer, business, enterprise on-ramp, and enterprise. So these are your four paid tiers of AWS support. Now under each one of these tiers are the general recommendations for when you'd use one tier over the other. So for developer, it's great if you're just, you know, experimenting and doing some testing in AWS. A good example for this type of tier might be if you're a startup company, you know, you don't really have any production workloads running today where you have uh, hundreds of thousands of customers uh, depending on your service, but you're in that early development phase you're developing your application for your business, but you want some additional help from AWS uh, as part of that journey. And the next jump up is the business tier. And this is great when you have uh, production workloads in AWS where you need more real-time support. And then we have two enterprise tiers of AWS support, and these come into play when you have these very large mission-critical workloads running in AWS. So let's take a look at the comparison chart down below here to get some more details on each of these tiers. Now, I won't go through each one here in detail, but an important one to keep in mind here is what with the developer tier, you get sort of a subset of these uh, AWS Trusted Advisor checks. Then with the uh, business or enterprise tiers, you do get the full suite of checks. Now let's move on and take a look at the enhanced technical support. So for our developer tier here, we have access to the AWS Enhanced Technical Support team uh, during our local business hours. And we have sort of one primary name contact for AWS support. Now, in contrast to the business and enterprise tiers, 
uh, where we get 24 by 7 support. We also get unlimited contacts. So if we have a large operations team, anyone from that team that has access to the AWS support console through IAM would be able to open up a support ticket with AWS. Now moving on, we have the case severity response times. So in the developer tier for our general guidance types of uh, support cases with AWS, where we're asking just general questions about AWS services, or asking for perhaps some architectural advice, we're looking at sort of a less than 24 hour response time. Now keep in mind within the developer tier here, all these are within the business hours of support. Now if you compare that to our business tier, we still have the same less than 24 hours for our general guidance types of questions. Now while this seems the same as the developer tier, keep in mind that this is 24 seven support now instead of just within your uh, business hours of operation. Now for the uh, system impaired types of support questions where you're running into a issue, the response time you can expect is less than 12 hours. So these are the types of support cases you'd open if uh, something's impacted, you're not really sure why, but it's not really impacting your uh, production systems. The next severity level of production system impaired, you can expect less than a four hour response time from AWS. And then the highest severity level within the business tier here is the production system down, where you can expect less than a one hour response time from AWS. Now with the enterprise tiers, all these carry over. We're also introducing a new severity level, the business critical system down. Again, with these enterprise tiers, you're typically running you know, business critical workloads or mission critical workloads on AWS. So if you're having a large outage scenario, every minute counts. And with the severity level of support cases that you'd open with AWS, you can expect a less than 30 minute response time for the enterprise on-ramp tier. And then with the full enterprise tier, you get a less than 15 minute response time for these business or mission critical uh, support cases with AWS. Now moving on to the next row here, we have the architectural guidance. So for developer support, you're just getting sort of general best practices and recommendations based on your questions from the AWS support team, where with the business and enterprise tiers, you're getting a more uh, sort of white glove treatment and the responses are more tailored to your specific needs. And then looking at the uh, case management section here, from the uh, business tier on up, we get access to the AWS support API. And this can come in very handy for large organizations. You're able to automate your creation of AWS support cases, uh, check on the status and responses, and tie that into a number of systems for your uh, incident tracking or even integrating into uh, Slack channels and that type of thing. Now moving on, we can look at the uh, third-party software support. Now again, this is from a business level on up. Now what this is referring to is that AWS will do their best to assist you with even third-party software running on AWS. Now you gotta keep in mind that this is a best effort type of support in most cases, but the AWS support team will do their best to help you with even third-party applications running on AWS and assist you with any kind of guidance or troubleshooting to the best of their ability. Now, especially within the enterprise tiers of support, your AWS account team can often get you in touch with experts within AWS that may have experience uh, from past roles with uh, some third-party software and give you more advice around the configuration and general guidance about running that third-party application on AWS. So again, keep in mind, this is sort of a business tier on up and that the third-party software support is generally a, a best effort uh, support from AWS. Now taking a look at the proactive programs and self-service, the main one I wanna draw your attention to here is the infrastructure event management or IEMs. So if your business has any type of uh, upcoming infrastructure event, now that could be something like a, a load event, uh, perhaps you're in retail and you have like a uh, large spike expected for uh, Black Friday. You wanna be sure your AWS infrastructure is able to handle the expected load. So in that case, you can get involved with the infrastructure event management programs from AWS. So you're able to work with a team at AWS to ensure your infrastructure is able to handle the expected event. Or maybe you have a new product launch and you're expecting a whole bunch of new uh, customer subscriptions or whatever the case. You can work with AWS to make sure your infrastructure is able to handle the expected load. Another type of event might be a migration. Uh, perhaps you're uh, finally completing a migration from on-premise data centers to AWS. And as part of that migration phase, you may want to look into one of these infrastructure event management programs by AWS to help support that migration effort. Now within the business tier, these infrastructure event management programs are an additional fee for each event. 
comparing that to the enterprise on-ramp, you get one of these events included per year. And then within the full enterprise tier, you get essentially unlimited events you can use this program for. Now moving on with our comparison, we'll take a look at the technical account management. Now this is a key difference of the enterprise tiers of AWS support. So with these enterprise tiers, you get a technical account manager as part of your AWS support team to help work with and support your organization on their journey to using AWS. Your technical account manager, or TAM, can help support you and your business in a number of ways. And I think the key point here is that working with a TAM provides you that proactive support from AWS. Your TAM is constantly working with you and your organization to help ensure your infrastructure is meeting best practices and working with you to help optimize costs, ensuring that your support cases are all handled properly, and allowing you to tap into the vast array of programs and experts within the AWS support teams. Now quickly on the training piece here, you're getting access with the enterprise tiers to some online self-paced labs. Now these are typically guided self-paced labs that run in a sandboxed environment so staff at your organization can ramp up on a number of services and technologies in a hands-on learning environment. Now for the account assistance, again with the enterprise on up, we get access to the concierge support team. Now this is more for the support cases where you're dealing at the AWS account level. Perhaps you need some specialized guidance around uh, billing. The concierge support team can help you uh, generate reports and dive into your AWS invoices, assist you with uh, tax related questions and so forth. Now taking a look at the pricing, I'll let you dive through all the details, but in general, all the tiers have a minimum monthly charge or a percentage of your AWS bill. Now keep in mind it's the greater of the two. So your costs for these premium support plans from AWS can range from anywhere from $29 a month to $15,000 a month at a minimum. So when you're looking at the full enterprise tier of support here from AWS, there's certainly some uh, significant costs involved with the support tier. But for a lot of organizations, that cost is easily justified. Don't forget this is designed for when you have these business or mission critical workloads in AWS, where perhaps every minute of a you know, production outage could cost you hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. Having that sub 15 minute response time target from AWS is probably worth it just on its own. Along with that, don't forget you're getting a technical account manager or your TAM. Your AWS TAM can work very closely with your organization to ensure your infrastructure is meeting best practices and it's highly optimized for costs. Often your AWS TAM can uncover optimizations that can save you more money than what the enterprise support costs would even be. But again, keep in mind that these are all designed for different uh, types of business use cases here. And that's it for our overview here of the AWS support plans. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to take a quick look at a tool from AWS called the AWS Trusted Advisor. Now, as we know, AWS has a ton of customers and uh, huge support teams, along with their professional services teams and solutions architects. Uh, what if you could take this knowledge from all these groups and provide it in a tool that AWS customers could use? And that's essentially what this AWS Trusted Advisor tool is. It's a tool that provides a series of checks across your AWS accounts to help you ensure that you're following uh, AWS recommended best practices. Now to dive a little deeper, we can take a look at the AWS Trusted Advisor page. So scrolling down a bit, we can see some of the categories that the Trusted Advisor tool checks against. So the AWS Trusted Advisor tool has a series of checks focused around these five different uh, categories here. Now looking at this page a bit further, we can see the breakdown of the five categories. Now I'd suggest taking a quick read through the uh, five categories here gives a nice summary of some of the checks involved with each of the uh, groupings. And that's it for a quick intro on the AWS Trusted Advisor, which is performing a series of checks across your AWS accounts to help ensure you're following best practices. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome back. We're moving on to the last domain of the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Exam Blueprint, uh, Billing and Pricing. Now, this domain is focused on understanding how AWS bills you for the resources you're using in AWS and some of the tools you can use to dive into uh, these usage charges 
and do some analysis of your cost and usage on your own and really start thinking about ways you can reduce waste and optimize the resources you're using in AWS. So great job on making it this far. Uh, welcome to Domain 4 and let's get going. Welcome back. In the following section, we'll be exploring the AWS pricing models for their services. Uh, we'll understand the main pay go pricing model for their services and some pricing options to consider to help you save a ton of money compared to the on-demand pricing rates. But like most things, these choices have their pros and cons. On the next few lessons, we'll briefly go over some considerations to keep in mind when deciding what pricing options might be best for you. So let's dive into the AWS pricing topics. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll look at the AWS Compute Service EC2, but focus on two main choices related to pricing for these EC2 instances, uh, on-demand and spot. So as we know, we have tons of choice with the variety of EC2 instance families uh, to find that best fit instance type to use based on our workload requirements. Uh, and then we pay for that on-demand rate for the length of time we use that EC2 instance. Now, if we think about what's going on behind the scenes at AWS data centers, They'd have thousands of these physical servers of different configurations all up and running to host your EC2 instances on. And they'd want to avoid capacity issues for customers where you know they simply wouldn't have enough servers available to run your EC2 instances on when you need to. Now, it'd certainly be frustrating as an AWS customer to need to deploy a bunch of EC2 instances for a scale-out scenario to handle a you know, sudden peak in traffic to your systems but only find out that there's no capacity available and you're not able to launch them. Now at very extreme scales, this out of capacity scenario can happen. Uh, and that's a broader topic outside of our scope here, but AWS works very hard to ensure its data centers have the necessary capacity available to its customers when they need it. But in order to make this happen, AWS would need to over provision their data center resources to handle any sudden demand increases from their customers. For an easy example, uh, let's just say AWS aims for a 20% over-provision target. So they have this extra 20% of capacity in case several customers, uh, new and existing, uh, all need to launch significant amounts of EC2 instances all at the same time. But that 20% buffer is just a bit of an insurance policy. The likelihood of a massive scale-out scenario occurring all at the same time would be pretty low. So 20% of these servers are basically sitting around idle. Now, as we learned in the earlier lessons when running a traditional IT data center yourself, all these wasted resources are very costly. So instead of having this 20% capacity doing nothing and costing AWS money by sitting idle, AWS offers this surplus of server capacity to customers at a highly discounted rate. AWS calls EC2 instances that use this capacity surplus spot instances. Now, the savings with spot instances can be as high as 90% compared to the typical on-demand rate. So the savings with spot instances can be very significant, but there's a catch. Now, remember that these instances run in this uh, spare capacity of AWS. So what happens if there's a sudden spike of customers needing to launch EC2 instances? Well, if AWS doesn't have enough free compute capacity available, they'll essentially kick your spot instances out of this surplus capacity zone so they can run on-demand EC2 instances for other customers. AWS sends you a spot instance interruption notice two minutes ahead of time before your spot instance is stopped or terminated. So because of this potential volatility of EC2 spot instances, where they could be shut down by AWS at any point, some workloads aren't ideal for running on spot instances. However, for a lot of workloads, especially running batch jobs or background processing or other optional tasks, where these can handle possible interruptions and the processing task can be restarted later, uh, spot instances can be a fantastic option to save a lot of money on your EC2 compute costs. And that's it for a quick lesson here on EC2 pricing when looking at uh, EC2 on-demand rates compared to using spot instances. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll quickly look at AWS savings plans and reserved instances. So we learned that AWS has this spare capacity as a buffer for sudden peaks of demand for their services. And in the case of compute with EC2, AWS helps drive utilization of this spare capacity by offering discounted rates for 
resources that would otherwise be idle. But this extra spare capacity is still costly for AWS, and they'd want to keep these wasted resources to a minimum, uh, just like we do as AWS customers. Now, the capacity planning and financial forecasting game can be very complex, uh, especially at the scale of a cloud service provider like AWS. Now, to help AWS make better capacity planning estimates and more predictable revenue streams, AWS offers some commitment-based discount options for some of their services. Now, we won't dive into the specifics for our uh, core scope here, but AWS savings plans and reserved instances, also called RIs, provide us a way to get a discounted rate for these resources compared to the uh, on-demand pricing rates. What we're basically doing here is guaranteeing that we'll use the AWS resource for a certain amount of time. And these commitments can be anywhere from uh, one to three years in duration. Now, as an example, if we know we have a web server running on an EC2 instance 24-7, uh, and we expect we'll always need this instance to run our business workload on, we could purchase a savings plan or a reserved instance for a set term like three years. We're basically saying to AWS that I'll pay you for this resource for three years, regardless if I actually have the resource running or not. Now, from an AWS perspective, this is ideal. Uh, they have a better expectation of how much money they'll get from your account during that term. And they also get a better idea of what type of capacity they'll need to account for. Now, if you think about the bigger picture here with tens of thousands of AWS customers, all with long-term commitments for their resource usage for particular services, AWS can better forecast their capacity, knowing that the resources covered by these long-term commitments are very likely to be a consistent utilization since customers are paying for them regardless. Um, and they also know how much revenue they'll be generating during these commitment terms uh, and make better financial decisions with all this data at hand. So this is basically a win-win scenario here. Uh, AWS reduces their unknowns uh, and gets the more predictable data for their capacity planning. And now they're not creating too much wasted capacity in their data centers and saving money. Uh, this then allows AWS to offer discounted rates to customers making these commitments. This discount is both an incentive and a reward for customers uh, using these long-term usage commitments with AWS. Now, there's a lot to consider with AWS savings plans and RIs uh, to the extent it could be a whole course on its own. Uh, there are a number of term durations along with different uh, payment choices for these commitments. Um, your business may have a lot of cash on hand and decide to prepay for that full-term commitment all up front. Uh, or maybe you want to more tightly manage your cash flow and decide to pay for this commitment term uh, broken down into uh, smaller monthly charges. And there's even hybrid choices where you pay for part of that term commitment up front uh, and then the remainder on a monthly basis. Uh, so your commitment term durations can be uh, one years or three years. And then uh, to pay for that commitment, uh, you can do uh, no upfront, uh, partial upfront, or all upfront. Now, between all the differences of savings plans versus reserved instances, combined with the commitment term lengths uh, and the different payment choices, these all have an impact on how much you can save compared to the regular on-demand rates. Uh, for some of the longer three-year term options with the all upfront payment, the savings can be uh, well over 50% compared to on-demand rates. And this discount isn't quite as good as spot instances where we can save up to 90%, but remember that not all workloads are a great fit for spot instances due to their potential volatility. AWS may need to stop those spot instances you're using at any time. But for those workloads where you need steady, always running compute resources in your AWS accounts, and where you're expecting that consistent need for compute resources over the long term, uh, the you know year or more, uh, savings plans are an easy way to save potentially 50% or more on your compute utilization costs on AWS. Now, AWS offers some tools in the AWS console and their uh, savings plan documentation page to help calculate the potential savings you'd see uh, between all these different variations. Now, keep in mind, you can also reach out to AWS support, uh, especially if you have those premium support plans with AWS. You can work with the AWS concierge team through support cases uh, and your technical account manager to further review your AWS usage specifics uh, and help make tailored recommendations around these savings plans and RI options. Now, that's it for our intro to the AWS savings plans and reserved instances. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be taking a look at the AWS organizations within the topic scope of our billing and pricing domain of the course. 
Now, AWS Organizations is basically a management layer for your AWS accounts. Uh, and there are often times where you may want to have multiple AWS accounts, especially in large company settings. Uh, you may want a different account for your production workloads, and then a different account for your development work. Uh, or you may want a separate account for shared resources. Um, so things like your tools and services or other middleware applications used by your organization that uh, end up getting shared across different teams, you may want those sitting in their own AWS account. Uh, or maybe you want a different account for your important backups or different security or governance considerations to help keep things separated there. Now, there's a number of benefits for multiple AWS accounts in large organizations. Uh, you can isolate your workloads better, uh, create different access control scopes to the resources within those different accounts, and make easier work of allocating AWS costs to a particular purpose or team within your organization. Uh, if one team is responsible for all the resources in a uh, given AWS account, it makes it easy to determine who's responsible for all those AWS costs. Isolating AWS resources created by uh, certain teams, uh, different cost centers or business functions into their own AWS accounts can help you do uh, showback or chargeback from an accounting level to uh, help the business easily understand where the AWS costs are coming from and add visibility and accountability to these account owners so they become more cost conscious about the AWS resource usage. Now the why and how around creating an AWS account structure is a much broader topic. But I wanted to give a bit of context here to help us understand why many organizations would have multiple AWS accounts in the first place. So if this multiple AWS account strategy makes sense to your organization and you've created multiple AWS accounts now, how does one manage all of that from a billing perspective? Well, if we're talking about three or four accounts, perhaps that's manageable for your business. But if a company has 10 or 100 or more AWS accounts, managing all those invoices and other accounting aspects would quickly become quite a nightmare. So managing all these AWS accounts from a billing perspective is one area AWS organizations can help with. With AWS organizations, you have one main payer account created as part of your uh, account hierarchy. And this often gets referred to as the root account or management account for your AWS organization structure. Now this one account is typically set up as an empty AWS account. Uh, and by empty, I just mean that you generally wouldn't run any AWS resources within it. Uh, as a best practice, you shouldn't really be running your EC2 instances or databases or other workloads in that root level management account. Its primary purpose is just for the consolidated billing of all the AWS accounts belonging to it as part of the organization tree structure. Now for a visual example, you'd have this one main payer account set up, and this would be your root level account for your AWS organization. Then other child level accounts get linked to this root account as part of the organization structure. Now from the billing focus of our lesson here, the benefits are that the AWS usage costs for all the child accounts get consolidated to that one root level account. So you get one invoice to pay regardless of how many child accounts are actually linked to that root account. Another billing related benefit of doing this AWS organization's linked account structure is with the reserved instances and savings plans. Remember that when you buy these long-term commitments for your uh, compute or other services to get your discounted pricing, these commitments and discounts are applied at the account level. So without AWS organizations, you'd need to manage your savings plans and RI commitments for each account. Now, if we think about an organization with uh, 100 or more accounts, this uh, quickly becomes quite a bit of a nightmare to manage and keep track of all that stuff. Now with AWS organizations, you can purchase your RI and savings plans at the root account level. And this is ideal since you have all your aggregated usage from your child accounts funneling into this root account. And then the RI or savings plan discounts are applied at the aggregated usage level uh, based on your commitment details. Now that concept of the aggregated usage uh, gives us a lot of additional flexibility uh, for our RI or savings plan commitments. Um, you know, no one has that crystal ball to determine what the future may hold for your AWS accounts and uh, your future usage. Now, without AWS organizations and the consolidated billing of the linked account structure in the picture here, uh, let's say you had two or three accounts where the usage of the services where you had uh, an RI or savings plan commitment for uh, decreased significantly. Well, as we know, we made that commitment purchase with AWS, so we pay for that committed term regardless if we use those resources or not. But what if a few of our other AWS accounts had their usage increase and now are paying uh, on-demand rates for those services? 
Now, this is sort of the worst case scenario at an organization with multiple standalone AWS accounts. Uh, on the one hand, we have the AWS accounts now that we overcommitted on our uh, RI or savings plan purchases, and we're essentially wasting money now by paying for the commitment uh, on resources that we're not actually using due to the demand decreases that occurred in that account. Uh, but then in the other accounts, we had an increase in usage and are paying the highest on-demand rates. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could take the unused RI or saving plan coverage from those accounts where we have the usage decrease and apply it to those accounts that had the usage increase instead? Uh, that way we'd be able to maximize the benefit of our RI or savings plan commitments. Well, with AWS organizations, this is exactly what happens. Uh, you typically buy your RI or savings plans through the root account. Uh, and this discount is applied across the aggregated usage of your AWS organization. So if the compute usage in one account uh, dips a little bit and the usage in another one increases, your unused savings plan or RI coverage would apply to the other accounts. Now, I've typically seen organizations purchase the savings plans and RIs through the root management account at the uh, AWS organization structure, but there's often times where this may not be possible or you don't want to do this due to different cost centers or accounting aspects at the company. So one situation like this may be the uh, AWS account already had pre-existing savings plans or RIs purchased through it. And then at a later point, the company creates a consolidated billing linked account structure for their accounts. Uh, so what happens now? Well, in this case, the account that had the RI or savings plan purchased on it would be the one getting all the discounts applied to it first. Uh, and then if there's leftover coverage due to the RIs or savings plans being underutilized in the account, the savings would then pass up to the rest of the linked accounts and then get discounted where it's applicable. So even though the RI or savings plans uh, weren't purchased through the root level management account, uh, the pre-existing RI or savings plans done through the other linked accounts can still share the discount. Now, say in a large organization, uh, different teams or arms of the business manage their own cost center and related cloud infrastructure costs. If a team uses part of their budget on making an RI or savings plan commitment for the AWS accounts that they control, there may be some accounting reasons where they don't want the discount to be shared across other accounts. AWS provides the option to disable this discount sharing for your RI and savings plans to ensure only the account that made the RI or saving plan commitment is the only one that receives the usage rate discount. Now, if you do disable the discount sharing for your RIs and savings plans, be certain that you're aware of what you're actually doing here, because any unused RI or savings plan usage coverage from that account will now be wasted since the usage discount is not shared to any other accounts. And this could lead to some significant cost increases if you have large AWS costs and complex multi-account designs for your organization. So AWS organizations is a rather simple feature uh, essentially letting you to create a tree-like structure for your AWS accounts and help ease the account management and accounting aspects of multi-account designs at large companies. However, there are a variety of benefits from having all the AWS usage costs aggregated together from the potential to receive discounts from AWS through RIs and savings plans and other volume-related discounts. Now, I won't dive into this too much here, but we should be aware now that many AWS services have tiered pricing levels. So depending on your volume of usage, you would pay an increasingly discounted rate in a lot of use cases. So for large organizations, you may want to speak to your AWS account team about further volume discounts and uh, other programs you may be eligible for. But all these volume-based discounts are often hard to achieve through a single AWS account. Uh, if an organization has 100 AWS accounts, all that total usage would be divided up in varying amounts across each one. If we assume a somewhat even distribution of usage across these accounts in our example, uh, it's unlikely that any single account would reach the lower price tier based on its uh, usage volume. However, with AWS organizations and the linked account billing consolidation, the aggregate service usage of all the 100 accounts get used in the usage cost calculation. Uh, so it's much more likely that we'd reach different volume-based discount tiers or be eligible for other volume-based discounts when the usage is all aggregated together from all the accounts. Now let's build on our 100 AWS account example here. Um, if we use data transfer costs to the internet as our focus, what would our cost look like between the 100 separate accounts compared to having consolidated billing of the 100 linked AWS accounts? So to keep things simple, uh, let's say each account sends one terabyte of data to the internet each month 
and all our 100 AWS accounts are not consolidated together at this stage. Now, if you look at the AWS EC2 data transfer costs for the uh, US East region, we see we'd pay nine cents per gigabyte of traffic out to the internet. All our usage in that one account is under the uh, 10 terabyte step uh, showing in the pricing table. So if we exclude the first 100 gigabytes of traffic out to the internet being free each month, uh, just to keep things simple here, uh, we pay that nine cents per gigabyte rate for all this account's traffic uh, that it sends out to the internet. Now, the same thing would be applicable to the 99 other AWS accounts, assuming they all have the same one terabyte of traffic uh, being sent to the internet each month. So each account, based on its own individual usage volume, would pay that nine cent uh, gigabyte rate. Now, let's switch our example scenario to where all these 100 accounts are linked and we have that consolidated invoice as part of our AWS organization structure now. So as an aggregate data transfer out to the internet from all our accounts, we'd now be looking at 100 terabytes each month. And since this data transfer out to the internet has a tiered pricing model, we start getting some volume discounts here. So each gigabyte we use after that 10 terabyte level is at a lower cost. Uh, and then if we happen to use over 100 terabytes, the discount for usage over that threshold is an even lower cost. Now, the key takeaway with all this is the fact that you can often benefit from lower AWS costs when you have the consolidated billing of all your linked AWS accounts combined through uh, the tiered pricing and other volume-based discounts. So that concludes our overview of AWS organizations from a billing and pricing scope, uh, now a topic of multi-account strategy and the other capabilities and features of AWS organizations, It'll be a part of uh, upcoming courses here at Cloud Vikings, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, but for now, that's it for our lesson. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a quick look at where to find pricing information on AWS resources. Now, we sort of looked at this already with the uh, AWS pricing calculator and uh, also taking a look at reserved instances and savings plans. But uh, based on the exam blueprint, we want to be able to find resources to help us find pricing information on specific AWS resources. So let's dive in. So whenever you're looking for pricing information for AWS services, the AWS pricing landing page here is the best place to start. We have the main uh, overview landing page here. It gives us all the kind of information around the AWS pricing models that we discussed about the pay to go approach, um, the AWS pricing calculator link, uh, information about our reserved instances and savings plans, and then information about the volume based discounts for some of their services. And then down further, we have a handy uh, filter where we can select the uh, category of uh, AWS services that we're trying to find uh, pricing information for. And then we can select any one of the uh, results that come up here to uh, dive into the specific pricing page. So for our example, uh, let's actually pick the uh, compute category here, and we want to find information about the Amazon EC2 pricing. So we'll select that. Now within the AWS product pages here, the header at the top here generally follows the same pattern of having a overview, features, pricing, um, instance types is specific to the EC2 pricing, so that's not always here. Uh, but generally, they have the uh, FAQs and getting started uh, guides and the uh, documentation resources. So for example, instead of going through the uh, filters like we did before, we could pick the compute category here, go into the Amazon EC2 service, and then click on pricing from the header, and that gets us to the same pricing information page. Now for some of the AWS services, they have what's called a free tier. So if you use uh, specific resource types that are part of the free tier or your volume of usage like uh, data transfer stays with under a threshold, uh, that usage would actually be free. As an example for uh, EC2, uh, we can see here that a part of the AWS free tier, um, we can actually get 750 hours of uh, you know, Linux and Windows uh, T2 micro instances uh, as part of that free tier. So if we stay under the 750 hours uh, a month of using that uh, T2 micro instance types, that usage would actually be free each month for up to one year. Now for the EC2 pricing page here, 
Um, there's a variety of options and uh, pricing details as we kind of looked at before. We have different options like on-demand or spot instances and the pricing varies. So this landing page actually directs us to specific pricing details depending on our use case. So if we want to look at on-demand pricing, we just select that. And then we can see the, all these specific on-demand pricing. Now the EC2 service has perhaps one of the more complex uh, pricing models just due to the amount of variations and options for uh, instance families and instance types. And then of course the uh, you know, spot instances and then you can layer on the reserved instances or savings plans on top of that, which can change the, the pricing model as well. Now, a lot of the AWS services have uh, similar tables like this, where uh, you can choose the options that are applicable for that service. And then uh, it gives you the different rates uh, at the bottom as part of the table. But the focus of this lesson here is just to get more familiar with where to find this pricing information. So let's look at one more example. And let's suppose we needed a database. So we can go to the product category, uh, databases, and then perhaps we um, want uh, Amazon RDS. So we'll pick that. And again, we're after the pricing information, so we can use this handy header again and pick the pricing option. And then from the Amazon RDS pricing landing page here, uh, we have some information about the service, um, some information about the uh, free tiers available. And then scrolling below, we have the different options for the Amazon RDS service. Uh, so if we know we uh, need a MySQL database to run uh, on the managed Amazon RDS service, we can pick that. And then from here, we can get uh, pricing information specific to the uh, MySQL Amazon RDS service. We see here a, a similar pricing table to what we saw with the Amazon EC2 service. Uh, but again, it's a little bit different because uh, it's specific for the Amazon RDS service. Now, as you're exploring the pricing for Amazon services, uh, also keep an eye out for the menu here on the left. Some services have multiple uh, resource components to them. Uh, for our database example here, we have uh, backup storage and snapshots, uh, and of course, data transfer. And all these need to be taken into account if you're exploring the pricing for some AWS services. Now, services like uh, we looked at in our example here with uh, EC2 and RDS, where there's lots of different pricing layers between the instance types and storage and data transfer and that type of thing. Uh, keep in mind, we always have the AWS pricing calculator to help us out. So instead of walking through the links here one by one and trying to uh, calculate what our expenses may be for each uh, resource component, um, we can go into the pricing calculator and have that calculator tool help us to uh, pick the right options and uh, you know walk us through all those components that make up the overall price of that resource. So again, just to recap, if you're after pricing information for any of the AWS services, uh, you can go to the product sections, uh, find the service that uh, you're looking pr for pricing information for. Uh, you can go to the handy pricing header here. There's another option. You can go to the main uh, pricing link here. And that takes us to the main AWS pricing landing page, or there's a direct link to the AWS pricing calculator. Um, and then this one takes us to that main um, product category filter we can use to uh, similarly filter out the AWS resources we're looking to get pricing information for and uh, take us to the pricing page within that. And that's it for a quick lesson on where to find AWS pricing information. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be talking about resource tagging in AWS. Now, all the resources across your AWS accounts can quickly become the Wild West, uh, the chaos of tens or hundreds of different teams uh, managing potentially thousands of individual AWS resources that have been uh, deployed over time. Uh, all those EC2 instances, uh, databases, hundreds of EC2 storage buckets, uh, load balancers, uh, I think you get the idea. Uh, now your AWS cost and usage data is very detailed in terms of the uh, billing you have for your uh, resources themselves, but AWS has no idea into the context of what those resources are for. Uh, some may be web servers for your production e-commerce site. Uh, some may be a machine learning pipeline for your data science team. Uh, some of those may have been uh, deployed by your development team, some by your operations team. Uh, whatever the scenario, AWS has no idea what the function of those resources 
uh, perform within your organization. So although you have detailed billing information available to you, uh, and you can use a number of tools to explore those costs, it's nearly impossible to really determine what portion of those uh, resource costs belong to a particular business unit uh, or team or owner um, or belong to a different cost center within your organization. So to help put more context into your AWS usage costs, AWS provides a feature called resource tagging, which allows you to add additional information to your AWS resources. This additional metadata information can be added as a key value format. Uh, in the key field of the tag, you could put things like uh, an owner, uh, cost center, or department, and then fill in the corresponding value to associate to that uh, resource for the particular key. So if we used all these as an example, uh, if we wanted to tag an EC2 instance with uh, more information, our keys and values uh, would look something like this. We could have the key as owner, and then the value field of Mike. And then the next tag we associate to the EC2 instance would have the key of cost center, and then the number uh, 1122 as the value. Then for the next tag, we'd have the key of department, and we could put engineering for the value. Each tag is a key value pair. Then each resource can typically have up to 50 custom user-created tags like this, so you can really add quite a bit of information to your resources to help you identify and understand each resource better based on your business context. Now, these tags become incredibly important when you want to perform any type of chargeback or showback for your AWS costs within your organization. Uh, with a mature tagging strategy at an organization, you can easily create billing reports filtered on this additional tagging data to help determine what parts of the AWS charges belong to different people in the team. So then you could say this $100,000 monthly invoice for AWS charges, we could run a query across our billing data based on a tag to quickly determine that, uh, you know, $70,342 of that was coming from our engineering department belonging to cost center uh, 1122. Then if we needed, uh, we could further find specific owners within that to figure out uh, what portion of that belonged to each owner. So resource tagging is an important strategy to set up early as possible, as it really helps you gain a lot of insight into your AWS costs. You can then perform a number of analytics on your AWS costs with the help of the tagging information to help find areas where you can further reduce costs. Now for the scope of the exam here, we're just doing a quick introduction to the concept of resource tagging and looking at it from a billing perspective. However, resource tagging benefits extend to many other areas as well. Uh, being able to leverage tags in uh, identity and access management, access policies to define you know, very granular access controls to perform a number of uh, automations as well on specific resources by using their tags as the target identifiers. As an example, you could have a scheduled Lambda function that would automatically stop all your EC2 instances at 8 p.m. Uh, that all have the tag of team and development. So these developer instances uh, would be shut down outside of regular business hours and then automatically started up again at the start of the next business day. There's a number of ways you can take advantage of tagging your resources, and they're an important component to cloud financial management. Again, we're just introducing the AWS tagging concept here, but if you want to dive deeper into this, I'll include some resources after the video to explore on your own. And that's it for our lesson on AWS tagging. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll be taking a look at the AWS pricing calculator. Now, we touched on the hundreds of variations possible with a service like EC2 and other lessons. Uh, you know, when we think about the instance type families, uh, the size variations of each one, and then layer on the pricing options around on-demand, spot, uh, the savings plans, and reserved instances, there's uh, seemingly endless variables here. Then all these costs can differ between AWS regions as well, which adds even more complexity to try to figure out AWS pricing. So when you're in the planning phase of a new service and trying to get an idea of how much all these things will cost to run in AWS, sorting through all those options and figuring out the usage rates can get very complex and take a lot of time. Now, I mentioned on the large variations to think about just for the uh, EC2 service on the instance itself. Um, but then if we factor in the storage costs for EBS volumes, and then maybe the data traffic that instance would be potentially sending, uh, and then to what destination? Uh, is it a destination on the internet or across a direct connect link to uh, just name a few? Um, accurately estimating these AWS costs can get very tricky. 
Now, to help with all this complexity, AWS provides a pricing calculator tool for us to use. With this tool, we can pick from a few menu options and then enter in the usage metrics we believe we'll be using, and the cost calculator will give us our estimated costs. So let's take a quick look at how this pricing calculator works. From the AWS pricing calculator page, we see the general workflow here. We use the tool to add all the services our workload's trying to price out into the tool. Then we provide more detailed configuration for the services around the requirements for things like uh, CPU, memory, storage, the uh, data transfer, and so forth. Uh, and at the end, we ultimately get our output of our AWS cost estimate. Now, note below here, we can take the output of this calculator tool and share or export the estimates. So if you need to answer the questions of how much things will cost in AWS to a number of people in your organization, you can share the estimate details with the team for further review, along with all the detailed information of the resources and usage configured in the calculator itself. So for a quick demo, let's look at a simple cost estimate for an EC2 instance. Uh, maybe we need to do a lift and shift type of uh, migration of a custom database to run in AWS, and we want to see how much that'll cost. Okay, so starting back at our AWS pricing calculator page, we'll go to create estimate. And we want to do a estimate for uh, our EC2 instance. So just type in EC2. We want to use the core Amazon EC2 service. So click on configure. We'll just add a brief description here for our estimate, just in case we need to uh, share it with uh, other members of the team later on. Now notice here we have our region selection for the calculator. I'll leave that as is for estimate here, but uh, you can pick a region that's more applicable for you or as part of a uh, different cost estimate. If you want to do a comparison, uh, you can switch the region here and compare prices about uh, operating the EC2 instances in uh, different regions. Now note there's two flavors of the pricing calculator. Uh, we can do a quick estimate or use the advanced estimate here. Uh, read through the descriptions and um, just note that the advanced estimate's great for when you have a lot of uh, existing information about your workload um, and have all those inputs available. You can use those in the calculator to get a very accurate estimate. Then moving on, we have the operating system. Uh, I'll leave this as Linux, but you can uh, expand that and see the other options available to you here. And then we move on to configuring the instance type. So what we can do here is actually uh, input the vCPU and memory that we need for the instance. Uh, and that'll basically select the instance family and size that would most closely match those requirements. Or if we've already determined what instance family and size we need for our requirements, we can search for it by the instance name itself to add into our estimate. Now, for our example, let's say we don't know what instance type we need exactly. Uh, we're coming from a traditional IT data center on, running on a physical server. So let's say we know how many uh, CPU cores and memory that that uh, physical server is using, and we can use those inputs into the calculator here, and it'll best fit the instance type uh, to match those requirements. So for our example, let's say we have uh, 16 v CPUs that we need, and then 128 gigabytes of memory. And then as we enter in those inputs, the chart here dynamically updates, and it gives us sort of the lowest cost EC2 instance that matches our input requirements here. Uh, in our case, it's the R6G.4X large instance type. Then we also have this quantity section. Um, let's say we have a performance environment that we want to run in our cloud as well and very closely match our production environment to do additional performance tests against. So we might be running uh, two of these. Now, as these are our databases, we expect them to be running 100% of the time. But for example, if you have instances that uh, perhaps aren't running 100% of the time, uh, maybe you shut them down after business hours and that type of thing, you can use like a 50% utilization so that the cost calculator can take those into account. And then we move on to the pricing strategy here. Um, we can expand the calculations to see the breakdown. And this is where we can play around with picking, um, you know, the on-demand instances versus using a savings plan and uh, what the difference in cost would be if we pick like a one-year or three-year term and the different payment options. So you can quickly play around with these options and see what the impacts are of the different choices. Now, for example, since it's a database and we expect it to be uh, you know, up and running 100% of the time, doing a savings plan or a reserved instance here for this use case probably makes a lot of sense. 
So I might want to pick the compute savings plan so I have a lot of flexibility. Um, and then again, since it's a database, I might want to pick a uh, three-year reservation term to maximize my savings. Now I might keep no upfront here for uh, cash flow considerations uh, so I can pay for that uh, three-year term on a monthly basis rather than having a large one-time expense if, uh, doing something like all upfront. So continuing on here, we can also add our uh, elastic block storage into the calculator. Now from the drop down here, we can see the uh, various storage options available to us today. For a quick example, I may just pick the latest generation uh, GP3. And then as it's a database, we may want to bump this up to something like uh, 10,000 IOPS. And then uh, maybe we bump this up to uh, 300 megabits a second and we might need 100 gigabytes of storage space. And again, we can expand these show calculations here to get a more detailed breakdown of all those charges. And that's basically it for the inputs of the uh, quick estimate of the AWS pricing calculator here for our EC2 instance. Uh, at the very bottom, we can see the um, total monthly cost based on our inputs. And then we have an option to save and view our estimate, or we can save it and add additional services. So for uh, pricing out a entire service that's comprised of EC2 instances, uh, databases, uh, S3 storage, and uh, you know various other AWS resources, we can bundle all those up into a single estimate. So I'm just going to save and view summary. And this gives us a nice high level view of all our costs of the estimate. And up here, we can export that into a CSV or PDF format, and also share it as well, where we'd uh, get a link that we could uh, provide to others on our team so they could also dive into the cost estimate and possibly review the inputs we used in the calculator and just make sure those are accurate as well. And that's it for the quick walkthrough of the AWS pricing calculator. So I'd encourage you to play around with the pricing calculator here, uh, go in, pick a few AWS services at random and uh, do some inputs, even if you're not too sure what they mean at this point, uh, just to get familiar with the tool. So I'll wrap up the lesson here but I hope it's been helpful in showcasing how the AWS pricing calculator can help navigate uh, doing pricing estimates and navigate all the complexity of choice with the AWS services and all the different billing and usage options out there. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next lesson. Well, this is sort of a bittersweet video for me here as we end the course. Uh, it's been an epic learning journey for me uh, behind the scenes when building out the course. Uh, I can't begin to explain all the rabbit holes I've been down as part of developing uh, the course content, everything from uh, looking at learning theory, uh, memory techniques, uh, course creation strategies, uh, and then from the video side of things, learning about uh, you know different cameras, lighting, microphones, audio, uh, video editing, color grading, motion graphics. Um, and just getting comfortable uh, being in front of the camera, which is obviously a work in progress. Uh, anyways, a huge thank you for taking the course with me here and going on this learning journey with me, taking a look back at some of the uh, earlier lessons in the course. I already have uh, quite a big list of things I'd like to improve on for my next courses that I have planned. And uh, of course, I'll continue to improve and add to this course as well. But in order to do that, I'm really after your feedback. You've likely noticed quite a few uh, changes throughout the lessons as you progress through the course. Uh, as I was experimenting with trying lots of different things I've learned along the way. Um, let me know what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, what works, what doesn't. Uh, I'd be really interested in to know what you thought of the course itself and what you feel uh, could be improved. Um, there's a quick course evaluation form to input your feedback after this lesson. Also, if you haven't already, uh, join our Cloud Viking Slack group. Uh, it's a great community of students. Uh, now that you've finished the course, if you come across other students that have questions, uh, you can help them out. Uh, it's great reinforcement learning for you, and it helps you network, uh, meet new students, and uh, help them out when they're studying their cloud journey as well. Now, if you're intending to take the AWS exam, uh, let me know how well this course prepared you for it. Um, if you found there were any questions that came up on the exam that we missed covering in the course, uh, I'll certainly take that feedback and uh, improve the course going forward. Again, I really appreciate you choosing Cloud Vikings as part of your cloud training solution. Uh, I wish you all the best in your future certification and career goals. Uh, stay on the lookout for future courses and more content on our YouTube channel uh, to help you along with your cloud and DevOps learning voyage. Uh, again, thanks for watching and take care.